Aldous Huxley Island in framing an ideal we may assume what wish, but should avoid impossibilities. Aristotle won attention, a voice began to call, and it was as though a nobody had suddenly become articulate. Attention, it repeated in the same high, nasal monotone. Attention. Lying there like a corpse in the dead leaves, his hair matted, his face grotesquely smudged and bruised, his clothes in rags and muddy, Will Farnaby awoke with a start. Molly had called him. Time to get up. Time to get dressed. Mustn't be late at the office. Thank you, darling, he said and sat up. A sharp pain stabbed at his right knee and there were other kinds of pain in his back. His arms, his forehead. Attention, the voice insisted without the slightest change of tone. Leaning on one elbow, Will looked about him and saw with bewilderment, not the grey wallpaper and yellow curtains of his London bedroom, but a glade among trees and the long shadows and slanting lights of early morning in a forest. Attention? Why did she say, attention? Attention. Attention, the voice insisted, how strangely, how senselessly. Molly? He questioned. Molly? The name seemed to open a window inside his head. Suddenly, with that horribly familiar sense of guilt at the pit of the stomach, he smelt formaldehyde, he saw the small brisk nurse hurrying ahead of him along the green corridor, heard the dry creaking of her starched clothes. Number 55, she was saying, and then halted, opened a white door. He entered and there, on a high white bed, was Molly. Molly with bandages covering half her face and the mouth hanging cavernously open. Molly, he had called, Molly. His voice had broken, and he was crying, was imploring now, my darling. There was no answer. Through the gaping mouth the quick shallow breaths came noisily, again, again. My darling, my darling. And then suddenly the hand he was holding came to life for a moment. Then was still again. It's me, he said, it's Will. Once more the fingers stirred. Slowly with what was evidently an enormous effort, they closed themselves over his own, pressed them for a moment and then relaxed again into lifelessness. Attention, called the inhuman voice. Attention. It had been an accident, he hastened to assure himself. The road was wet, the car had skidded across the white line. It was one of those things that happen all the time. The papers are full of them, he had reported them by the dozen. Mother and three children killed in head on crash. But that was beside the point. The point was that, when she asked him if it was really the end, he had said yes. The point was that less than an hour after she had walked out from that last shameful interview into the rain, Molly was in the ambulance, dying. He hadn't looked at her as she turned to go, hadn't dared to look at her. Another glimpse of that pale suffering face might have been too much for him. She had risen from her chair and was moving slowly across the room, moving slowly out of his life. Shouldn't he call her back, ask her forgiveness, tell her that he still loved her? Had he ever loved her? For the hundredth time the articulate oboe called him to attention. Yes, had he ever really loved her? Goodbye, Will, came her remembered whisper as she turned back on the threshold. And then it was she who had said it, in a whisper from the depths of her heart. I still love you, Will, in spite of everything. A moment later the door of the flat closed behind her almost without a sound. The little dry click of the latch, and she was gone. He had jumped up, had run to the front door and opened it, had listened to the retreating footsteps on the stairs. Like a ghost at cockcrow, a faint familiar perfume lingered vanishingly on the air. He closed the door again walked into his grey and yellow bedroom and looked out the widow. A few seconds passed, then he saw her crossing the pavement and getting into the car. He heard the shrill grinding of the starter, once, twice, and after that the drumming of the motor. Should he open the window? Wait, Molly, wait, he heard himself shouting in imagination. The window remained unopened, the car began to move, turn the corner and the street was empty. It was too late. Too late, thank God. Said a gross derisive voice. Yes, thank God. And yet the guilt was there at the pit of his stomach. 
the guilt, the gnawing of his remorse, but through the remorse he could feel a horrible rejoicing. Somebody low and lewd and brutal, somebody alien and odious who was yet himself was gleefully thinking that now there was nothing to prevent him from having what he wanted. And what he wanted was a different perfume, was the warmth and resilience of a younger body. Attention, said the oboe. Yes, attention. Attention to Babs's musky bedroom, with its strawberry pink alcove and the two windows that looked onto the Charing Cross Road and were looked into, all night long, by the winking glare of the big sky sign for Porter's Gin on the opposite side of the street. Gin in royal crimson, and for ten seconds the alcove was the sacred heart, for ten miraculous seconds the flushed face so close to his own glowed like a seraph's, transfigured as though by an inner fire of love. Then came the yet profounder transfiguration of darkness. One, two, three, four dot our God, make it go on forever. But punctually at the count of ten the electric clock would turn on another revelation, but of death, of the essential horror, for the lights, this time, were green, and for ten hideous seconds Babs's rosy alcove became a womb of mud and, on the bed, Babs herself was corpse-colored, a cadaver galvanized into posthumous epilepsy. When Porter's gin proclaimed itself in green, it was hard to forget what had happened and who one was. The only thing to do was to shut one's eyes and plunge, if one could, more deeply into the other world of sensuality, plunge violently, plunge deliberately into those alienating frenzies to which poor Molly, Molly, attention, in her bandages, Molly in her wet grave at Highgate, and Highgate, of course, was why one had to shut one's eyes each time when the green light made a corpse of Babs's nakedness, had always and so utterly been a stranger. And not only Molly. Behind his closed eyelids, Will saw his mother, pale like a cameo, her face spiritualized by accepted suffering, her hands made monstrous and subhuman by arthritis. His mother and, standing behind her wheelchair, already running to fat and quivering like calf's foot jelly with all the feelings that had never found their proper expression in consummated love, was his sister Maud. How can you, Will? Yes, how can you? Maud echoed tearfully in her vibrating contralto. There was no answer. No answer, that was to say, in any words that could be uttered in their presence, that, uttered, those two martyrs, the mother to her unhappy marriage, the daughter to filial piety, could possibly understand. No answer except in words of the most obscenely scientific objectivity, the most inadmissible frankness. How could he do it? He could do it, for all practical purposes was compelled to do it, because dot well, because Babs had certain physical peculiarities which Molly did not possess and behaved at certain moments in ways which Molly would have found unthinkable. There had been a long silence, but now, abruptly, the strange voice took up its old refrain. Attention! Attention! Attention to Molly, attention to Maud and his mother, attention to Babs. And suddenly another memory emerged from the fog of vagueness and confusion. Babs's strawberry pink alcove sheltered another guest, and its owner's body was shuddering ecstatically under somebody else's caresses. To the guilt in the stomach was added an anguish about the heart, a constriction of the throat. Attention! The voice had come nearer, was calling from somewhere over there to the right. He turned his head, he tried to raise himself for a better view, but the arm that supported his weight began to tremble, then gave way and he fell back into the leaves. Too tired to go on remembering, he lay there for a long time staring up through half-closed lids at the incomprehensible world around him. Where was he and how on earth had he got here? Not that this was of any importance. At the moment nothing was of any importance except this pain, this annihilating weakness. All the same, just as a matter of scientific interest. This tree, for example, under which, for no known reason, he found himself lying, this column of grey bark with the groining, high up, of sun-speckled branches, this ought by rights to be a beech tree. But in that case, and Will admired himself for being so lucidly logical, in that case the leaves had no right to be so obviously evergreen. 
And why would a beech tree send its roots elbowing up like this above the surface of the ground? And those preposterous wooden buttresses, on which the pseudo beech supported itself, where did those fit into the picture? Will remembered suddenly his favorite worst line of poetry. Who prop, thou ask street, in these bad days my mind? Answer, congealed ectoplasm, early Dali. Which definitely ruled out the chill turns. So did the butterflies swooping out there in the thick buttery sunshine. Why were they so large, so improbably cerulean or velvet black, so extravagantly eyed and freckled? Purple staring out of chestnut, silver powdered over emerald, over topaz, over sapphire. Attention! Who's there? Will Farnaby called in what he intended to be a loud and formidable tone, but all that came out of his mouth was a thin, quavering croak. There was a long and, it seemed, profoundly menacing silence. From the hollow between two of the trees wooden buttresses an enormous black centipede emerged for a moment into view, then hurried away on its regiment of crimson legs and vanished into another cleft in the lichen-covered ectoplasm. Who's there? He croaked again. There was a rustling in the bushes on his left and suddenly, like a cuckoo from a nursery clock, out popped a large black bird, the size of a jackdaw, only, needless to say, it wasn't a jackdaw. It clapped a pair of white tipped wings and, darting across the intervening space, settled on the lowest branch of a small dead tree, not twenty feet from where Will was lying. Its beak, he noticed, was orange, and it had a bald yellow patch under each eye, with canary colored wattles that covered the sides and back of its head with a thick wig of naked flesh. The bird cocked its head and looked at him first with the right eye, then with the left after which it opened its orange bill, whistled ten or twelve notes of a little air in the pentatonic scale, made a noise like somebody having hiccups, and then, in a chanting phrase, do do sol do, said, here and now, boys, here and now, boys. The words pressed a trigger, and all of a sudden he remembered everything. Here was Pala, the Forbidden Island, the place no journalist had ever visited, and now must be the morning after the afternoon when he'd been fool enough to go sailing, alone, outside the harbour of Rendang Lobo. He remembered it all, the white sail curved by the wind into the likeness of a huge magnolia petal, the water sizzling at the prow, the sparkle of diamonds on every wave crest, the troughs of wrinkled jade. And eastwards, across the strait, what clouds! What prodigies of sculptured whiteness above the volcanoes of Pala! Sitting there at the tiller, he had caught himself singing, caught himself, incredibly, in the act of feeling unequivocally happy. Three, three for the rivals, he had declaimed into the wind. Two, two for the lily white boys, clothed all in green oh, one is one and all alone. Yes, all alone. All alone on the enormous jewel of the sea and ever more shall be so. After which, needless to say, the thing that all the cautious and experienced yachtsmen had warned him against happened. The black squall out of nowhere, the sudden, senseless frenzy of wind and rain and waves. Here and now, boys, chanted the bird. Here and now, boys. The really extraordinary thing was that he should be here, he reflected, under the trees and not out there at the bottom of the palustrate or, worse, smashed to pieces at the foot of the cliffs. For even after he had managed, by sheer miracle, to take his sinking boat through the breakers and run her aground on the only sandy beach in all those miles of Palas rock-bound coast, even then it wasn't over. The cliffs towered above him, but at the head of the cove there was a kind of headlong ravine where a little stream came down in a succession of filmy waterfalls and there were trees and bushes growing between the walls of grey limestone. Six or seven hundred feet of rock, climbing, in tennis shoes, and all the footholds slippery with water. And then, dear God! Those snakes! The black one looped over the branch by which he was pulling himself up. And five minutes later, the huge green one coiled there on the ledge, just where he was preparing to step. Terror had been succeeded by a terror infinitely worse. The sight of the snake had made him start, made him violently withdraw his foot, 
and that sudden unconsidered movement had made him lose his balance. For a long sickening second, in the dreadful knowledge that this was the end, he had swayed on the brink, then fallen. Death, death, death. And then, with the noise of splintering wood in his ears he had found himself clinging to the branches of a small tree, his face scratched, his right knee bruised and bleeding, but alive. Painfully he had resumed his climbing. His knee hurt him excruciatingly, but he climbed on. There was no alternative. And then the light had begun to fail. In the end he was climbing almost in darkness, climbing by faith, climbing by sheer despair. Here and now, boys, shouted the bird dot but Wilfarnaby was neither here nor now. He was there on the rock face, he was then at the dreadful moment of falling. The dry leaves rustled beneath him, he was trembling. Violently, uncontrollably, he was trembling from head to foot. Too suddenly the bird ceased to be articulate and started to scream. A small shrill human voice said, Minor. And then added something in a language that Will did not understand. There was a sound of footsteps on dry leaves. Then a little cry of alarm. Then silence. Will opened his eyes and saw two exquisite children looking down at him, their eyes wide with astonishment and a fascinated horror. The smaller of them was a tiny boy of five, perhaps, or six, dressed only in a green loincloth. Beside him, carrying a basket of fruit on her head, stood a little girl some four or five years older. She wore a full crimson skirt that reached almost to her ankles, but above the waist she was naked. In the sunlight her skin glowed like pale copper flushed with rose. Will looked from one child to the other. How beautiful they were, and how faultless, how extraordinarily elegant. Like two little thoroughbreds. A round and sturdy thoroughbred, with a face like a cherub's, that was the boy. And the girl was another kind of thoroughbred, fine drawn, with a rather long, grave little face framed between braids of dark hair. There was another burst of screaming. On its perch in the dead tree, the bird was turning nervously this way and that, then, with a final screech, it dived into the air. Without taking her eyes from Will's face, the girl held out her hand invitingly. The bird fluttered, settled, flapped wildly, found its balance, then folded its wings and immediately started to hiccup. Will looked on without surprise. Anything was possible now, anything. Even talking birds that would perch on a child's finger. Will tried to smile at them, but his lips were still trembling, and what was meant to be a sign of friendliness must have seemed like a frightening grimace. The little boy took cover behind his sister. The bird stopped hiccuping and began to repeat a word that Will did not understand. Runner, was that it? No, Karana. Definitely Karana. He raised a trembling hand and pointed at the fruit in the round basket. Mangoes, bananas. His dry mouth was watering. Hungry, he said. Then, Feeling that in these exotic circumstances the child might understand him better if he put on an imitation of a musical comedy Chinaman, me very hungry, he elaborated. Do you want to eat? The child asked in perfect English. Yes, eat, he repeated, eat. Fly away, minor. She shook her hand. The bird uttered a protesting squawk and returned to its perch on the dead tree. Lifting her thin little arms in a gesture that was like a dancer's, the child raised the basket from her head, then lowered it to the ground. She selected a banana, peeled it and, torn between fear and compassion, advanced towards the stranger. In his incomprehensible language the little boy uttered a cry of warning and clutched at her skirt. With a reassuring word, the girl halted, well out of danger, and held up the fruit. Do you want it? she asked. Dot still trembling, Will Farnaby stretched out his hand. Very cautiously, she edged forward, then halted again and, crouching down, peered at him intently. Quick, he said in an agony of impatience. Dot, but the little girl was taking no chances. Eyeing his hand for the least sign of a suspicious movement, she leaned forward, she cautiously extended her arm. For God's sake, he implored. God, the child repeated with sudden interest. 
Which god? She asked. There are such a lot of them? Any damned god you like, he answered impatiently. I don't really like any of them, she answered. I like the compassionate one. Then be compassionate to me, he begged. Give me that banana. Her expression changed. I'm sorry, she said apologetically. Rising to her full height, she took a quick step forward and dropped the fruit into his shaking hand. There, she said and, like a little animal avoiding a trap, she jumped back, out of reach. The small boy clapped his hands and laughed aloud. She turned and said something to him. He nodded his round head, and saying OK, boss, trotted away, through a barrage of blue and sulfur butterflies, into the forest shadows on the further side of the glade. I told Tom Krishna to go and fetch someone, she explained. Dot will finish his banana and asked for another, and then for a third. As the urgency of his hunger diminished, he felt a need to satisfy his curiosity. How is it that you speak such good English? he asked. Because everybody speaks English, the child answered. Everybody? I mean, when they're not speaking Palinese. Finding the subject uninteresting, she turned, waved a small brown hand and whistled. Here and now, boys, the bird repeated yet once more, then fluttered down from its perch on the dead tree and settled on her shoulder. The child peeled another banana, gave two thirds of it to Will and offered what remained to the miner. Is that your bird? Will asked. Dot. She shook her head. Miners are like the electric light, she said. They don't belong to anybody. Why does he say those things? Because somebody taught him, she answered patiently. What an ass! Her tone seemed to imply. But why did they teach him those things? Why attention? Why here and now? Well, she searched for the right words in which to explain the self evident to this strange imbecile. That's what you always forget, isn't it? I mean, you forget to pay attention to what's happening. And that's the same as not being here and now. And the miners fly about reminding you, is that it? She nodded. That, of course, was it. There was a silence. What's your name? She inquired. Will introduced himself. My name's Mary Sorogini McPhail. McPhail? It was too implausible. McPhail, she assured him. And your little brother is called Tom Krishna? She nodded. Well, I'm damned. Did you come to Pala by the airplane? I came out of the sea. Out of the sea? Do you have a boat? I did have one. With his mind's eye Will saw the waves breaking over the stranded hulk, heard with his inner ear the crash of their impact. Under her questioning he told her what had happened. The storm, the beaching of the boat, the long nightmare of the climb, the snakes, the horror of falling. He began to tremble again, more violently than ever. Mary Sorogini listened attentively and without comment. Then, as his voice faltered and finally broke, she stepped forward and, the bird still perched on her shoulder, kneeled down beside him. Listen, Will, she said, laying a hand on his forehead. We've got to get rid of this. Her tone was professional and calmly authoritative. I wish I knew how, he said between chattering teeth. How? She repeated. But in the usual way, of course. Tell me again about those snakes and how you fell down. He shook his head. I don't want to. Of course you don't want to, she said. But you've got to. Listen to what the miner's saying. Here and now, boys. The bird was still exhorting. Here and now, boys. You can't be here and now, she went on, until you've got rid of those snakes. Tell me. I don't want to, I don't want to. He was almost in tears. Then you'll never get rid of them. They'll be crawling about inside your head forever. And serve you right, Mary Sorogini added severely. He tried to control the trembling, but his body had ceased to belong to him. Someone else was in charge, someone malevolently determined to humiliate him, to make him suffer. Remember what happened when you were a little boy, Mary Sorogini was saying. What did your mother do when you hurt yourself? She had taken him in her arms, had said, 
My poor baby, my poor little baby. She did that? The child spoke in a tone of shocked amazement. But that's awful. That's the way to rub it in. My poor baby, she repeated derisively, it must have gone on hurting for hours. And you'd never forget it. Will Farnaby made no comment, but lay there in silence, shaken by irrepressible shudderings. Well, if you won't do it yourself, I'll have to do it for you. Listen, Will, there was a snake, a big green snake, and you almost stepped on him. You almost stepped on him, and it gave you such a fright that you lost your balance, you fell. Now say it yourself, say it. I almost stepped on him, he whispered obediently. And then I. He couldn't say it. Then I fell. He brought out at last, almost inaudibly. All the horror of it came back to him, the nausea of fear, the panic start that had made him lose his balance, and then worse fear and the ghastly certainty that it was the end. Say it again. I almost stepped on him. And then. He heard himself whimpering. That's right, Will. Cry, cry. The whimpering became a moaning. Ashamed, he clenched his teeth and the moaning stopped. No, don't do that, she cried. Let it come out if it wants to. Remember that snake, Will. Remember how you fell. The moaning broke out again and he began to shudder more violently than ever. Now tell me what happened. I could see its eyes, I could see its tongue going in and out. Yes, you could see his tongue. And what happened then? I lost my balance, I fell. Say it again. Will. He was sobbing now. Say it again, she insisted. I fell. Again. It was tearing him to pieces, but he said it. I fell. Again, Will. She was implacable. Again. I fell, I fell. I fell. Gradually the sobbing died down. The words came more easily and the memories they aroused were less painful. I fell, he repeated for the hundredth time. But you didn't fall very far, Mary Sorogini now said. No, I didn't fall very far, he agreed. So what's all the fuss about? The child inquired. There was no malice or irony in her tone, not the slightest implication of blame. She was just asking a simple, straightforward question that called for a simple, straightforward answer. Yes, what was all the fuss about? The snake hadn't bitten him he hadn't broken his neck. And anyhow it had all happened yesterday. Today there were these butterflies, this bird that called one to attention, this strange child who talked to one like a Dutch uncle, looked like an angel out of some unfamiliar mythology and within five degrees of the equator was called, believe it or not, McPhail. Will Farnaby laughed aloud. The little girl clapped her hands and laughed too. A moment later the bird on her shoulder joined in with peal upon peal of loud demonic laughter that filled the glade and echoed among the trees, so that the whole universe seemed to be fairly splitting its sides over the enormous joke of existence. Three well, I'm glad it is also amusing, a deep voice suddenly commented. Will Farnaby turned and saw, smiling down at him, a small spare man dressed in European clothes and carrying a black bag. A man he judged, in his late fifties. Under the wide straw hat the hair was thick and white, and what a strange beaky nose. And the eyes, how incongruously blue in the dark face. Grandfather. He heard Mary Sorogini exclaiming. The stranger turned from Will to the child. What was so funny? He asked. Well, Mary Sorogini began, and paused for a moment to marshal her thoughts. Well, you see, he was in a boat and there was that storm yesterday and he got wrecked, somewhere down there. So he had to climb up the cliff. And there were some snakes, and he fell down. But luckily there was a tree, so he only had a fright. Which was why he was shivering so hard, so I gave him some bananas and I made him go through it a million times. And then all of a sudden he saw that it wasn't anything to worry about. I mean, it's all over and done with. And that made him laugh. And when he laughed, I laughed. And then the minor burr laughed. Very good, 
said her grandfather approvingly. And now, he added, turning back to Will Farnaby, after the psychological first aid, let's see what can be done for poor old brother ass. I'm Dr. Robert McPhail, by the way. Who are you? His name's Will, said Mary Sorogini before the young man could answer. And his other name is Far something. Farnaby, to be precise. William Asquith Farnaby. My father, as you might guess, was an ardent liberal. Even when he was drunk. Especially when he was drunk. He gave vent to a harsh derisive laugh strangely unlike the full-throated merriment which had greeted his discovery that there was really nothing to make a fuss about. Didn't you like your father? Mary Sorogini asked with concern. Not as much as I might have, Will answered. What he means, Dr. McPhail explained to the child, is that he hated his father. A lot of them do, he added parenthetically dot squatting down on his haunches, he began to undo the straps of his black bag. One of our ex-imperialists, I assume, he said over his shoulder to the young man. Born in Bloomsbury, Will confirmed. Upper class, the doctor diagnosed, but not a member of the military or county subspecies. Correct. My father was a barrister and political journalist. That is, when he wasn't too busy being an alcoholic. My mother, incredible as it may seem, was the daughter of an archdeacon. An archdeacon, he repeated, and laughed again as he had laughed over his father's taste for brandy. Dr. McPhail looked at him for a moment, then turned his attention once more to the straps. When you laugh like that, he remarked in a tone of scientific detachment, your face becomes curiously ugly. Taken aback, Will tried to cover his embarrassment with a piece of facetiousness. It's always ugly, he said. On the contrary, in a Baudelarian sort of way it's rather beautiful. Except when you choose to make noises like a hyena. Why do you make those noises? I'm a journalist, Will explained. Our special correspondent, paid to travel about the world and report on the current horrors. What other kind of noise do you expect me to make? COO COO? Blah blah? Marks Marks? He laughed again, then brought out one of his well-tried witticisms. I'm the man who won't take yes for an answer. Pretty, said Dr. McPhail. Very pretty. But now let's get down to business. Taking a pair of scissors out of his bag, he started to cut away the torn and blood-stained trouser leg that covered Will's injured knee. Will Farnaby looked up at him and wondered, as he looked, how much of this improbable Highlander was still Scottish and how much Palinese. About the blue eyes and the jutting nose there could be no doubt. But the brown skin, the delicate hands, the grace of movement, these surely came from somewhere considerably south of that weed. Were you born here? He asked. Dot the doctor nodded affirmatively. At Shivaparam, on the day of Queen Victoria's funeral, there was a final click of the scissors, and the trouser leg fell away, exposing the knee. Messy, was Dr. McPhail's verdict after a first intense scrutiny. But I don't think there's anything too serious. He turned to his granddaughter. I'd like you to run back to the station and ask Vijaya to come here with one of the other men. Tell them to pick up a stretcher at the infirmary. Mary Sorogini nodded and, without a word, rose to her feet and hurried away across the glade. Will looked after the small figure as it receded, the red skirt swinging from side to side, the smooth skin of the torso glowing rosily golden in the sunlight. You have a very remarkable granddaughter he said to Dr. McPhail. Mary Sorogini's father, said the doctor after a little silence, was my eldest son. He died four months ago, a mountain climbing accident. Will mumbled his sympathy, and there was another silence. Dr. McPhail uncorked a bottle of alcohol and swabbed his hands. This is going to hurt a bit, he warned. I'd suggest that you listen to that bird. He waved a hand in the direction of the dead tree, to which, after Mary Sorogini's departure, the miner had returned. Listen to him closely, listen discriminatingly. It'll keep your mind off the discomfort. Will Farnaby listened.
The minor had gone back to its first theme. Attention, the articulate oboe was calling. Attention. Attention to what? He asked, in the hope of eliciting a more enlightening answer than the one he had received from Mary Sorogini. To attention, said Dr. McPhail. Attention to attention? Of course. Attention, the minor chanted in ironical confirmation. Do you have many of these talking birds? There must be at least a thousand of them flying about the island. It was the old Roger's idea. He thought it would do people good. Maybe it does, though it seems rather unfair to the poor miners. Fortunately, however, birds don't understand pep talks. Not even Saint Francis. Just imagine, he went on, preaching sermons to perfectly good thrushes and goldfinches and chiffchaffs. What presumption! Why couldn't he have kept his mouth shut and let the birds preach to him? And now, he added in another tone, you'd better start listening to our friend in the tree. I'm going to clean this thing up. Attention. Here goes. The young man winced and bit his lip. Attention. 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 Yes, it was quite true. If you listened intently enough, the pain wasn't so bad. Attention. Attention. How you ever contrived to get up that cliff, said Dr. McPhail, as he reached for the bandage, I cannot conceive. We'll manage to laugh. Remember the beginning of Erhan, he said. As luck would have it, Providence was on my side. From the further side of the glade came the sound of voices. Will turned his head and saw Mary Sorogini emerging from between the trees, her red skirt swinging as she skipped along. Behind her, naked to the waist and carrying over his shoulder the bamboo poles and rolled up canvas of a light stretcher, walked a huge bronze statue of a man, and behind the giant came a slender, dark-skinned adolescent in white shorts. This is Vijaya Bhattacharya, said Dr. McPhail as the bronze statue approached. Vijaya is my assistant. In the hospital? Dr. McPhail shook his head. Except in emergencies, he said. I don't practice any more. Vijaya and I work together at the Agricultural Experimental Station. And Murugan Melendra, he waved his hand in the direction of the dark-skinned boy, is with us temporarily, studying soil science and plant breeding. Vijaya stepped aside and, laying a large hand on his companion's shoulder, pushed him forward. Looking up into that beautiful, sulky young face, Will suddenly recognized, with a start of surprise, the elegantly tailored youth he had met, five days before, at Rendang Lobo, had driven within Colonel Deeper's white Mercedes all over the island. He smiled, he opened his mouth to speak, then checked himself. Almost imperceptibly but quite unmistakenly, the boy had shaken his head. In his eyes Will saw an expression of anguished pleading. His lips moved soundlessly. Please, he seemed to be saying, please. Will readjusted his face. How do you do, Mr. Maylendra, he said in a tone of casual formality. Murugan looked enormously relieved. How do you do, he said, and made a little bow. Will looked round to see if the others had noticed what had happened. Mary Sorogini and Vijaya, he saw were busy with the stretcher and the doctor was repacking his black bag. The little comedy had been played without an audience. Young Murugan evidently had his reasons for not wanting it to be known that he had been in Rendang. Boys will be boys. Boys will even be girls. Colonel Deeper had been more than fatherly towards his young protege, and towards the colonel, Murugan had been a good deal more than filial, he had been positively adoring. Was it merely hero worship, merely a schoolboy's admiration for the strong man who had carried out a successful revolution, liquidated the opposition, and installed himself as dictator? Or were other feelings involved? Was Murugan playing Antinous to this black moustached Hadrian? Well, if that was how he felt about middle aged military gangsters, that was his privilege. And if the gangster liked pretty boys, that was his. And perhaps, Will went on to reflect, that was why Colonel Deeper had refrained from making a formal introduction. This is Murray was all he had said when the boy was ushered into the presidential office. 
my young friend Muru, and he had risen, had put his arm around the boy's shoulders, had led him to the sofa and sat down beside him. May I drive the Mercedes? Merugan had asked. The dictator had smiled indulgently and nodded his sleek black head. And that was another reason for thinking that more than mere friendliness was involved in that curious relationship. At the wheel of the colonel's sports car Merugan was a maniac. Only an infatuated lover would have entrusted himself, not to mention his guest, to such a chauffeur. On the flat between Rendang Lobo and the oil fields the speedometer had twice touched 110, and worse, much worse, was to follow on the mountain road from the oil fields to the copper mines. Chasms yawned, tires screeched round corners, water buffaloes emerged from bamboo thickets a few feet ahead of the car, ten-ton lorries came roaring down on the wrong side of the road. Aren't you a little nervous? Will had ventured to ask. But the gangster was pious as well as infatuated. If one knows that one is doing the will of Allah, and I do know it, Mr. Farnaby, there is no excuse for nervousness. In those circumstances, nervousness would be blasphemy. And as Murugan swerved to avoid yet another buffalo, he opened his gold cigarette case and offered Will a Balkan sobrange. Ready, Vijaya called. Dot Will turned his head and saw the stretcher lying on the ground beside him. Good. Said Dr. McPhail. Let's lift him onto it. Carefully. Carefully. A minute later the little procession was winding its way up the narrow path between the trees. Mary Sorogini was in the van, her grandfather brought up the rear and, between them, came Murugan and Vijaya at either end of the stretcher. Dot from his moving bed Will Farnaby looked up through the green darkness as though from the floor of a living sea. Far overhead, near the surface, there was a rustling among the leaves, a noise of monkeys. And now it was a dozen hornbills hopping, like the figments of a disordered imagination, through a cloud of orchids. Are you comfortable? Vijayu asked, bending solicitously to look into his face. Will smiled back at him. Luxuriously comfortable, he said. It isn't far, the other went on reassuringly. We'll be there in a few minutes. Where's there? The experimental station. It's like Rothamsted. Did you ever go to Rothamsted when you were in England? Will had heard of it, of course, but never seen the place. It's been going for more than a hundred years, Vijaya went on. A hundred and eighteen, to be precise, said Dr. McPhail. Laws and Gilbert started their work on fertilizers in 1843. One of their pupils came out here in the early fifties to help my grandfather get our station going. Rothamsted in the tropics, that was the idea. In the tropics and for the tropics. There was a lightening of the green gloom and a moment later the litter emerged from the forest into the full glare of tropical sunshine. Will raised his head and looked about him. They were not far from the floor of an immense amphitheater. Five hundred feet below stretched a wide plain, checkered with fields, dotted with clumps of trees and clustered houses. In the other direction the slopes climbed up and up, thousands of feet towards a semicircle of mountains. Terrace above green or golden terrace, from the plain to the crenellated wall of beaks. The rice paddies followed the contour lines, emphasizing every swell and recession of the slope with what seemed a deliberate and artful intention. Nature here was no longer merely natural, the landscape had been composed, had been reduced to its geometrical essences, and rendered, by what in a painter would have been a miracle of virtuosity, in terms of these sinuous lines, these streaks of pure bright color. What were you doing in Rendang? Dr. Robert asked, breaking a long silence. Collecting materials for a piece on the new regime. I wouldn't have thought the colonel was newsworthy. You're mistaken. He's a military dictator. That means there's death in the offing. And death is always news. Even the remote smell of death is news. He laughed. That's why I was told to drop in on my way back from China. And there had been other reasons which he preferred not to mention. Newspapers were only one of Lord Alderhyde's interests. In another manifestation he was the Southeast Asia Petroleum Company, he was Imperial and Foreign Copper Limited. 
Officially, Will had come to Rendang to sniff the death in its militarized air, but he had also been commissioned to find out what the dictator felt about foreign capital, what tax rebates he was prepared to offer, what guarantees against nationalization, and how much of the profits would be exportable. How many native technicians and administrators would have to be employed? A whole battery of questions. But Colonel Deepa had been most affable and cooperative. Hence that hair raising drive, with Murugan at the wheel, to the copper mines. Primitive, my dear Farnaby, primitive. Urgently in need, as you can see for yourself, of modern equipment. Another meeting had been arranged, arranged, will now remembered, for this very morning. He visualized the colonel at his desk. A report from the chief of police. Mr. Farnaby was last seen sailing a small boat single handed into the palace strait. Two hours later, a storm of great violence. Presumed dead. Instead of which, here he was, alive and kicking, on the Forbidden Island. They'll never give you a visa, Joe Alderhyde had said at their last interview. But perhaps you could sneak ashore in disguise. Wear a burnous or something, like Lawrence of Arabia. With a straight face. I'll try, Will had promised. Anyhow, if you ever do manage to land in Pala, make a beeline for the palace. The Rani, that's their queen mother, is an old friend of mine. Met her for the first time six years ago at Lugano. She was staying there with old Vogeli, the investment banker. His girlfriend is interested in spiritualism and they staged a seance for me. A trumpet medium, genuine direct voice only unfortunately it was all in German. Well, after the lights were turned on, I had a long talk with her. With the trumpet? No, no. With the Rani? She's a remarkable woman. You know, the crusade of the spirit. Was that her invention? Absolutely. And personally I prefer it to moral rearmament. It goes down better in Asia. We had a long talk about it that evening. And after that we talked about oil. Palace full of oil. Southeast Asia Petroleum has been trying to get in on it for years. So have all the other companies. Nothing doing. No oil concessions to anyone. It's their fixed policy. But the Rani doesn't agree with it. She wants to see the oil doing some good in the world. Financing the crusade of the spirit, for example. So, as I say, if ever you get to Pala, make a beeline for the palace. Talk to her. Get the inside story about the men who make the decisions. Find out if there's a pro-oil minority and ask how we could help them to carry on the good work. And he had ended by promising Will a handsome bonus if his efforts should be crowned with success. Enough to give him a full year of freedom. No more reporting. Nothing but high art, art, A-A-R-T and he had uttered a scatological laugh as though the word had an s at the end of it and not a t. Unspeakable creature. But all the same he wrote for the unspeakable creature's vile papers and was ready, for a bribe, to do the vile creature's dirty work. And now, incredibly, here he was on Palani's soil. As luck would have it, Providence had been on his side, for the express purpose, evidently, of perpetrating one of those sinister practical jokes which are Providence's specialty. He was called back to present reality by the sound of Mary Sorogini's shrill voice. Here we are. Will raised his head again. The little procession had turned off the highway and was passing through an opening in a white stuccoed wall. To the left, on a rising succession of terraces, stood lines of low buildings shaped by peepial trees. Straight ahead an avenue of tall palms sloped down to a lotus pool, on the further side of which sat a huge stone Buddha. Turning to the left, they climbed between flowering trees and through blending perfumes to the first terrace. Behind a fence, motionless except for his ruminating jaws, stood a snow-white hump bull, godlike in his serene and mindless beauty. Europa's lover receded into the past and here were a brace of Juno's birds trailing their feathers over the grass. Mary Sorogini unlatched the gate of a small garden. My bungalow, said Dr. McPhail, and turning to Murugan, let me help you to negotiate the steps. 
for Tom Krishna and Mary Sarojini had gone to take their siesta with the gardener's children next door. In her darkened living room Susla McPhail sat alone with her memories of past happiness and the present pain of her bereavement. The clock in the kitchen struck the half hour. It was time for her to go. With a sigh she rose, put on her sandals and walked out into the tremendous glare of the tropical afternoon. She looked up at the sky. Over the volcanoes enormous clouds were climbing towards the zenith. In an hour it would be raining. Moving from one pool of shadow to the next, she made her way along the tree-lined path. With a sudden rattle of quills a flock of pigeons broke out of one of the towering pepial trees. Green-winged and coral-billed, their breasts changing color in the light like mother of pearl, they flew off towards the forest. How beautiful they were, how unutterably lovely! Susla was on the point of turning to catch the expression of delight on Dugald's upturned face, then, checking herself, she looked down at the ground. There was no Dugald anymore, there was only this pain, like the pain of the phantom limb that goes on haunting the imagination, haunting even the perceptions of those who have undergone an amputation. Amputation, she whispered to herself, amputation. Feeling her eyes fill with tears, she broke off. Amputation was no excuse for self pity, and, for all that Dugald was dead, the birds were as beautiful as ever, and her children, all the other children, had as much need to be loved and helped and taught. If his absence was so constantly present, that was to remind her that henceforward she must love for two, live for two, take thought for two, must perceive and understand not merely with her own eyes and mind, but with the mind and eyes that had been his and, before the catastrophe, hers too in a communion of delight and intelligence. But here was the doctor's bungalow. She mounted the steps, crossed the veranda and walked into the living room. Her father-in-law was seated near the window, sipping cold tea from an earthenware mug and reading the review de mycology. He looked up as she approached, and gave her a welcoming smile. Susla, my dear. I'm so glad you were able to come. She bent down and kissed his stubbly cheek. What's all this I hear from Mary Srogini? She asked. Is it true she found a castaway? From England, but via China, Rendang, and a shipwreck. A journalist. What's he like? The physique of a messiah. But too clever to believe in God or be convinced of his own mission. And too sensitive, even if he were convinced, to carry it out. His muscles would like to act and his feelings would like to believe, but his nerve endings and his cleverness won't allow it. So I suppose he's very unhappy. So unhappy that he has to laugh like a hyena. Does he know he laughs like a hyena? Knows and is rather proud of it. Even makes epigrams about it. I'm the man who won't take yes for an answer. Is he badly hurt? She asked. Not badly. But he's running a temperature. I've started him on antibiotics. Now it's up to you to raise his resistance and give the vis medicatrix snatcher a chance. I'll do my best. Then, after a silence, I went to see Lakshmi, she said, on my way back from school. How did you find her? About the same. No, perhaps a little weaker than yesterday. That's what I felt when I saw her this morning. Luckily the pain doesn't seem to get any worse we can still handle it psychologically. And today we worked on the nausea. She was able to drink something. I don't think there'll be any more need for intravenous fluids. Thank goodness. He said. Those four S were a torture. Such enormous courage in the face of every real danger, but whenever it was a question of a hypodermic or a needle in a vein. The most abject and irrational terror. He thought of the time in the early days of their marriage, when he had lost his temper and called her a coward for making such a fuss. Lakshmi had cried and, having submitted to her martyrdom, had heaped coals of fire upon his head by begging to be forgiven. Lakshmi, Lakshmi! And now in a few days she would be dead. After thirty-seven years! What did you talk about? He asked aloud. Nothing in particular, Suzla answered. But the truth was that they had talked about Dugald and that she couldn't bring herself to repeat what had passed between them. My first baby, the dying woman had whispered. 
I didn't know that babies could be so beautiful. In their skull deep, skull dark sockets the eyes had brightened, the bloodless lips had smiled. Such tiny, tiny hands. The faint hoarse voice went on, such a greedy little mouth. And an almost fleshless hand tremblingly touched the place where, before last year's operation, her breast had been. I never knew, she repeated. And, before the event, how could she have known? It had been a revelation, an apocalypse of touch and love. Do you know what I mean? And Susla had nodded. Of course she knew, had known it in relation to her own two children, known it, in those other apocalypses of touch and love, with the man that little dugald of the tiny hands and greedy mouth had grown into. I used to be afraid for him, the dying woman had whispered. He was so strong, such a tyrant. He could have hurt and bullied and destroyed. If he'd married another woman. I'm so thankful it was you. From the place where the breast had been, the fleshless hand moved out and came to rest on Susla's arm. She had bent her head and kissed it. They were both crying. Dr. McPhail sighed, looked up, and, like a man who has climbed out of the water, gave himself a little shake. The castaway's name is Farnaby, he said. Will Farnaby. Will Farnaby, Susla repeated. Well, I'd better go and see what I can do for him. She turned and walked away. Dr. McPhail looked after her, then leaned back in his chair and closed his eyes. He thought of his son, he thought of his wife, of Lakshmi slowly wasting to extinction, of Dugald like a bright fiery flame suddenly snuffed out. Thought of the incomprehensible sequence of changes and chances that make up a life all the beauties and horrors and absurdities whose conjunctions create the uninterpretable and yet divinely significant pattern of human destiny. Poor girl, he said to himself, remembering the look on Susla's face when he had told her of what had happened to Dugald, poor girl. Meanwhile there was this article on hallucinogenic mushrooms in the review de mycology. That was another of the irrelevancies that somehow took its place in the pattern. The words of one of the old Raja's queer little poems came to his mind. All things, to all things perfectly indifferent, perfectly work together in discord for a good bind good, for a being more timeless in transience, more eternal in its dwindling than God there in heaven. The door creaked, and an instant later Will heard light footsteps and the rustle of skirts. Then a hand was laid on his shoulder and a woman's voice, low pitched and musical asked him how he was feeling. I'm feeling miserable, he answered without opening his eyes. There was no self-pity in his tone, no appeal for sympathy, only the angry matter-of-factness of a stoic who has finally grown sick of the long farce of impassibility and is resentfully blurting out the truth. I'm feeling miserable. The hand touched him again. I'm Susla McPhail, said the voice Mary Sorogini's mother. Reluctantly Will turned his head and opened his eyes. An adult, darker version of Mary Sorogini was sitting there beside the bed, smiling at him with friendly solicitude. To smile back at her would have cost him too great an effort. He contented himself with saying how do you do, then pulled the sheet a little higher and closed his eyes again. Susla looked down at him in silence, at the bony shoulders at the cage of ribs under a skin whose Nordic pallor made him seem, to her Palanese eyes, so strangely frail and vulnerable, at the sunburnt face, emphatically featured like a carving intended to be seen at a distance, emphatic and yet sensitive, the quivering, more than naked face, she found herself thinking, of a man who has been flayed and left to suffer. I hear you're from England, she said at last. I don't care where I'm from. Will muttered irritably. Nor where I'm going. From hell to hell. I was in England just after the war, she went on. As a student. He tried not to listen, but ears have no lids. There was no escape from that intruding voice. There was a girl in my psychology class, it was saying, her people lived at Wells. She asked me to stay with them for the first month of the summer vacation. Do you know Wells? Of course he knew Wells. Why did she pester him with her silly reminiscences? I used to love walking there by the water, Susla went on, looking across the moat at the cathedral and thinking, while she looked at the cathedral, 
of Dugald under the palm trees on the beach, of Dugald giving her her first lesson in rock climbing. You're on the rope. You're perfectly safe. You can't possibly fall. Can't possibly fall, she repeated bitterly, and then remembered here and now, remembered that she had a job to do, remembered, as she looked again at the flayed emphatic face, that here was a human being in pain. How lovely it was, she went on, and how marvelously peaceful. The voice, it seemed to Will Farnaby, had become more musical and in some strange way more remote. Perhaps that was why he no longer resented its intrusion. Such an extraordinary sense of peace. Shanty, shanty, shanty. The peace that passes understanding. The voice was almost chanting now, chanting, it seemed, out of some other world. I can shut my eyes, it chanted on, can shut my eyes and see it all so clearly. Can see the church, and it's enormous much taller than the huge trees round the bishop's palace. Can see the green grass and the water and the golden sunlight on the stones and the slanting shadows between the buttresses. And listen. I can hear the bells. The bells and the jackdaws. The jackdaws in the tower, can you hear the jackdaws? Yes, he could hear the jackdaws, could hear them almost as clearly as he now heard those parrots in the trees outside his window. He was here and at the same time he was there, here in this dark, sweltering room near the equator, but also there, outdoors in that cool hollow at the edge of the Mendips, with the jackdaws calling from the cathedral tower and the sound of the bells dying away into the green silence. And there are white clouds, the voice was saying, and the blue sky between them is so pale, so delicate, so exquisitely tender. Tender, he repeated the tender blue sky of that April weekend he had spent there, before the disaster of their marriage, with Molly. There were daisies in the grass and dandelions, and across the water towered up that huge church, challenging the wildness of those soft April clouds with its austere geometry. Challenging the wildness, and at the same time complimenting it, coming to terms with it in perfect reconciliation. That was how it should have been with himself and Molly, how it had been then. And the swans, he now heard the voice dreamily chanting, the swans. Yes, the swans. White swans moving across a mirror of jade and jet, a breathing mirror that heaved and trembled, so that their silver images were forever breaking and coming together again, disintegrating and being made whole. Like the inventions of heraldry. Romantic, impossibly beautiful. And yet there they are real birds in a real place. So near to me now that I can almost touch them, and yet so far away, thousands of miles away. Far away on that smooth water, moving as if by magic, softly, majestically. Majestically, moving majestically, with the dark water lifting and parting as the curved white breasts advanced, lifting, parting, sliding back in ripples that widened in a gleaming arrowhead behind them. He could see them moving across their dark mirror, could hear the jackdaws in the tower, could catch, through this nearer mingling of disinfectants and gardenias, the cold, flat, weedy smell of that gothic moat in the faraway green valley. Effortlessly floating. Effortlessly floating. The words gave him a deep satisfaction. I'd sit there, she was saying, I'd sit the looking and looking, and in a little while I'd be floating too. I'd be floating with the swans on that smooth surface between the darkness below and the pale tender sky above. Floating at the same time on that other surface between here and far away, between then and now. And between remembered happiness, she was thinking, and this insistent, excruciating presence of an absence. Floating, she said aloud, on the surface between the real and the imagined between what comes to us from the outside and what comes to us from within, from deep, deep down in here. She laid her hand on his forehead, and suddenly the words transformed themselves into the things and events for which they stood, the images turned into facts. He actually was floating. Floating, the voice softly insisted. Floating like a white bird on the water. Floating on a great river of life a great smooth silent river that flows so still, 
so still, you might almost think it was asleep. A sleeping river. But it flows irresistibly. Life flowing silently and irresistibly into ever fuller life, into a living peace all the more profound, all the richer and stronger and more complete because it knows all your pain and unhappiness, knows them and takes them into itself and makes them one with its own substance. And it's into that peace that you're floating now, floating on this smooth silent river that sleeps and is yet irresistible, and is irresistible precisely because it's sleeping. And I'm floating with it. She was speaking for the stranger. She was speaking on another level for herself. Effortlessly floating. Not having to do anything at all. Just letting go, just allowing myself to be carried along, just asking this irresistible sleeping river of life to take me where it's going, and knowing all the time that where it's going is where I want to go, where I have to go, into more life, into living peace. Along the sleeping river, irresistibly, into the wholeness of reconciliation. Involuntarily, unconsciously, Wilfarnaby gave a deep sigh. How silent the world had become. Silent with a deep crystalline silence, even though the parrots were still busy out there beyond the shutters, even though the voice still chanted here beside him. Silence and emptiness and through the silence and the emptiness flowed the river, sleeping and irresistible. Susla looked down at the face on the pillow. It seemed suddenly very young, childlike in its perfect serenity. The frowning lines across the forehead had disappeared. The lips that had been so tightly closed in pain were parted now, and the breath came slowly, softly, almost imperceptibly. She remembered suddenly the words that had come into her mind as she looked down, one moonlit night, at the transfigured innocence of Dugald's face, she giveth her beloved sleep. Sleep, she said aloud. Sleep. The silence seemed to become more absolute, the emptiness more enormous. Asleep on the sleeping river, the voice was saying. And above the river, in the pale sky, there are huge white clouds. And as you look at them, you begin to float up towards them. Yes, you begin to float up towards them, and the river now is a river in the air, an invisible river that carries you on, carries you up, higher and higher. Upwards, upwards through the silent emptiness. The image was the thing, the words became the experience. Out of the hot plain, the voice went on, effortlessly, into the freshness of the mountains. Yes, there was the young Frau dazzlingly white against the blue. There was Monte Rosa. How fresh the air feels as you breathe it. Fresh, pure, charged with life. He breathed deeply and the new life flowed into him. And now a little wind came blowing across the snowfields, cool against his skin, deliciously cool. And, as though echoing his thoughts, as though describing his experience, the voice said, coolness coolness and sleep. Through coolness into more life. Through sleep into reconciliation, into wholeness, into living peace. Half an hour later Susla re-entered the sitting room. Well? Her father-in-law questioned. Any success? She nodded. I talked to him about a place in England, she said. He went off more quickly than I'd expected. After that I gave him some suggestions about his temperature. And the knee, I hope. Of course. Direct suggestions? No, indirect. They're always better. I got him to be conscious of his body image. Then I made him imagine it much bigger than in everyday reality, and the knee much smaller. A miserable little thing in revolt against a huge and splendid thing. There can't be any doubt as to who's going to win. She looked at the clock on the wall. Goodness, I must hurry. Otherwise I'll be late for my class at school. 5 The sun was just rising as Dr. Robert entered his wife's room at the hospital. An orange glow, and against it the jagged silhouette of the mountains. Then suddenly a dazzling sickle of incandescence between two peaks. The sickle became a half circle and the first long shadows, the first shafts of golden light crossed the garden outside the window. And when one looked up again at the mountains there was the whole unbearable glory of the risen sun. Dr. Robert sat down by the bed, took his wife's hand and kissed it. 
she smiled at him, then turned again towards the window. How quickly the earth turns! She whispered, and then after a silence, one of these mornings, she added, it'll be my last sunrise. Through the confused chorus of bird cries and insect noises, a miner was chanting, Karana! 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 Lakshmi repeated. Compassion! Karana! Karana! The oboe voice of Buddha insisted from the garden. I shan't be needing it much longer, she went on. But what about you? Poor Robert, what about you? Somehow or other one finds the necessary strength, he said. But will it be the right kind of strength? Or will it be the strength of armor, the strength of shut on us, the strength of being absorbed in your work and your ideas and not caring a damn for anything else? Remember how I used to come and pull your hair and make you pay attention? Who's going to do that when I'm gone? A nurse came in with a glass of sugared water. Dr. Robert slid a hand under his wife's shoulders and lifted her to a sitting position. The nurse held the glass to her lips. Lakshmi drank a little water, swallowed with difficulty, then drank again and yet once more. Turning from the proffered glass, she looked up at Dr. Robert. The wasted face was illumined by a strangely incongruous twinkle of pure mischief. I the Trinity illustrate, the faint voice hoarsely quoted, sipping water orange pulp, in three sips the Aryan frustrate. She broke off. What a ridiculous thing to be remembering. But then I always was pretty ridiculous. Wasn't I? Dr. Robert did his best to smile back at her. Pretty ridiculous, he agreed. You used to say I was like a flea. Here one moment and then, hop. Somewhere else, miles away. No wonder you could never educate me. But you educated me all right, he assured her. If it hadn't been for you coming in and pulling my hair and making me look at the world and helping me to understand it, what would I be today? A pedant in blinkers, in spite of all my training. But luckily I had the sense to ask you to marry me, and luckily you had the folly to say yes and then the wisdom and intelligence to make a good job of me. After thirty-seven years of adult education I'm almost human. But I'm still a flea. She shook her head. And yet I did try. I tried very hard. I don't know if you ever realized it, Robert, I was always on tiptoes, always straining up towards the place where you were doing your work and your thinking and your reading. On tiptoes, trying to reach it, trying to get up there beside you. Goodness, how tiring it was. What an endless series of efforts. And all of them quite useless because I was just a dumb flea hopping about down here among the people and the flowers and the cats and dogs. Your kind of highbrow world was a place I could never climb up to, much less find my way in. When this thing happened, she raised her hand again to her absent breast, I didn't have to try any more. No more school, no more homework. I had a permanent excuse. There was a long silence. What about taking another sip? said the nurse at last. Yes, you ought to drink some more, Dr. Robert agreed. And ruin the trinity? Lakshmi gave him another of her smiles. Through the mask of age and mortal sickness Dr. Robert suddenly saw the laughing girl with whom, half a lifetime ago, and yet only yesterday, he had fallen in love. An hour later Dr. Robert was back in his bungalow. You're going to be all alone this morning, he announced after changing the dressing on Will Farnaby's knee. I have to drive down to Shivaparim for a meeting of the Privy Council. One of our student nurses will come in around twelve to give you your injection and get you something to eat. And in the afternoon, as soon as she's finished her work at the school, Susla will be dropping in again. And now I must be going. Dr. Robert rose and laid his hand for a moment on Will's arm. Till this evening. Halfway to the door he halted and turned back. I almost forgot to give you this. From one of the side pockets of his sagging jacket he pulled out a small green booklet. It's the old Raja's notes on what's what, and on what it might be reasonable to do about what's what. What an admirable title! said Will as he took the proffered book. And you like the contents, too? Dr. Robert assured him. 
just a few pages, that's all. But if you want to know what Pala is all about, there's no better introduction. Incidentally, Will asked, who is the old Raja? Who was he, I'm afraid? The old Raja died in 38, after a reign three years longer than Queen Victoria's. His eldest son died before he did, and he was succeeded by his grandson, who was an ass, but made up for it by being short-lived. The present Raju is his great-grandson. And, if I may ask a personal question, how does anybody called MacPhail come into the picture? The first MacPhail of Pala came into it under the old Raja's grandfather, the Raju of the Reform, we call him. Between them, he and my great-grandfather invented modern Pala. The old Raja consolidated their work and carried it further. And today we're doing our best to follow in his footsteps. We'll held up the notes on what's what. Does this give the history of the reforms? Dr. Robert shook his head. It merely states the underlying principles. Read about those first. When I get back from Chivaparam this evening, I'll give you a taste of the history. You'll have a better understanding of what was actually done if you start by knowing what had to be done, what always and everywhere has to be done by anyone who has a clear idea about what's what. So read it, read it. And don't forget to drink your fruit juice at eleven. Will watched him go, then opened the little green book and started to read. In a body needs to go anywhere else. We are all, if we only knew it, already the dot if I only knew who in fact I am, I should cease to behave as what I think I am, and if I stopped behaving as what I think I am, I should know who I am. Dot what in fact I am, if only the manichi I think I am would allow me to know it is the reconciliation of yes and no lived out in total acceptance and the blessed experience of not to dot in religion all words are dirty words. Anybody who gets eloquent about Buddha, or God, or Christ, ought to have his mouth washed out with carbolic soap dot because his aspiration to perpetuate only the yes in every pair of opposites can never, in the nature of things, be realized. The insulated Manichi I think I am condemns himself to endlessly repeated frustration, endlessly repeated conflicts with other aspiring and frustrated Manichis. Conflicts and frustrations, the theme of all history and almost all biography. I show you sorrow, said the Buddha realistically. But he also showed the ending of sorrow, self knowledge, total acceptance. The blessed experience of not to dot I, I knowing who in fact we are results in good being, and good being results in the most appropriate kind of good doing. But good doing does not of itself result in good being. We can be virtuous without knowing who in fact we are. The beings who are merely good are not good beings. They are just pillars of society. Most pillars are their own Samsons. They hold up, but sooner or later they pull down. There has never been a society in which most good doing was the product of good being and therefore constantly appropriate. This does not mean that there will never be such a society or that we in Palo are fools for trying to call it into existence. Of Yogan and the Stoic, two righteous egos who achieve their very considerable results by pretending, systematically, to be somebody else. But it is not by pretending to be somebody else, even somebody supremely good and wise, that we can pass from insulated manichihood to good being. Good being is knowing who in fact we are, and in order to know who in fact we are, we must first know, moment by moment, who we think we are and what this bad habit of thought compels us to feel and do. A moment of clear and complete knowledge of what we think we are, but in fact are not, puts a stop, for the moment, to the Manichaean charade. If we renew, until they become a continuity, these moments of the knowledge of what we are not, we may find ourselves, all of a sudden, knowing who in fact we are. Concentration, abstract thinking, spiritual exercises, systematic exclusions in the realm of thought, asceticism and hedonism, systematic exclusions in the realms of sensation, feeling and action. But good being is in the knowledge of who in fact one is in relation to all experiences. So be aware, aware in every context, at all times and whatever, creditable or discreditable, pleasant or unpleasant, you may be doing or suffering. 
this is the only genuine yoga, the only spiritual exercise worth practicing. The more a man knows about individual objects, the more he knows about God. Translating Spinoza's language into ours, we can say, the more a man knows about himself in relation to every kind of experience, the greater his chance of suddenly, one fine morning, realizing who in fact he is, or rather who, capital W, in fact, capital F, he, between quotation marks, is, capital I. Saint John was right. In the blessedly speechless universe, the word was not only with God, it was God. As a something to be believed in. God is a projected symbol, a reified name. God equals God. Faith is something very different from belief. Belief is the systematic taking of unanalyzed words much too seriously. Paul's words, Muhammad's words, Marx's words, Hitler's words, people take them too seriously, and what happens? What happens is the senseless ambivalence of history, sadism versus duty, or, incomparably worse, sadism as duty, devotion counterbalanced by organized paranoia, sisters of charity selflessly tending the victims of their own churches inquisitors and crusaders. Faith, on the contrary, can never be taken too seriously. For faith is the empirically justified confidence in our capacity to know who in fact we are, to forget the belief intoxicated manichi in good being. Give us this day our daily faith, but deliver us, dear God, from belief. There was a tap at the door. Will looked up from his book. Who's there? It's me, said a voice that brought back unpleasant memories of Colonel Deeper and that nightmarish drive in the white Mercedes. Dressed only in white sandals, white shorts, and a platinum wrist watch, Murugan was advancing towards the bed. How nice of you to come and see me. Another visitor would have asked him how he was feeling, but Murugan was too wholeheartedly concerned with himself to be able even to simulate the slightest interest in anyone else. I came to the door three quarters of an hour ago, he said in tones of aggrieved complaint. But the old man hadn't left, so I had to go home again. And then I had to sit with my mother and the man who's staying with us while they were having their breakfast. Why couldn't you come in while Dr. Robert was here? Will asked. Is it against the rules for you to talk to me? The boy shook his head impatiently. Of course not. I just didn't want him to know the reason for my coming to see you. The reason? Will smiled. Visiting the sick is an act of charity, highly commendable. His irony was lost upon Murugan, who went on steadily thinking about his own affairs. Thank you for not telling them you'd seen me before, he said abruptly, almost angrily. It was as though he resented having to acknowledge his obligation and were furious with Will for having done him the good turn which demanded this acknowledgement. I could see you didn't want me to say anything about it, said Will. So of course I didn't. I wanted to thank you, Murugan muttered between his teeth and in a tone that would have been appropriate to you dirty swine. Don't mention it, said Will with mock politeness. What a delicious creature! He was thinking as he looked, with amused curiosity, at that smooth golden torso, that averted face, regular as a statue's but no longer Olympian, no longer classical, a Hellenistic face, mobile and all too human. A vessel of incomparable beauty, but what did it contain? It was a pity, he reflected that he hadn't asked that question a little more seriously before getting involved with his unspeakable Babs. But then Babs was a female. By the sort of heterosexual he was, the sort of rational question he was now posing was unaskable. As no doubt it would be, by anyone susceptible to boys, in regard to this bad-blooded little demigod sitting at the end of his bed. Didn't Dr. Robert know you'd gone to Rendang? He asked. Of course he knew. Everybody knew it. I'd gone there to fetch my mother. She was staying there with some of her relations. I went over to bring her back to Pala. It was absolutely official. Then why didn't you want me to say that I'd met you over there? Merugan hesitated for a moment, then looked up at Will defiantly. Because I didn't want them to know I'd been seeing Colonel Deeper. Oh, 
So that was it. Colonel Deep is a remarkable man, he said aloud, fishing with sugared bait for confidences. Surprisingly unsuspicious, the fish rose at once. Merugan's sulky face lit up with enthusiasm, and there, suddenly, was emptiness in all the fascinating beauty of his ambiguous adolescence. I think he's wonderful, he said, and for the first time since he had entered the room, he seemed to recognize Will's existence and give him the friendliest of smiles. The colonel's wonderfulness had made him forget his resentment, had made it possible for him, momentarily, to love everybody, even this man to whom he owed a rankling debt of gratitude. Look at what he's doing for Endang. He's certainly doing a great deal for Endang, said Will noncommittally. A cloud passed across Merugan's radiant face. They don't think so here, he said, frowning. They think he's awful. Who thinks so? practically everybody. So they didn't want you to see him? With the expression of an urchin who has cocked a snook while the teacher's back is turned, Merugan grinned triumphantly. They thought I was with my mother all the time. Will picked up the cue at once. Did your mother know you were seeing the colonel? He asked. Of course. And had no objection? She was all for it. And yet, Will felt quite sure. He hadn't been mistaken when he thought of Hadrian and Antinous. Was the woman blind? Or didn't she wish to see what was happening? But if she doesn't mind, he said aloud, why should Dr. Robert and the rest of them object? Merugan looked at him suspiciously. Realizing that he had ventured too far into forbidden territory, Will hastily drew a red herring across the trail. Do they think, he asked with a laugh that he might convert you to a belief in military dictatorship? The red herring was duly followed, and the boy's face relaxed into a smile. Not that, exactly, he answered, but something like it. It's all so stupid, he added with a shrug of the shoulders. Just idiotic protocol. Protocol. Will was genuinely puzzled. Weren't you told anything about me? Only what Dr. Robert said yesterday. You mean, about my being a student? Merugan threw back his head and laughed. What's so funny about being a student? Nothing, nothing at all. The boy looked away again. There was a silence. Still averted, the reason, he said at last, why I'm not supposed to see Colonel Depot is that he's the head of a state and I'm the head of a state. When we meet, it's international politics. What do you mean? I happen to be the Raja of Pala. The Raja of Pala? Since 54. That was when my father died. And your mother, I take it, is the Rani? My mother is the Rani. Make a beeline for the palace? But here was the palace making a beeline for him. Providence, evidently, was on the side of Joe Alderhyde and working overtime. Were you the eldest son? He asked. The only son, Merugan replied. And then, stressing his uniqueness still more emphatically, the only child, he added. So there's no possible doubt, said Will. My goodness. I ought to be calling you your majesty. Or at least sir. The words were spoken laughingly, but it was with the most perfect seriousness and a sudden assumption of regal dignity that Merugan responded to them. You'll have to call me that at the end of next week, he said. After my birthday. I shall be eighteen. That's when a Raja of Pala comes of age. Till then I'm just Merugan Mailendra. Just a student learning a little bit about everything, including plant breeding, he added contemptuously, so that, when the time comes, I shall know what I'm doing. And when the time comes, what will you be doing? Between this pretty antinous and his portentous office there was a contrast which will found richly comic. How do you propose to act? He continued on a bantering note. Off with their heads. Let at quist moi. Seriousness and regal dignity hardened into rebuke. Don't be stupid. Amused, Will went through the motions of apology. I just wanted to find out how absolute you were going to be. Pala is a constitutional monarchy, Merugan answered gravely. In other words, you're just going to be a symbolic figurehead, to reign like the Queen of England, but not rule. Forgetting his regal dignity, no, 
No, Murugan almost screamed. Not like the Queen of England. The Raja of Pala doesn't just train, he rules. Too much agitated to sit still, Murugan jumped up and began to walk about the room. He rules constitutionally, but, by God, he rules, he rules. Murugan walked to the window and looked out. Turning back after a moment of silence, he confronted Will with a face transfigured by its new expression into an emblem, exquisitely molded and colored, of an all too familiar kind of psychological ugliness. I'll show them who's the boss around here, he said in a phrase and tone which had obviously been borrowed from the hero of some American gangster movie. These people think they can push me around. He went on, reciting from the dismally commonplace script, the way they pushed my father around. But they're making a big mistake. He uttered a sinister snigger and wagged his beautiful, odious head. A big mistake, he repeated. The words had been spoken between clenched teeth and with scarcely moving lips, the lower jaw had been thrust out so as to look like the jaw of a comic strip criminal, the eyes glared coldly between narrowed lids. At once absurd and horrible. Antinous had become the caricature of all the tough guys in all the B pictures from time immemorial. Who's been running the country during your minority? He now asked. Three sets of old fogies, Murugan answered contemptuously. The cabinet, the House of Representatives and then, representing me, the Raja, the Privy Council. Poor old fogies. Said Will. They'll soon be getting the shock of their lives. Entering gaily into the spirit of delinquency, he laughed aloud. I only hope I'll still be around to see it happening. Merugan joined in the laughter, joined in it, not as the sinisterly mirthful tough guy, but with one of those sudden changes of mood and expression that would make it, Will foresaw, so hard for him to play the tough guy part, as the triumphant urchin of a few minutes earlier. The shock of their lives, he repeated happily. Have you made any specific plans? I most certainly have, said Murugan. On his mobile face the triumphant urchin made way for the statesman, grave but condescendingly affable, at a press conference. Top priority, get this place modernized. Look at what Rendang has been able to do because of its oil royalties. But doesn't Pala get any oil royalties? Will questioned with that innocent air of total ignorance which he had found by long experience to be the best way of eliciting information from the simple-minded and the self-important. Not a penny, said Murugan. And yet the southern end of the island is fairly oozing with the stuff. But except for a few measly little wells for home consumption, the old fogies won't do anything about it. And what's more, they won't allow anyone else to do anything about it. The statesman was growing angry, there were hints now in his voice and expression of the tough guy. All sorts of people have made offers, Southeast Asia Petroleum, Shell, Royal Dutch, Standard of California. But the bloody old fools won't listen. Can't you persuade them to listen? I'll damn well make them listen, said the tough guy. That's the spirit. Then, casually, which of the offers do you think of accepting? He asked. Colonel Deep is working with Standard of California, and he thinks it might be best if we did the same. I wouldn't do that without at least getting a few competing bids. That's what I think too. So does my mother. Very wise. My mother's all for Southeast Asia Petroleum. She knows the chairman of the board, Lord Alderhyde. She knows Lord Alderhyde. But how extraordinary. The tone of delighted astonishment was thoroughly convincing. Joe Alderhyde is a friend of mine. I write for his papers. I even serve as his private ambassador. Confidentially, he added, that's why we took that trip to the copper mines. Copper is one of Joe's sidelines. But of course his real love is oil. Merugan tried to look shrewd. What would he be prepared to offer? Will picked up the cue and answered, in the best movie tycoon style, whatever standard offers plus a little more. Fair enough, said Murugan out of the same script, and nodded sagely. There was a long silence. When he spoke again, it was as the statesman granting an interview to representatives of the press. 
The oil royalties, he said, will be used in the following manner. 25% of all monies received will go to world reconstruction. May I ask, will inquired deferentially, precisely how you propose to reconstruct the world? Through the crusade of the spirit. Do you know about the crusade of the spirit? Of course. Who doesn't? It's a great world movement, said the statesman gravely. Like early Christianity. Founded by my mother. Will registered or under astonishment. Yes, founded by my mother, Murugan repeated, and he added impressively, I believe it's man's only hope. Quite, said Will Farnaby, quite. Well, that's how the first 25% of the royalties will be used, the statesman continued. The remainder will go into an intensive program of industrialization. The tone changed again. These old idiots here only want to industrialize in spots and leave all the rest as it was a thousand years ago. Whereas you'd like to go the whole hog. Industrialization for industrialization's sake. No, industrialization for the country's sake. Industrialization to make palace strong. To make other people respect us. Look at Rendang. Within five years they'll be manufacturing all the rifles and mortars and ammunition they need. It'll be quite a long time before they can make tanks. But meanwhile they can buy them from Skoda with their oil money. How soon will they graduate to H-bombs? Will asked ironically. They won't even try, Murugan answered. But after all, he added, H-bombs aren't the only absolute weapons. He pronounced the phrase with relish. It was evident that he found the taste of absolute weapons positively delicious. Chemical and biological weapons, Colonel Deeper calls them the poor man's H-bombs. One of the first things I'll do is to build a big insecticide plant. Merugan laughed and winked an eye. If you can make insecticides, he said, you can make nerve gas. Will remember that still unfinished factory in the suburbs of Rendang Lobo. What's that? He had asked Colonel Deep as they flashed past it in the white Mercedes. Insecticides, the Colonel had answered. And showing his gleaming white teeth in a genial smile, we shall soon be exporting the stuff all over Southeast Asia. At the time, of course, he had thought that the Colonel merely meant what he said. But now Dotwill shrugged his mental shoulders. Colonels will be colonels and boys even boys like Murugan, will be gun-loving boys. There would always be plenty of jobs for special correspondents on the trail of death. So you'll strengthen Pala's army? Will said aloud. Strengthen it? No, I'll create it. Pala doesn't have an army. None at all? Absolutely nothing. They're all pacifists. The P was an explosion of disgust, the S's hissed contemptuously. I shall have to start from scratch. And you'll militarize as you industrialize, is that it? Exactly. Will laughed. Back to the Assyrians. You'll go down in history as a true revolutionary. That's what I hope, said Murugan. Because that's what my policy is going to be, continuing revolution. Very good. Will applauded. I'll just be continuing the revolution that was started more than a hundred years ago by Dr. Robert's great-grandfather when he came to Pala and helped my great-great-grandfather to put through the first reforms. Some of the things they did were really wonderful. Not all of them, mind you, he qualified, and with the absurd solemnity of a schoolboy playing Polonius in an end-of-term performance of Hamlet he shook his curly head in grave, judicial disapproval but at least they did something. Whereas nowadays we're governed by a set of do-nothing conservatives. Conservatively primitive, they won't lift a finger to bring in modern improvements. And conservatively radical, they refuse to change any of the old bad revolutionary ideas that ought to be changed. They won't reform the reforms. And I tell you, some of those so-called reforms are absolutely disgusting. Meaning, I take it that they have something to do with sex? Merugan nodded and turned away his face. To his astonishment, Will saw that he was blushing. Give me an example, he demanded. Dot, but Merugan could not bring himself to be explicit. Ask Dr. Robert, he said, ask Vijaya. 
They think that sort of thing is simply wonderful. In fact they all do. That's one of the reasons why nobody wants to change. They'd like everything to go on as it is, in the same old disgusting way, forever and ever. Forever and ever, a rich contralto her voice teasingly repeated. Mother. Marugan sprang to his feet. Will turned and saw in the doorway a large florid woman swathed, rather incongruously, he thought, for that kind of face and build usually went with mauve and magenta and electric blue, in clouds of white muslin. She stood there smiling with a conscious mysteriousness, one fleshy brown arm upraised, with its jeweled hand pressed against the door jam, in the pose of the great actress, the acknowledged diva pausing at her first entrance to accept the plaudits of her adorers on the other side of the footlights. In the background, waiting patiently for his cue, stood a tall man in a dove grey dacron suit whom Merugan, peering past the massive embodiment of maternity that almost filled the doorway, now greeted as Mr. Boo. Still in the wings, Mr. Boo bowed without speaking. Merugan turned again to his mother. Did you walk here? he asked. His tone expressed incredulity and an admiring solicitude. Walking here, how unthinkable. But if she had walked, what heroism. All the way? All the way, my baby, she echoed, tenderly playful. The uplifted arm came down, slid round the boy's slender body, pressed it, engulfed in floating draperies, against the enormous bosom, then released it again. I had one of my impulses. She had a way, Will noticed, of making you actually hear the capital letters at the beginning of the words she meant to emphasize. My little voice said, Go and see this stranger at Dr. Robert's house. Go. Now? I said. Malgalachela? Which makes my little voice lose patience. Woman, it says, Hold your silly tongue and do as you're told. So here I am, Mr. Farnaby with hand outstretched and surrounded by a powerful aura of sandalwood oil, she advanced towards him. Will bowed over the thick bejeweled fingers and mumbled something that ended in your highness. Boo! she called, using the royal prerogative of the unadorned surname. Responding to his long-awaited cue, the supporting actor made his entrance and was introduced as his excellency, Abdul Boo, the ambassador of Rendang. Abdul Pierre Bou, Casa Mirest Parisienne. But he learned his English in New York. He looked, Will thought as he shook the ambassador's hand, like Savonarola, but a Savonarola with a monocle and a tailor in Savile Row. Bou, said the Rani, is Colonel Deeper's brains trust. Your Highness, if I may be permitted to say so, is much too kind to me and not nearly kind enough to the Colonel. His words and manner were courtly to the point of being ironical, a parody of deference and self-abasement. The brains, he went on, are where brains ought to be, in the head. As for me, I am merely a part of Rendang's sympathetic nervous system. Et combien sympathique, said the Rani. Among other things, Mr. Farnaby, who is the last of the aristocrats. You should see his country place. Like the Arabian Nights. One claps one's hands, and instantly there are six servants ready to do one's bidding. One has a birthday, and there is a fate nocturne in the gardens. Music, refreshments, dancing girls, two hundred retainers carrying torches. The life of Harun al Rashid, but with modern plumbing. It sounds quite delightful, said Will, remembering the villages through which he had passed in Colonel Deeper's white Mercedes their wattled huts, the garbage, the children with ophthalmia, the skeleton dogs, the women bent double under enormous loads. And such taste, the Rani went on, such a well-stored mind and, through it all, she lowered her voice, such a deep and unfailing sense of the divine. Mr. Boo bowed his head, and there was a silence. Merugan, meanwhile, had pushed up a chair. Without so much as a backward glance, Regally confident that someone must always, in the very nature of things, be at hand to guard against mishaps and loss of dignity, the Rani sat down with all the majestic emphasis of her hundred kilograms. I hope you don't feel that my visit is an intrusion, she said to Will. 
He assured her that he didn't, but she continued to apologize. I would have given warning, she said, I would have asked your permission. But my little voice says, no, you must go now. Why? I cannot say. But no doubt we shall find out in due course. She fixed him with her large, bulging eyes and gave him a mysterious smile. And now, first of all, how are you, dear Mr. Farnaby? As you see, ma'am, in very good shape. Truly? The bulging eyes scrutinized his face with an intentness that he found embarrassing. I can see that you're the kind of heroically considerate man who will go on reassuring his friends even on his deathbed. You're very flattering, he said. But as it happens, I am in good shape. Amazingly so, all things considered, miraculously so. Miraculous, said the Rani, was the very word I used when I heard about your escape. It was a miracle. As luck would have it, will quote it again from Irhan, providence was on my side. Mr. Boo started to laugh, but noticing that the Rani had evidently failed to get the point, changed his mind and adroitly turned the sound of merriment into a loud cough. How true! The Rani was saying, and her rich contralto thrillingly vibrated. Providence is always on our side. And when Will raised a questioning eyebrow, I mean, she elaborated, in the eyes of those who truly understand, capital T, capital U. And this is true even when all things seem to conspire against us, meme Dantzler disaster. You understand French, of course, Mr. Farnaby? Will nodded. It often comes to me more easily than my own native tongue, or English or Palinese. After so many years in Switzerland, she explained, first at school. And again, later on, when my poor baby's health was so precarious, she patted Murugan's bare arm, and we had to go and live in the mountains. Which illustrates what I was saying about Providence always being on our side. When they told me that my little boy was on the brink of consumption, I forgot everything I'd ever learned. I was mad with fear and anguish, I was indignant against God for having allowed such a thing to happen. What utter blindness! My baby got well, and those years among the eternal snows were the happiest of our lives, weren't they, darling? The happiest of our lives, the boy agreed, with what almost sounded like complete sincerity. The Rani smiled triumphantly, pouted her full red lips, and with a faint smack parted them again in a long distance kiss. So you see, my dear Farnaby, she went on, you see. It's really self evident. Nothing happens by accident. There's a great plan, and within the great plan innumerable little plans. A little plan for each and every one of us. Quite, said Will politely. Quite. There was a time, the Rani continued, when I knew it only with my intellect. Now I know it with my heart. I really? She paused for an instant to prepare for the utterance of the mystic majuscule, understand. Psychic as hell will remember what Joe Alderhyde had said of her. And surely that lifelong frequenter of seances should know. I take it, ma'am, he said, that you're naturally psychic. From birth, she admitted. But also and above all by training. Training, needless to say, in something else. Something else? In the life of the spirit. As one advances along the path, all the science, all the psychic gifts and miraculous powers, develop spontaneously. Is that so? My mother, Murugan proudly assured him, can do the most fantastic things. Nixagerans pa, cherry. But it's the truth, Murugan insisted. A truth, the ambassador put in, which I can confirm. And I confirm it, he added, smiling at his own expense, with a certain reluctance. As a lifelong skeptic about these things, I don't like to see the impossible happening. But I have an unfortunate weakness for honesty. And when the impossible actually does happen, before my eyes, I'm compelled Malgamoy to bear witness to the fact. Her Highness does do the most fantastic things. Well, if you like to put it that way, said the Rani, beaming with pleasure. But never forget, Boo, never forget. 
miracles are of absolutely no importance. What's important is the other thing, the thing one comes to at the end of the path. After the fourth initiation, Murugan specified. My mother. Darling. The Rani had raised a finger to her lips. These are things one doesn't talk about. I'm sorry, said the boy. There was a long and pregnant silence. The Rani closed her eyes, and Mr. Boo, letting fall his monocle, reverentially followed suit and became the image of Sivanarola in silent prayer. What was going on behind that austere, that almost fleshless mask of recollectedness? Will looked and wondered. May I ask, he said at last, how you first came, ma'am, to find the path? For a second or two the Rani said nothing, merely sat there with her eyes shut, smiling her Buddha smile of mysterious bliss. Providence found it for me, she answered at last. Quite, quite. But there must have been an occasion, a place, a human instrument. I'll tell you. The lids fluttered apart and once again he found himself under the bright unswerving glare of those protuberant eyes of hers. The place had been Lausanne, the time, the first year of her Swiss education. The chosen instrument, Darling Little Mbullers. Darling Little Mbullers was the wife of Darling Old Professor Bullers, and Old Professor Bullers was the man to whose charge, after careful inquiry and much anxious thought, she had been committed by her father the late Sultan of Rendang. The professor was sixty-seven, taught geology and was a Protestant of so austere a sect that, except for drinking a glass of claret with his dinner, saying his prayers only twice a day, and being strictly monogamous, he might almost have been a Muslim. Under such guardianship a princess of Rendang would be intellectually stimulated, while remaining morally and doctrinally intact. But the Sultan had reckoned without the professor's wife. Bullers was only forty, plump, sentimental, bubblingly enthusiastic and, though officially of her husband's Protestant persuasion, a newly converted and intensely ardent theosophist. In a room at the top of the tall house near the place de la Ripon she had her oratory, to which, whenever she could find time, she would secretly retire to do breathing exercises, practice concentration, and raise Kundalini. Strenuous disciplines but the reward was transcendentally great. In the small hours of a hot summer night, while the darling old professor lay rhythmically snoring two floors down, she had become aware of a presence. The master Kutumi was with her. The Rani made an impressive pause. Extraordinary, said Mr. Boo. Extraordinary, Will dutifully echoed. The Rani resumed her narrative. Irrepressibly happy, Mbullas had been unable to keep her secret. She had dropped mysterious hints, had passed from hints to confidences, from confidences to an invitation to the oratory and a course of instruction. In a very short time Kuthumi was bestowing greater favors upon the novice than upon her teacher. And from that day to this, she concluded, the master has helped me to go forward. To go forward, Will asked himself, into what? Kuthumi only knew. But whatever it was that she had gone forward into, he didn't like it. There was an expression on that large florid face which he found peculiarly distasteful, an expression of domineering calm, of serene and unshakable self-esteem. She reminded him in a curious way of Joe Alderhyde. Joe was one of those happy tycoons who feel no qualms, but rejoice without inhibition in their money and in all that their money will buy in the way of influence and power. And here, albeit clothed in white muslin, mystic, wonderful, was another of Joe Alderhyde's breed, a female tycoon who had cornered the market, not in soya bins or copper, but in pure spirituality and the ascended masters, and was now happily rubbing her hands over the exploit. Here's one example of what he's done for me, the Rani went on. Eight years ago, to be exact, on the 23rd of November, 1952, the master came to me in my morning meditation. Came in person, came in glory. A great crusade is to be launched, he said, a world movement to save humanity from self-destruction. And you, my child, are the appointed instrument. Me? A world movement? But that's absurd, I said. I've never made a speech in my whole life. 
I've never written a word for publication. I've never been a leader or an organizer. Nevertheless, he said, and he gave one of these indescribably beautiful smiles of his, nevertheless it is you who will launch this crusade, the worldwide crusade of the spirit. You will be laughed at, you will be called a fool, a crank, a fanatic. The dogs bark, the caravan passes. From tiny, laughable beginnings the crusade of the spirit is destined to become a mighty force. A force for good, a force that will ultimately save the world. And with that he left me. Left me stunned, bewildered, scared out of my wits. But there was nothing for it, I had to obey. I did obey. And what happened? I made speeches, and he gave me eloquence. I accepted the burden of leadership and, because he was walking invisibly at my side, people followed me. I asked for help, and the money came pouring in. So here I am. She threw out her thick hands in a gesture of self-depreciation, she smiled a mystic smile. A poor thing, she seemed to be saying, but not my own, my master's, Kutumis. Here I am, she repeated. Here? Praise God, said Mr. Wu devoutly, you are. After a decent interval Will asked the Rani if she had always kept up the practices so providentially learned in Bullas's oratory. Always, she answered. I could no more do without meditation than I could do without food. Wasn't it rather difficult after you were married? I mean, before you went back to Switzerland. There must have been so many tiresome official duties. Not to mention all the unofficial ones, said the Rani in a tone that implied whole volumes of unfavorable comment upon her late husband's character, Welton Skorung and sexual habits. She opened her mouth to elaborate on the theme, then closed it again and looked at Murugan. Darling, she called Dot Murugan, who was absorbedly polishing the nails of his left hand upon the open palm of his right, looked up with a guilty start. Yes, mother? Ignoring the nails and his evident inattention to what she had been saying, the Rani gave him a seducing smile. Be an angel, she said, and go and fetch the car. My little voice doesn't say anything about walking back to the bungalow. It's only a few hundred yards, she explained to Will. But in this heat, and at my age. Her words called for some kind of flattering rebuttal. But if it was too hot to walk, it was also too hot. Will felt, to put forth the very considerable amount of energy required for a convincing show of bogus sincerity. Fortunately a professional diplomat, a practiced courtier was on hand to make up for the uncouth journalist's deficiencies. Mr. Boo uttered a peal of light-hearted laughter, then apologized for his merriment. But it was really too funny. At my age, he repeated, and laughed again. Merugan is not quite eighteen, and I happen to know how old, how very young, the princess of Rendang was when she married the Raja of Pala. Merugan, meanwhile, had obediently risen and was kissing his mother's hand. Now we can talk more freely, said the Rani when he had left the room. And freely, her face, her tone, her bulging eyes, her whole quivering frame registering the most intense disapproval. She now let fly. De Mortuis. She wouldn't say anything about her husband except that he was a typical Palanese, a true representative of his country. For the sad truth was that Pala's smooth, bright skin concealed the most horrible rottenness. When I think what they tried to do to my baby, two years ago, when I was on my world tour for the Crusade of the Spirit. With a jingling of bracelets, she lifted her hands in horror. It was an agony for me to be parted from him for so long, but the master had sent me on a mission, and my little voice told me that it wouldn't be right for me to take my baby with me. He'd lived abroad for so long. It was high time for him to get to know the country he was to rule. So I decided to leave him here. The Privy Council appointed a committee of guardianship. Two women with growing boys of their own and two men, one of whom, I regret to say more in sorrow than in anger, was Dr. Robert McPhail. Well, to cut a long story short, no sooner was I safely out of the country than those precious guardians, to whom I'd entrusted my baby, my only son, set to work systematically, 
systematically, Mr. Farnaby, to undermine my influence. They tried to destroy the whole edifice of moral and spiritual values which I had so laboriously built up over the years. Somewhat maliciously, for of course he knew what the woman was talking about, Will expressed his astonishment. The whole edifice of moral and spiritual values? And yet nobody could have been kinder than Dr. Robert and the others, no good Samaritans were ever more simply and effectively charitable. I'm not denying their kindness, said the Rani. But after all kindness isn't the only virtue. Of course not, Will agreed, and he listed all the qualities that the Rani seemed most conspicuously to lack. There's also sincerity. Not to mention truthfulness, humility, selflessness. You're forgetting purity, said the Rani severely. Purity is fundamental, purity is the sign qua non. But here in Pala, I gather, they don't think so. They most certainly do not, said the Rani. And she went on to tell him how her poor baby had been deliberately exposed to impurity, even actively encouraged to indulge in it with one of those precocious, promiscuous girls of whom, in Pala, there were only too many. And when they found that he wasn't the sort of boy who would seduce a girl, for she had brought him up to think of woman as essentially holy. They had encouraged the girl to do her best to seduce him. Had she, Will wondered, succeeded? Or had Antinous already been girl proofed by little friends of his own age or, still more effectively, by some older, more experienced and authoritative pederast, some Swiss precursor of Colonel Deeper? But that wasn't the worst. The Rani lowered her voice to a horrified stage whisper. One of the mothers on the Committee of Guardianship, one of the mothers, mind you, advised him to take a course of lessons. What sort of lessons? In what they euphemistically call love. She wrinkled up her nose as though she had smelt raw sewage. Lessons, if you please, and disgust turned into indignation, from some older woman. Heavens! cried the ambassador. Heavens! Will dutifully echoed. Those older women, he could see, were competitors much more dangerous, in the Rani's eyes, than even the most precociously promiscuous of girls. A mature instructress in love would be a rival mother, enjoying the monstrously unfair advantage of being free to go the limits of incest. They teach. The Rani hesitated. They teach special techniques. What sort of techniques? Will inquire. Dot, but she couldn't bring herself to go into the repulsive particulars. And anyhow, it wasn't necessary, for Murugan, bless his heart, had refused to listen to them. Lessons in immorality from someone old enough to be his mother, the very idea of it had made him sick. No wonder. He had been brought up to reverence the ideal of purity. Brahmacharya, if you know what that means. Quite, said Will. And this is another reason why his illness was such a blessing in disguise, such a real godsend. I don't think I could have brought him up that way in Pala. There are too many bad influences here. Forces working against purity, against the family, even against mother love. Will pricked up his ears. Did they even reform mothers? She nodded. You just can't imagine how far things have gone here. But Kuthumi knew what kind of dangers we would have to run in Pala. So what happens? My baby falls ill, and the doctors order us to Switzerland. Out of harm's way. How was it? Will asked, that Kuthumi let you go off on your crusade. Didn't he foresee what would happen to Murugan as soon as your back was turned? He foresaw everything, said the Rani. The temptations, the resistance the massed assault by all the powers of evil and then, at the very last moment, the rescue. For a long time, she explained, Murugan didn't tell me what was happening. But after three months the assaults of the powers of evil were too much for him. He dropped hints, but I was too completely absorbed in my master's business to be able to take them. Finally he wrote me a letter in which it was all spelled out, in detail. I cancelled my last four lectures in Brazil and flew home as fast as the jets would carry me. A week later we were back in Switzerland. Just my baby and I, alone with the master. She closed her eyes, 
and an expression of gloating ecstasy appeared upon her face. Will looked away in distaste. This self canonized world savior, this clutching and devouring mother, had she ever, for a single moment, seen herself as others saw her? Did she have any idea of what she had done, what she was still doing, to her poor silly little son? To the first question the answer was certainly no. About the second one could only speculate. Perhaps she honestly didn't know what she had made of the boy. But perhaps, on the other hand, she did know. Knew and preferred what was happening with the colonel to what might happen if the boy's education were taken in hand by a woman. The woman might supplant her, the colonel, she knew, would not. Merugan told me that he intended to reform these so-called reforms. I can only pray, said the Rani in a tone that reminded Will of his grandfather, the Archdeacon, that he'll be given the strength and wisdom to do it. And what do you think of his other projects? Will asked. Oil? Industries? An army? Economics and politics aren't exactly my strong point. She answered with a little laugh which was meant to remind him that he was talking to someone who had taken the fourth initiation. Ask Mu what he thinks. I have no right to offer an opinion, said the ambassador. I'm an outsider, the representative of a foreign power. Not so very foreign, said the Rani. Not in your eyes, ma'am. And not, as you know very well, in mine. But in the eyes of the Palanese government, yes completely foreign. But that, said Will, doesn't prevent you from having opinions. It only prevents you from having the locally orthodox opinions. And incidentally, he added, I'm not here in my professional capacity. You're not being interviewed, Mr. Ambassador. All this is strictly off the record. Strictly off the record, then, and strictly as myself and not as an official personage. I believe that our young friend is perfectly right. Which implies, of course, that you believe the policy of the Palanese government to be perfectly wrong. Perfectly wrong, said Mr. Wu, and the bony, emphatic mask of Savonarola positively twinkled with his Voltarian smile, perfectly wrong because all too perfectly right. Right? The Rani protested. Right? Perfectly right, he explained because so perfectly designed to make every man, woman, and child on this enchanting island as perfectly free and happy as it's possible to be. But with a false happiness, the Rani cried, a freedom that's only for the lower self. I bow, said the ambassador, duly bowing, to your highness's superior insight. But still, high or low, true or false, happiness is happiness and freedom is most enjoyable. And there can be no doubt that the politics inaugurated by the original reformers and developed over the years have been admirably well adapted to achieving these two goals. But you feel, said Will, that these are undesirable goals? On the contrary, everybody desires them. But unfortunately they're out of context, they've become completely irrelevant to the present situation of the world in general and Pala in particular. Are they more irrelevant now than they were when the reformers first started to work for happiness and freedom? The ambassador nodded. In those days Pala was still completely off the map. The idea of turning it into an oasis of freedom and happiness made sense. So long as it remains out of touch with the rest of the world, an ideal society can be a viable society. Pala was completely viable, I'd say, until about 1905. Then, in less than a single generation, the world completely changed. Movies, cars, airplanes, radio, mass production, mass slaughter, mass communication and, above all, plain mass, more and more people in bigger and bigger slums or suburbs. By 1930 any clear-sighted observer could have seen that, for three quarters of the human race, freedom and happiness were almost out of the question. Today. Thirty years later, they're completely out of the question. And meanwhile the outside world has been closing in on this little island of freedom and happiness. Closing in steadily and inexorably, coming nearer and nearer. What was once a viable ideal is now no longer viable. So Pala will have to be changed, is that your conclusion? Mr. Boo nodded. Radically. 
root and branch, said the Rani with a prophet's sadistic gusto. And for two cogent reasons, Mr. Boo went on. First, because it simply isn't possible for Pala to go on being different from the rest of the world. And, second, because it isn't right that it should be different. Not right for people to be free and happy? Once again the Rani said something inspirational about false happiness and the wrong kind of freedom. Mr. Boo deferentially acknowledged her interruption, then turned back to Will. Not right, he insisted. Flaunting your blessedness in the face of so much misery, it's sheer hubris, it's a deliberate affront to the rest of humanity. It's even a kind of affront to God. God, the Rani murmured voluptuously, God. Then, reopening her eyes, these people in Pala, she added, they don't believe in God. They only believe in hypnotism and pantheism and free love. She emphasized the words with indignant disgust. So now, said Will, you're proposing to make them miserable in the hope that this will restore their faith in God. Well, that's one way of producing a conversion. Maybe it'll work. And maybe the end will justify the means. He shrugged his shoulders. But I do see, he added, that, good or bad, and regardless of what the Palanese may feel about it, this thing is going to happen. One doesn't have to be much of a prophet to foretell that Murugan is going to succeed. He's riding the wave of the future. And the wave of the future is undoubtedly a wave of crude petroleum. Talking of crudity and petroleum, he added, turning to the Rani, I understand that you're acquainted with my old friend, Joe Alderhyde. You know Lord Alderhyde? Well. So that's why my little voice was so insistent. Closing her eyes again, she smiled to herself and slowly nodded her head. Now I understand. Then, in another tone, how is the dear man? She asked. Still characteristically himself, Will assured her. And what a rare self. Lhamosurf Volant, that's what I call him. The man with the kite? Will was puzzled. He does his work down here, she explained, but he holds a string in his hand, and at the other end of the string is a kite, and the kite is forever trying to go higher, higher, higher. Even while he's at work, he feels the constant pull from above feels the spirit tugging insistently at the flesh. Think of it. A man of affairs, a great captain of industry, and yet, for him, the only thing that really matters is the immortality of the soul. Light dawned. The woman had been talking about Joe Alderhyde's addiction to spiritualism. He thought of those weekly seances with Mrs. Harbottle, the automatist, with Mrs. Pyme, whose control was a Kiwa Indian called Borbo, with Miss Chuk and her floating trumpet out of which a squeaky whisper uttered oracular words that were taken down in shorthand by Joe's private secretary, by Australian cement, don't be alarmed by the fall in breakfast foods, unload 40% of your rubber shares and invest the money in IBM and Westinghouse. Did he ever tell you, Will asked about that departed stockbroker who always knew what the market was going to do next week? Sias, said the Rani indulgently. Just Sias. What else can you expect? After all, he's only a beginner. And in this present life business is his karma. He was predestined to do what he's done, what he's doing, what he's going to do. And what he's going to do, she added impressively and paused in a listening pose her finger lifted, her head cocked, what he's going to do, that's what my little voice is saying, includes some great and wonderful things here in Pala. What a spiritual way of saying, this is what I want to happen. Not as I will but as God wills, and by a happy coincidence God's will and mine are always identical. Will chuckled inwardly, but kept the straightest of faces. Does your little voice say anything about Southeast Asia petroleum? He asked. Dot the Rani listened again, then nodded. Distinctly. But Colonel Deeper, I gather, doesn't say anything but standard of California. Incidentally, Will went on, why does Pala have to worry about the Colonel's taste in oil companies? My government, said Mr. Boo sonorously, is thinking in terms of a five-year plan for inter-island economic coordination and cooperation. 
Does inter-island coordination and cooperation mean that standard has to be granted a monopoly? Only if standard's terms were more advantageous than those of its competitors. In other words, said the Rani, only if there's nobody who will pay us more. Before you came, Will told her, I was discussing this subject with Merugan. Southeast Asia Petroleum, I said, will give Pala whatever standard gives Rendang plus a little more. 15% more? Let's say 10. Make it 12 and a half. Will looked at her admiringly. For someone who had taken the fourth initiation she was doing pretty well. Joe Alderhide will scream with agony, he said. But in the end, I feel certain, you'll get your twelve and a half. It would certainly be a most attractive proposition, said Mr. Boo. The only trouble is that the Palanese government won't accept it. The Palanese government, said the Rani, will soon be changing its policy. You think so? I know it, the Rani answered in a tone that made it quite clear that the information had come straight from the master's mouth. When the change of policy comes, would it help, Will asked, if Colonel Deeper were to put in a good word for Southeast Asia Petroleum. Undoubtedly. Will turned to Mr. Boo. And would you be prepared, Mr. Ambassador, to put in a good word with Colonel Deeper? In polysyllables, as though he were addressing a plenary session of some international organization, Mr. Boo hedged diplomatically. On the one hand, yes, but on the other hand, no. From one point of view, white, but from a different angle. Distinctly black dot will listen in polite silence. Behind the mask of Savonarola, behind the aristocratic monocle, behind the ambassadorial verbiage he could see and hear the Levantine broker in quest of his commission, the petty official cadging for a gratuity. And for her enthusiastic sponsorship of Southeast Asia Petroleum, how much had the royal initiate been promised? Something, he was prepared to bet, pretty substantial. Not for herself, of course, no no. For the crusade of the spirit, needless to say, for the greater glory of Kutumi. Mr. Boo had reached the peroration of his speech to the international organization. It must therefore be understood, he was saying, that any positive action on my part must remain contingent upon circumstances as, when, and if these circumstances arise. Do I make myself clear? Perfectly, Will assured him. And now, he went on with deliberately and decent frankness, let me explain my position in this matter. All I'm interested in is money. Two thousand pounds without having to do a hand's turn of work. A year of freedom just for helping Joe Alderhyde to get his hands on Pala. Lord Alderhyde, said the Rani, is remarkably generous. Remarkably, Will agreed, considering how little I can do in this matter. Needless to say, he'd be still more generous to anyone who could be of greater help. There was a long silence. In the distance a minor bird was calling monotonously for attention. Attention to avarice, attention to hypocrisy, attention to vulgar cynicism. There was a knock at the door. Come in, Will called out and, turning to Mr. Boo, let's continue this conversation some other time, he said. Mr. Boo nodded. Come in. Will repeated. Dot dressed in a blue skirt and a short buttonless jacket that left her midriff bare and only sometimes covered a pair of apple round breasts, a girl in her late teens walked briskly into the room. On her smooth brown face, a smile of friendliest greeting was punctuated at either end by dimples. I'm Nurse Apu, she began. Radhu Apu. Then, catching sight of Will's visitors, she broke off. Oh, excuse me. I didn't know. She made a perfunctory nix to the Rani. Mr. Boo, meanwhile, had courteously risen to his feet. Nurse Apu, he cried enthusiastically. My little ministering angel from the Shivaparam hospital. What a delightful surprise. For the girl, it was evident to Will, the surprise was far from delightful. How do you do, Mr. Boo, she said without a smile and, quickly turning away started to busy herself with the straps of the canvas bag she was carrying. Your Highness has probably forgotten, said Mr. Boo, but I had to have an operation last summer. For hernia, he specified. Well, this young lady used to come and wash me every morning. Punctually at 8.45. And now, 
after having vanished for all these months, here she is again. Synchronicity, said the Rani oracularly. It's all part of the plan. I'm supposed to give Mr. Farnaby an injection, said the little nurse, looking up, still unsmiling, from her professional bag. Doctor's orders are doctor's orders, cried the Rani, overacting the role of royal personage deigning to be playfully gracious. To hear is to obey. But where's my chauffeur? Your chauffeur's here, called a familiar voice. Beautiful as a vision of Ganymede, Murugan was standing in the doorway. A look of amusement appeared on the little nurse's face. Hello, Murugan, I mean, your highness. She bobbed another curtsy, which he was free to take as a mark of respect or of ironic mockery. Oh, hello, Radha, said the boy in a tone that was meant to be distantly casual. He walked past her to where his mother was sitting. The car, he said, is at the door. Or rather the so-called car. With a sarcastic laugh, it's a baby Austin, 1954 vintage, he explained to Will. The best that this highly civilized country can provide for its royal family. Rendon gives its ambassador a Bentley, he added bitterly. Which will be calling for me at this address in about ten minutes, said Mr. Boo, looking at his watch. So may I be permitted to take leave of you here, your highness? The Rani extended her hand. With all the piety of a good Catholic kissing a cardinal's ring. He bent over it, then, straightening himself up, he turned to Will. I'm assuming, perhaps unjustifiably, that Mr. Farnaby can put up with me for a little longer. May I stay? Will assured the ambassador that he would be delighted. And I hope, said Mr. Boo to the little nurse, that there will be no objections on medical grounds? Not on medical grounds said the girl in a tone that implied the existence of the most cogent non-medical objections. Assisted by Murugan, the Rani hoisted herself out of her chair. Au revoir, mon cher Farnaby, she said as she gave him her jeweled hand. Her smile was charged with a sweetness that will found positively menacing. Goodbye, ma'am. She turned, patted the little nurse's cheek, and sailed out of the room. Like a pinnace in the wake of a full-rigged ship of the line, Murugan trailed after her. Six golly. The little nurse exploded, when the door was safely closed behind them. I entirely agree with you, said Will. The Voltarian light twinkled for a moment on Mr. Boo's evangelical face. Golly, he repeated. It was what I heard an English schoolboy saying when he first saw the Great Pyramid. The Rani makes the same kind of impression monumental. She's what the Germans call ein gross seal. The twinkle had faded, the face was unequivocally Savonarola's, the words, it was obvious, were for publication. The little nurse suddenly started to laugh. What's so funny? Will asked. I suddenly saw the great pyramid all dressed up in white muslin, she gasped. Dr. Robert calls it the mystic's uniform. Witty, very witty said Mr. Boo. And yet, he added diplomatically, I don't know why mystics shouldn't wear uniforms, if they feel like it. The little nurse drew a deep breath, wiped the tears of merriment from her eyes, and began to make her preparations for giving the patient his injection. I know exactly what you're thinking, she said to Will. You're thinking I'm much too young to do a good job. I certainly think you're very young. You people go to a university at 18 and stay there for four years. We start at 16 and go on with our education till we're 24, half-time study and half-time work. I've been doing biology and at the same time doing this job for two years. So I'm not quite such a fool as I look. Actually I'm a pretty good nurse. A statement, said Mr. Boo, which I can unequivocally confirm. Miss Radu is not merely a good nurse, she's an absolutely first-rate one. But what he really meant, Will felt sure as he studied the expression on that face of a much-tempted monk, was that Miss Radu had a first-rate midriff, first-rate navel, and first-rate breasts. But the owner of the navel, midriff and breasts had clearly resented Savonarola's admiration, or at any rate the way it had been expressed. Hopefully, over-hopefully, 
the rebuffed ambassador was returning the attack. The spirit lamp was lighted and, while the needle was being boiled, little nurse Apu took her patient's temperature. 99.2. Does that mean I have to be banished? Mr. Boo inquired. Not so far as he's concerned, the girl answered. So please stay, said Will. The little nurse gave him his injection of antibiotic, then, from one of the bottles in her bag, stirred a tablespoonful of some greenish liquid into half a glass of water. Drink this. It tasted like one of those herbal concoctions that health food enthusiasts substitute for tea. What is it? Will asked, and was told that it was an extract from a mountain plant related to valerian. It helps people to stop worrying, the little nurse explained, without making them sleepy. We give it to convalescents. It's useful, too, in mental cases. Which am I? Mental or convalescent? Both, she answered without hesitation. Twill laughed aloud. That's what comes of fishing for compliments. I didn't mean to be rude, she assured him. All I meant was that I've never met anybody from the outside who wasn't a mental case. Including the ambassador? She turned the question back upon the questioner. What do you think? Will passed it on to Mr. Boo. You're the expert in this field, he said. Settle it between yourselves, said the little nurse. I've got to go and see about my patient's lunch. Mr. Boo watched her go, then, raising his left eyebrow, he let fall his monocle and started methodically to polish the lens with his handkerchief. You're aberrated in one way, he said to Will. I'm aberrated in another. A schizoid, isn't that what you are? And, from the other side of the world, a paranoid. Both of us victims of the same 20th century plague. Not the black death, this time, the grey life. Were you ever interested in power? He asked after a moment of silence. Never. Will shook his head emphatically. One can't have power without committing oneself. And for you the horror of being committed outweighs the pleasure of pushing other people around? By a factor of several thousand times. So it was never a temptation? Never. Then after a pause, let's get down to business, Will added in another tone. To business, Mr. Boo repeated. Tell me something about Lord Aldehyde. Well, as the Rani said, he's remarkably generous. I'm not interested in his virtues, only his intelligence. How bright is he? Bright enough to know that nobody does anything for nothing. Good, said Mr. Boo. Then tell him from me that for effective work by experts in strategic positions he must be prepared to lay out at least ten times what he's going to pay you. I'll write him a letter to that effect. And do it today, Mr. Boo advised. The plane leaves Shivaparim tomorrow evening, and there won't be another outgoing mail for a whole week. Thank you for telling me, said Will. And now, Her Highness and the shockable stripling being gone, let's move on to the next temptation. What about sex? With the gesture of a man who tries to rid himself of a cloud of importunate insects. Mr. Boo waved a brown and bony hand back and forth in front of his face. Just a distraction, that's all. Just a nagging, humiliating vexation. But an intelligent man can always cope with it. How difficult it is, said Will, to understand another man's vices. You're right. Everybody should stick to the insanity that God has seen fit to curse him with. Pecca fortita, that was Luther's advice. But make a point of sinning your own sins, not someone else's. And above all don't do what the people of this island do. Don't try to behave as though you were essentially sane and naturally good. We're all demented sinners in the same cosmic boat, and the boat is perpetually sinking. In spite of which, no rat is justified in leaving it. Is that what you're saying? A few of them may sometimes try to leave. But they never get very far. History and the other rats will always see to it that they drown with the rest of us. That's why Pala doesn't have the ghost of a chance. Carrying a tray, the little nurse re entered the room. Buddhist food, she said, as she tied a napkin round Will's neck. All except the fish. But we've decided that fishes are vegetables within the meaning of the act. Will started to eat. 
apart from the Rani and Murugan and us two here, he asked after swallowing the first mouthful, how many people from the outside have you ever met? Well, there was that group of American doctors, she answered. They came to Shivapuram last year, while I was working at the central hospital. What were they doing here? They wanted to find out why we have such a low rate of neurosis and cardiovascular trouble. Those doctors. She shook her head. I tell you, Mr. Farnaby, they really made my hair stand on end, made everybody's hair stand on end in the whole hospital. So you think our medicine's pretty primitive? That's the wrong word. It isn't primitive. It's 50% terrific and 50% non-existent. Marvelous antibiotics, but absolutely no methods for increasing resistance, so that antibiotics won't be necessary. Fantastic operations, but when it comes to teaching people the way of going through life without having to be chopped up, absolutely nothing. And it's the same all along the line. Alpha plus for patching you up when you've started to fall apart, but delta minus for keeping you healthy. Apart from sewerage systems and synthetic vitamins, you don't seem to do anything at all about prevention. And yet you've got a proverb, prevention is better than cure. But cure, said Will, is so much more dramatic than prevention. And for the doctors it's also a lot more profitable. Maybe for your doctors, said the little nurse. Not for ours. Ours get paid for keeping people well. How is it to be done? We've been asking that question for a hundred years, and we've found a lot of answers. Chemical answers, psychological answers, answers in terms of what you eat, how you make love, what you see and hear, how you feel about being who you are in this kind of world. And which are the best answers? None of them is best without the others. So there's no panacea. How can there be? And she quoted the little rhyme that every student nurse had to learn by heart on the first day of her training. I am a crowd, obeying as many laws as it has members. Chemically impure are all my beings. There's no single cure for what can never have a single cause. So whether it's prevention or whether it's cure, we attack on all the fronts at once. All the fronts, she insisted, from diet to water suggestion, from negative ions to meditation. Very sensible, was Will's comment. Perhaps a little too sensible, said Mr. Boo. Did you ever try to talk sense to a maniac? Will shook his head. I did once. He lifted the graying lock that slanted obliquely across his forehead. Just below the hairline a jagged scar stood out strangely pale against the brown skin. Luckily for me, the bottle he hit me with was pretty flimsy. Smoothing his ruffled hair, he turned to the little nurse. Don't ever forget, Miss Radda, to the senseless nothing is more maddening than sense. Pala is a small island completely surrounded by 2900 million mental cases. So beware of being too rational. In the country of the insane, the integrated man doesn't become king. Mr. Boo's face was positively twinkling with Voltarian glee. He gets lynched. Will laughed perfunctorily, then turned again to the little nurse. Don't you have any candidates for the asylum? He asked. Just as many as you have, I mean in proportion to the population. At least that's what the textbook says. So living in a sensible world doesn't seem to make any difference. Not to the people with the kind of body chemistry that'll turn them into psychotics. They're born vulnerable. Little troubles that other people hardly notice can bring them down. We're just beginning to find out what it is that makes them so vulnerable. We're beginning to be able to spot them in advance of a breakdown. And once they've been spotted, we can do something to raise their resistance. Prevention again, and, of course, on all the fronts at once. So being born into a sensible world will make a difference even for the predestined psychotic. And for the neurotics it has already made a difference. Your neurosis rate is about 1 in 5 or even 4. Ours is about 1 in 20. The one that breaks down gets treatment, on all fronts, and the 19 who don't break down have had prevention on all the fronts. Which brings me back to those American doctors. 
Three of them were psychiatrists, and one of the psychiatrists smoked cigars without stopping and had a German accent. He was the one that was chosen to give us a lecture. What a lecture! The little nurse held her head between her hands. I never heard anything like it. What was it about? About the way they treat people with neurotic symptoms. We just couldn't believe our ears. They never attack on all the fronts. They only attack on about half of one front. So far as they're concerned, the physical fronts don't exist. Except for a mouth and an anus. Their patient doesn't have a body. He isn't an organism. He wasn't born with a constitution or a temperament. All he has is the two ends of a digestive tube, a family and a psyche. But what sort of psyche? Obviously not the whole mind, not the mind as it really is. How could it be that when they take no account of a person's anatomy, or biochemistry or physiology, mind abstracted from body, that's the only front they attack on. And not even on the whole of that front. The man with the cigar kept talking about the unconscious. But the only unconscious they ever pay attention to is the negative unconscious, the garbage that people have tried to get rid of by burying it in the basement. Not a single word about the positive unconscious. No attempt to help the patient to open himself up to the life force or the Buddha nature. And no attempt even to teach him to be a little more conscious in his everyday life. You know, here and now, boys. Attention. She gave an imitation of the minor birds. These people just leave the unfortunate neurotic to wallow in his old bad habits of never being all there in present time. The whole thing is just pure idiocy. No, the man with the cigar didn't even have that excuse, he was as clever as clever can be. So it's not idiocy. It must be something voluntary, something self induced like getting drunk or talking yourself into believing some piece of foolishness because it happens to be in the scriptures. And then look at their idea of what's normal. Believe it or not, a normal human being is one who can have an orgasm and is adjusted to his society. Once again the little nurse held her head between her hands. It's unimaginable. No question about what you do with your orgasms. No question about the quality of your feelings and thoughts and perceptions. And then what about the society you're supposed to be adjusted to? Is it a mad society or a sane one? And even if it's pretty sane, is it right that anybody should be completely adjusted to it? With another of his twinkling smiles, those whom God would destroy, said the ambassador, he first makes mad. Or alternatively, and perhaps even more effectively, he first makes them sane. Mr. Boo rose and walked to the window. My car has come for me. I must be getting back to Shivaparam and my desk. He turned to Will and treated him to a long and flowery farewell. Then, switching off the ambassador, don't forget to write that letter, he said. It's very important. He smiled conspiratorially and, passing his thumb back and forth across the first two fingers of his right hand, he counted out invisible money. Thank goodness, said the little nurse when he had gone. What was his offense? Will inquired. The usual thing? Offering money to someone you want to go to bed with, but she doesn't like you. So you offer more. Is that usual where he comes from? Profoundly usual, Will assured her. Well, I didn't like it. So I could see. And here's another question. What about Merugan? What makes you ask? Curiosity. I noticed that you'd met before. Was that when he was here two years ago without his mother? How did you know about that? A little bird told me, or rather an extremely massive bird. The Rani. She must have made it sound like Sodom and Gomorrah. But unfortunately I was spared the lurid details. Dark hints, that was all she gave me. Hints. For example, about veteran Messalina's giving lessons in love to innocent young boys. And did he need those lessons? Hints, too, about a precocious and promiscuous girl of his own age. Nurse Apu burst out laughing. Did you know her? The precocious and promiscuous girl was me. You? Does the Rani know it? Merugan only gave her the facts, not the names. 
for which I'm very grateful. You see, I'd behaved pretty badly. Losing my head about someone I didn't really love and hurting someone I did. Why is one so stupid? The heart has its reasons, said Will, and the endocrines have theirs. There was a long silence. He finished the last of his cold boiled fish and vegetables. Nurse Apu handed him a plate of fruit salad. You've never seen Murugan in white satin pajamas, she said. Have I missed something? You've no idea how beautiful he looks in white satin pajamas. Nobody has any right to be so beautiful. It's indecent. It's taking an unfair advantage. It was the sight of him in those white satin pajamas from Sulka that had finally made her lose her head. Lose it so completely that for two months she had been someone else, an idiot who had gone chasing after a person who couldn't bear her and had turned her back on the person who had always loved her, the person she herself had always loved. Did you get anywhere with the pajama boy? Will asked. As far as a bed, she answered. But when I started to kiss him, he jumped out from between the sheets and locked himself in the bathroom. He wouldn't come out until I'd passed his pajamas through the transom and given him my word of honor that he wouldn't be molested. I can laugh about it now, but at the time, I tell you, at the time. She shook her head. Pure tragedy. They must have guessed, from the way I carried on, what had happened. Precocious and promiscuous girls, it was obvious, were no good. What he needed was regular lessons. And the rest of the story I know, said Will. Boy writes to mother, mother flies home and whisks him off to Switzerland. And they didn't come back until about six months ago. And for at least half of the time they were in Rendang, staying with Murugan's aunt. Will was on the point of mentioning Colonel Deeper then remembered that he had promised Murugan to be discreet and said nothing. From the garden came the sound of a whistle. Excuse me, said the little nurse and went to the window. Smiling happily at what she saw, she waved her hand. It's Ranga. Who's Ranga? That friend of mine I was talking about. He wants to ask you some questions. May he come in for a minute? Of course. She turned back to the window and made a beckoning gesture. This means, I take it, that the white satin pajamas are completely out of the picture. She nodded. It was only a one-act tragedy. I found my head almost as quickly as I'd lost it. And when I'd found it, there was Ranga, the same as ever, waiting for me. The door swung open and a lanky young man in gym shoes and khaki shorts came into the room. Ranga Karakuran, he announced as he shook Will's hand. If you'd come five minutes earlier, said Radha, you'd have had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Boo. Was he here? Ranga made a grimace of disgust. Is he as bad as all that? Will asked. Ranga listed the indictments. A. He hates us. B. He's Colonel Deeper's tame jackal. C. He's the unofficial ambassador of all the oil companies. D. The old pig made passes at Radha. And E. He goes about giving lectures about the need for a religious revival. He's even published a book about it. Complete with preface by someone at the Harvard Divinity School. It's all part of the campaign against Palinese independence. God is deep as alibi. Why can't criminals be frank about what they're up to? All this disgusting idealistic hogwash, it makes one vomit. Radha stretched out her hand and gave his ear three sharp tweaks. You little. He began angrily, then broke off and laughed. You're quite right, he said. All the same, you didn't have to pull quite so hard. Is that what you always do when he gets worked up? Will inquired of Radha. Whenever he gets worked up at the wrong moment, or over things he can't do anything about. Will turned to the boy. And do you ever have to tweak her ear? Ranga laughed. I find it more satisfactory, he said to smack her bottom. Unfortunately, she rarely needs it. Does that mean she's better balanced than you are? Better balanced? I tell you, she's abnormally sane. Whereas you're merely normal? Maybe a little left of center. He shook his head. I get horribly depressed sometimes, feel I'm no good for anything. Whereas in fact, said Radha, 
He's so good that they've given him a scholarship to study biochemistry at the University of Manchester. What do you do with him when he plays these despairing, miserable sinner tricks on you? Pull his ears. That, she said, and dot, well, other things. She looked at Ranga and Ranga looked at her. Then they both burst out laughing. Quite, said Will. Quite. And these other things being what they are, he went on, is Ranga looking forward to the prospect of leaving Pala for a couple of years? Not much, Ranga admitted. But he has to go, said Radha firmly. And when he gets there, Will wondered, is he going to be happy? That's what I wanted to ask you, said Ranga. Well, you won't like the climate, you won't like the food, you won't like the noises or the smells or the architecture. But you'll almost certainly like the work and you'll probably find that you can like quite a lot of the people. What about the girls? Radha inquired. How do you want me to answer that question? He asked. Consolingly or truthfully? Truthfully. Well, my dear, the truth is that Ranga will be a wild success. Dozens of girls are going to find him irresistible. And some of those girls will be charming. How will you feel if he can't resist? I'll be glad for his sake. Will turned to Ranga. And will you be glad if she consoles herself, while you're away, with another boy? I'd like to be, he said. But whether I actually shall be glad, that's another question. Will you make her promise to be faithful? I won't make her promise anything. Even though she's your girl. She's her own girl. And Ranga's his own boy said the little nurse. He's free to do what he likes. Will thought of Babs's strawberry pink alcove and laughed ferociously. And free above all, he said, to do what he doesn't like. He looked from one young face to the other and saw that he was being eyed with a certain astonishment. In another tone and with a different kind of smile, but I'd forgotten, he added. One of you is abnormally sane and the other is only a little left of center. So how can you be expected to understand what this mental case from the outside is talking about? And without leaving them time to answer his question, tell me, he asked, how long is it? He broke off. But perhaps I'm being indiscreet. If so, just tell me to mind my own business. But I would like to know, just as a matter of anthropological interest, how long you two have been friends. Do you mean friends? asked the little nurse. Or do you mean lovers? Why not both, while we're about it? Well, Ranga and I have been friends since we were babies. And we've been lovers, except for that miserable white pajama episode, since I was fifteen and a half and he was seventeen, just about two and a half years. And nobody objected. Why should they? Why, indeed, Will echoed. But the fact remains that, in my part of the world, practically everybody would have objected. What about other boys? Rango asked. In theory they are even more out of bounds than girls. In practice. Well, you can guess what happens when five or six hundred male adolescents are cooped up together in a boarding school. Does that sort of thing ever go on here? Of course. I'm surprised. Surprised? Why? Seeing that girls aren't out of bounds. But one kind of love doesn't exclude the other. And both are legitimate. Naturally. So that nobody would have minded if Murugan had been interested in another pajama boy. Not if it was a good sort of relationship. But unfortunately, said Radha, the Rani had done such a thorough job that he couldn't be interested in anyone but her, and, of course, himself. No boys? Maybe now. I don't know. All I know is that in my day there was nobody in his universe. No boys and, still more emphatically, no girls. Only mother and masturbation and the ascended masters. Only jazz records and sports cars and Hitlerian ideas about being a great leader and turning Pala into what he calls a modern state. Three weeks ago, said Ranga, he and the Rani were at the palace, in Shivapuram. They invited a group of us from the university to come and listen to Murugan's ideas, on oil, on industrialization, on television, on armaments, on the crusade of the spirit. 
Did he make any converts? Ranga shook his head. Why would anyone want to exchange something rich and good and endlessly interesting for something bad and thin and boring? We don't feel any need for your speedboats or your television, your wars and revolutions, your revivals, your political slogans, your metaphysical nonsense from Roman Moscow. Did you ever hear of Mthuna? He asked. Mthuna? What's that? Let's start with the historical background, Rangu answered, and with the engaging pedantry of an undergraduate delivering a lecture about matters which he himself has only lately heard of, he launched forth. Buddhism came to Palo about 1200 years ago, and it came not from Ceylon, which is what one would have expected, but from Bengal, and through Bengal, later on, from Tibet. Result, we're Mahayanists and our Buddhism is shot through and through with Tantra. Do you know what Tantra is? Will had to admit that he had only the haziest notion. And to tell you the truth, said Ranga, with a laugh that broke irrepressibly through the crust of his pedantry, I don't really know much more than you do. Tantra's an enormous subject and most of it, I guess, is just silliness and superstition, not worth bothering about. But there's a hard core of sense. If you're a tantric, you don't renounce the world or deny its value, you don't try to escape into a nirvana apart from life, as the monks of the southern school do. No, you accept the world, and you make use of it, you make use of everything you do, of everything that happens to you, of all the things you see and hear and taste and touch, as so many means to your liberation from the prison of yourself. Good talk said Will in a tone of polite skepticism. And something more besides, Rangu insisted. That's the difference, he added, and youthful pedantry modulated into the eagerness of youthful proselytism, that's the difference between your philosophy and ours. Western philosophers, even the best of them, they're nothing more than good talkers. Eastern philosophers are often rather bad talkers, but that doesn't matter. Talk isn't the point. Their philosophy is pragmatic and operational. Like the philosophy of modern physics, except that the operations in question are psychological and the results transcendental. Your metaphysicians make statements about the nature of man and the universe, but they don't offer the reader any way of testing the truth of those statements. When we make statements, we follow them up with a list of operations that can be used for testing the validity of what we've been saying. For example, Tattvamasa, thou art that, the heart of all our philosophy. Tattvamasa, he repeated. It looks like a proposition in metaphysics, but what it actually refers to is a psychological experience, and the operations by means of which the experience can be lived through are described by our philosophers, so that anyone who's willing to perform the necessary operations can test the validity of Tattvamasa for himself. The operations are called yoga, or dhyana, or zen, or, in certain special circumstances, mdhuna. Which brings us back to my original question. What is mdhuna? Maybe you'd better ask Radha. We'll turn to the little nurse. What is it? Mdhuna, she answered gravely, is the yoga of love. Sacred or profane? There's no difference. That's the whole point, Ranga put in. When you do mdhuna, Profane love is sacred love. Buddha Vnyoshidion isn't written, the girl quoted. None of your Sanskrit. What does it mean? How would you translate Buddha Vn, Ranga? Buddhaness, Buddhati, the quality of being enlightened. Radha nodded and turned back to Will. It means that Buddhaness is in the Yoni. In the Yoni? Will remember those little stone emblems of the eternal feminine that he had bought as presents for the girls at the office, from a hunchbacked vendor of body usuries at Ben Ayres. Eight annas for a black yoni, twelve for the still more sacred image of the yoni lingam. Literally in the yoni? he asked. Or metaphorically? What a ridiculous question! said the little nurse, and she laughed her clear unaffected laugh of pure amusement. Do you think we make love metaphorically? But at Vnyoshidion isn't written. She repeated. It couldn't be more completely and absolutely literal. Did you ever hear of the Anida community? Ranga now asked. Will nodded. 
he had known an American historian who specialized in 19th century communities. But why do you know about it? he asked. Because it's mentioned in all our textbooks of applied philosophy. Basically, Mthunu is the same as what the Anida people called male continence. And that was the same as what Roman Catholics mean by coitus reservatus. Reservatus, the little nurse repeated. It always makes me want to laugh. Such a reserved young man. The dimples reappeared and there was a flash of white teeth. Don't be silly, said Ranga severely. This is serious. She expressed her contrition. But Reservatus was really too funny. In a word, Will concluded, it's just birth control without contraceptives. But that's only the beginning of the story, said Ranga. Mthunu is also something else. Something even more important. The undergraduate pedant had reasserted himself. Remember, he went on earnestly, remember the point that Freud was always harping on. Which point? There were so many. The point about the sexuality of children. What we are born with, what we experience all through infancy and childhood, is a sexuality that isn't concentrated on the genitals, it's a sexuality diffused throughout the whole organism. That's the paradise we inherit. But the paradise gets lost as the child grows up. Mthuna is the organized attempt to regain that paradise. He turned to Radha. You've got a good memory, he said. What's that phrase of Spinoza's that they quote in the Applied Philosophy book? Make the body capable of doing many things, she recited. This will help you to perfect the mind and so to come to the intellectual love of God. Hence all the yogas, said Ranga. Including Mthuna. And it's a real yoga, the girl insisted. As good as Raja Yoga, or Karma Yoga, or Bhakti Yoga. In fact, a great deal better, so far as most people are concerned. Mthuna really gets them there. What's there? Will asked. There is where you know. Know what? Know who in fact you are, and believe it or not, she added, Tatvamasa, thou art that, and so am I, that is me. The dimples came to life, the teeth flashed. And that's also him. She pointed at Ranga. Incredible, isn't it? She stuck out her tongue at him. And yet it's a fact. Ranga smiled, reached out and with an extended forefinger touched the tip of her nose. And not merely a fact, he said. A revealed truth. He gave the nose a little tap. A revealed truth, he repeated. So mind your P's and Q's, young woman. What I'm wondering, said Will, is why we aren't all enlightened, I mean. If it's just a question of making love with a rather special kind of technique. What's the answer to that? I'll tell you, Ranga began. Dot, but the girl cut him short. Listen, she said, listen. Will listened. Faint and far off, but still distinct, he heard the strange inhuman voice that had first welcomed him to Pala. Attention, it was saying. Attention, attention. That bloody bird again. But that's the secret. Attention? But a moment ago you were saying it was something else. What about that young man who's so reserved? That's just to make it easier to pay attention. And it does make it easier, Ranga confirmed. And that's the whole point of Mthuna. It's not the special technique that turns lovemaking into yoga, it's the kind of awareness that the technique makes possible. Awareness of one's sensations and awareness of the not sensation in every sensation. What's a not sensation? It's the raw material for sensation that my not self provides me with. And you can pay attention to your not self? Of course. Will turned to the little nurse. You too? To myself, she answered, and at the same time to my not self. And to Ranga's not self, and to Ranga's self and to Ranga's body, and to my body and everything it's feeling. And to all the love and the friendship. And to the mystery of the other person, the perfect stranger, who's the other half of your own self, and the same as your not self. And all the while one's paying attention to all the things that, if one were sentimental, or worse, if one were spiritual like the poor old Rani, one would find so unromantic and gross and sordid even. But they aren't sordid, 
because one's also paying attention to the fact that, when one's fully aware of them, those things are just as beautiful as all the rest, just as wonderful. Mthunu is Diana, Ranga concluded. A new word, he evidently felt, would explain everything. But what is Diana? Will asked. Diana is contemplation. Contemplation. Will thought of that strawberry pink alcove above the Charing Cross Road. Contemplation was hardly the word he would have chosen. And yet even there, on second thoughts, even there he had found a kind of deliverance. Those alienations in the changing light of Porter's gin were alienations from his odious daytime self. They were also, unfortunately, alienations from all the rest of his being, alienations from love, from intelligence, from common decency, from all consciousness but that of an excruciating frenzy by corpse light or in the rosy glow of the cheapest, vulgarest illusion. He looked again at Radha's shining face. What happiness! What a manifest conviction, not of the sin that Mr. Boo was so determined to make the world safe for, but of its serene and blissful opposite. It was profoundly touching. But he refused to be touched. To lie me Tangier, it was a categorical imperative. Shifting the focus of his mind, he managed to see the whole thing as reassuringly ludicrous. What shall we do to be saved? The answer is in four letters. Smiling at his own little joke, were you taught Mthunu at school? He asked ironically. At school, Radha answered with a simple matter of factness that took all the ray blaze and wind out of his sails. Everybody's taught it, Ranga added. And when does the teaching begin? About the same time as trigonometry and advanced biology. That's between fifteen and fifteen and a half. And after they've learned Mthuna, after they've gone out into the world and got married, that is, if you ever do get married. Oh, we do, we do, Radha assured him. Do they still practice it? Not all of them, of course. But a good many do. All the time. Except when they want to have a baby. And those who don't want to have babies but who might like to have a little change from the Huna, what do they do? Contraceptives, said Ranga laconically. And are the contraceptives available? Available. They're distributed by the government. Free, gratis, and for nothing, except of course that they have to be paid for out of taxes. The postman, Radu added, delivers a 30-night supply at the beginning of each month. And the babies don't arrive? Only those we want. Nobody has more than three, and most people stop at two. With the result, said Ranga, reverting, with the statistics, to his pedantic manner, that our population is increasing at less than a third of one percent per annum. Whereas Rendang's increase is as big as Ceylon's, almost three percent. And China's is two percent, and India's about one point seven. I was in China only a month ago, said Will terrifying. And last year one spent four weeks in India. And before India in Central America, which is outbreeding even Rendang and Ceylon. Has either of you been in Rendang Lobo? Ranga nodded affirmatively. Three days in Rendang, he explained. If you get into the upper sixth, it's part of the advanced sociology course. They let you see for yourself what the outside is like. And what did you think of the outside? Will inquire. Rangu answered with another question. When you were in Rendang Lobo, did they show you the slums? On the contrary. They did their best to prevent me from seeing the slums. But I gave them the slip. Gave them the slip, he was vividly remembering, on his way back to the hotel from that grisly cocktail party at the Rendang Foreign Office. Everybody who was anybody was there. All the local dignitaries and their wives, uniforms and medals, Dior and emeralds. All the important foreigners, diplomats galore, British and American oil men, six members of the Japanese trade mission, a lady pharmacologist from Leningrad, two Polish engineers, a German tourist who just happened to be a cousin of Krupp von Bolan, an enigmatic Armenian representing a very important financial consortium in Tangier, and, 
beaming with triumph, the 14 Czech technicians who had come with last month's shipment of tanks and cannon and machine guns from Skoda. And these are the people, he had said to himself as he walked down the marble steps of the Foreign Office into Liberty Square, these are the people who rule the world. 2900 millions of us at the mercy of a few scores of politicians, a few thousands of tycoons and generals and money lenders. Ye are the cyanide of the earth, and the cyanide will never, never lose its savor. After the glare of the cocktail party, after the laughter and the luscious smells of canapes and Chanel sprayed women, those alleys behind the brand new palace of justice had seemed doubly dark and noisome. Those poor wretches camping out under the palm trees of Independence Avenue more totally abandoned by God and man than even the homeless, helpless thousands he had seen sleeping like corpses in the streets of Calcutta. And now he thought of that little boy, that tiny pot-bellied skeleton, whom he had picked up, bruised and shaken by a fall from the back of the little girl, scarcely larger than himself, who was carrying him, had picked up and, led by the other child, had carried back, carried down, to the windowless cellar that, for nine of them, he had counted the dark ring wormy heads, was home. Keeping babies alive, he said, healing the sick, preventing the sewage from getting into the water supply, one starts with doing things that are obviously and intrinsically good. And how does one end? One ends by increasing the sum of human misery and jeopardizing civilization. It's the kind of cosmic practical joke that God seems really to enjoy. He gave the young people one of his flayed, ferocious grins. God has nothing to do with it, Ranga retorted, and the joke isn't cosmic, it's strictly man-made. These things aren't like gravity or the second law of thermodynamics, they don't have to happen. They happen only if people are stupid enough to allow them to happen. Here in Pala we haven't allowed them to happen so the joke hasn't been played on us. We've had good sanitation for the best part of a century, and still we're not overcrowded, we're not miserable, we're not under a dictatorship. And the reason is very simple, we chose to behave in a sensible and realistic way. How on earth were you able to choose? Will asked. The right people were intelligent at the right moment, said Ranga. But it must be admitted, they were also very lucky. In fact Palo as a whole has been extraordinarily lucky. It said the luck, first of all, never to have been anyone's colony. Rendang has a magnificent harbor. That brought them an Arab invasion in the Middle Ages. We have no harbor, so the Arabs left us alone and we're still Buddhists or Shivts, that is, when we're not tantric agnostics. Is that what you are? Will inquired. A tantric agnostic? With Mahayana trimmings. Ranga qualified. Well, to return to Rendang. After the Arabs it got the Portuguese. We didn't. No harbor, no Portuguese. Therefore no Catholic minority, no blasphemous nonsense about its being God's will that people should breed themselves into subhuman misery, no organized resistance to birth control. And that isn't our only blessing, after a hundred and twenty years of the Portuguese, Ceylon and Rendang got the Dutch. And after the Dutch came the English. We escaped both those infestations. No Dutch, no English, and therefore no planters, no coolie labor, no cash crops for export, no systematic exhaustion of our soil. Also no whiskey, no Calvinism, no syphilis, no foreign administrators. We were left to go our own way and take responsibility for our own affairs you certainly were lucky. And on top of that amazing good luck, Ranga went on, there was the amazing good management of Murug and the reformer and Andrew McPhail. Has Dr. Robert talked to you about his great-grandfather? Just a few words, that's all. Did he tell you about the founding of the experimental station? Will shook his head. The experimental station, said Ranga, had a lot to do with our population policy. It all began with a famine. Before he came to Pala, Dr. Andrew spent a few years in Madras. The second year he was there, the monsoon failed. The crops were burnt up, the tanks and even the wells went dry. Except for the English and the rich, there was no food. People died like flies. 
There's a famous passage in Dr. Andrews' memoirs about the famine. A description and then a comment. He'd had to listen to a lot of sermons when he was a boy, and there was one he kept remembering now, as he worked among the starving Indians. Man cannot live by bread alone, that was the text, and the preacher had been so eloquent that several people were converted. Man cannot live by bread alone. But without bread, he now saw, there is no mind, no spirit, no inner light, no father in heaven. There is only hunger, there is only despair and then apathy and finally death. Another of the cosmic jokes, said Will. And this one was formulated by Jesus himself. To those who have shall be given, and from those who have not shall be taken away even that which they have, the bare possibility of being human. It's the cruelest of all God's jokes, and also the commonest. I've seen it being played on millions of men and women, millions of small children, all over the world. So you can understand why that famine made such an indelible impression on Dr. Andrew's mind. He was resolved, and so was his friend the Raja, that in Pala, at least, there should always be bread. Hence their decision to set up the experimental station. Rothamsted in the tropics was a great success. In a few years we had new strains of rice and maize and millet and breadfruit. We had better breeds of cattle and chickens. Better ways of cultivating and composting, and in the fifties we built the first superphosphate factory east of Berlin. Thanks to all these things people were eating better, living longer, losing fewer children. Ten years after the founding of Rothamsted in the tropics the Raja took a census. The population had been stable, more or less, for a century. Now it had started to rise. In fifty or sixty years, Dr. Andrew foresaw, Pala would be transformed into the kind of festering slum that Rendang is today. What was to be done? Dr. Andrew had read his Malthus. Food production increases arithmetically population increases geometrically. Man has only two choices, he can either leave the matter to nature, who will solve the population problem in the old familiar way, by famine, pestilence and war, or else, Malthus being a clergyman, he can keep down his numbers by moral restraint. Morala restraint, the little nurse repeated, rolling her eyes in the Indonesian parody of a Scottish divine. Moral restraint. Incidentally, she added, Dr. Andrew had just married the Raja's sixteen-year-old niece. And that, said Ranga, was yet another reason for revising Malthus. Famine on this side, restraint on that. Surely there must be some better, happier, humaner way between the Malthusian horns. And of course there was such a way even then, even before the age of rubber and spermicides. There were sponges, there was soap. There were condoms made of every known waterproof material from oiled silk to the blind gut of sheep. The whole armory of paleo birth control. And how did the Raja and his subjects react to paleo birth control? With horror? Not at all. They were good Buddhists, and every good Buddhist knows that begetting is merely postponed assassination. Do your best to get off the wheel of birth and death and for heaven's sake don't go about putting superfluous victims onto the wheel. For a good Buddhist, birth control makes metaphysical sense. And for a village community of rice growers, it makes social and economic sense. There must be enough young people to work the fields and support the aged and the little ones. But not too many of them, for then neither the old nor the workers nor their children will have enough to eat. In the old days, couples had to have six children in order to raise two or three. Then came clean water and the experimental station. Out of six children five now survived. The old patterns of breeding had ceased to make sense. The only objection to paleo birth control was its crudity. But fortunately there was a more aesthetic alternative. The Raja was a tantric initiate and had learned the yoga of love. Dr. Andrew was told about Nthunu and, being a true man of science, agreed to try it. He and his young wife were given the necessary instruction. With what results? Enthusiastic approval. That's the way everybody feels about it, said Radha. Now, now, 
none of your sweeping generalizations. Some feel that way, others don't. Dr. Andrew was one of the enthusiasts. The whole matter was lengthily discussed. In the end they decided that contraceptives should be like education, free, tax supported and, though not compulsory, as nearly as possible universal. For those who felt the need for something more refined, there would be instruction in the yoga of love. Do you mean to tell me that they got away with it? It wasn't really so difficult. Mthune was orthodox. People weren't being asked to do anything against their religion. On the contrary, they were being given a flattering opportunity to join the elect by learning something esoteric. And don't forget the most important point of all, the little nurse chimed in. For women, all women, and I don't care what you say about sweeping generalizations, the yoga of love means perfection, means being transformed and taken out of themselves and completed. There was a brief silence. And now, she resumed in another, brisker tone, it's high time we left you to your siesta. Before you go, said Will, I'd like to write a letter. Just a brief note to my boss to say that I'm alive and in no immediate danger of being eaten by the natives. Rado went foraging in Dr. Robert's study and came back with paper, pencil and an envelope. Veni, Vidi, Will scrawled. I was wrecked. I met the Rani and her collaborator from Randang, who implies that he can deliver the goods in return for Bakshish to the tune, he was specific, of twenty thousand pounds. Shall I negotiate on this basis? If you cable proposed article OK, I shall go ahead. If no hurry for article I shall let the matter drop. Tell my mother I am safe and shall soon be writing. There, he said as he handed the envelope, sealed and addressed, to Ranga. May I ask you to buy me a stamp and get this off in time to catch tomorrow's plane? Without fail, the boy promised. Dot watching them go, Will felt a twinge of conscience. What charming young people! And here he was, plotting with Boo and the forces of history to subvert their world. He comforted himself with the thought that, if he didn't do it, somebody else would. And even if Joe Alderhyde did get his concession, they could still go on making love in the style to which they were accustomed. Or couldn't they? From the door the little nurse turned back for a final word. No reading now, she wagged her finger at him. Go to sleep. I never sleep during the day, Will assured her, with a certain perverse satisfaction. Seven. he could never go to sleep during the day, but when he looked next at his watch, the time was twenty-five past four and he was feeling wonderfully refreshed. He picked up notes on what's what, and resumed his interrupted reading give us this day our daily faith, but deliver us, dear God, from belief. This was as far as he had got this morning, and now here was a new section, the fifth me as I think I am and me as I am in fact, sorrow, in other words, and the ending of sorrow. One third more or less, of all the sorrow that the person I think I am must endure is unavoidable. It is the sorrow inherent in the human condition, the price we must pay for being sentient and self-conscious organisms, aspirants to liberation, but subject to the laws of nature and under orders to keep on marching, through irreversible time, through a world wholly indifferent to our well-being, toward decrepitude and the certainty of death. The remaining two-thirds of all sorrow is homemade and, so far as the universe is concerned, unnecessary. Will turned the page. A sheet of notepaper fluttered onto the bed. He picked it up and glanced at it. Twenty lines of small clear writing and at the bottom of the page the initials SM not a letter evidently, a poem and therefore public property. He read somewhere between brute silence and last Sunday's 1300,000 sermons semicolon somewhere between Calvin on Christ, God help us, and the lizard semicolon somewhere between seeing and speaking, somewhere between our soiled and greasy currency of words and the first star, the great moths fluttering about the ghosts of flowers, lies the clear place where I, no longer I. Nevertheless remember love's nightlong wisdom of the other shore semicolon and, listening to the wind, remember too that other night, that first of widowhood, sleepless, with death beside me in the dark dot mine, mine, all mine, mine inescapably.
but I, no longer I, in this clear place between my thought and silence see all I hadn't lost, anguish and joys, glowing like gentians in the alpine grass, blue, unpossessed and open. Like gentians, Will repeated to himself, and thought of that summer holiday in Switzerland when he was twelve, thought of the meadow, high above Grindelwald, with its unfamiliar flowers, its wonderful un-English butterflies, thought of the dark blue sky and the sunshine and the huge shining mountains on the other side of the valley. And all his father had found to say was that it looked like an advertisement for Nestle's milk chocolate. Not even real chocolate, he had insisted with a grimace of disgust. Milk chocolate. After which there had been an ironic comment on the watercolor his mother was painting, so badly, poor thing, but with such loving and conscientious care. The milk chocolate advertisement that Nestle rejected? And now it was his turn. Instead of just mooning about with your mouth open, like the village idiot, why not do something intelligent for a change? put in some work on your German grammar, for example. And diving into the rucksack, he had pulled out, from among the hard-boiled eggs and the sandwiches, the abhorred little brown book. What a detestable man! And yet, if Suzler was right, one ought to be able to see him now, after all these years, glowing like a gentian, will glanced again at the last line of the poem, blue, unpossessed and open. Well said a familiar voice. He turned toward the door. Talk of the devil, he said. Or rather read what the devil has written. He held up the sheet of notepaper for her inspection. Susla glanced at it. Oh that, she said. If only good intentions were enough to make good poetry. She sighed and shook her head. I was trying to think of my father as a gentian, he went on. But all I get is the persistent image of the most enormous turd. Even turds, she assured him, can be seen as gentians. But only, I take it, in the place you were writing about, the clear place between thought and silence? Susla nodded. How do you get there? You don't get there. The comes to you. Or rather there is really here. You're just like little Radder, he complained. Parroting what the old Raja says at the beginning of this book. If we repeat it, she said. It's because it happens to be true. If we didn't repeat it, we'd be ignoring the facts. Whose facts? He asked. Certainly not mine. Not at the moment, she agreed. But if you were to do the kind of things that the old Raja recommends, they might be yours. Did you have parent trouble? He asked after a little silence. Or could you always see turds as gentians? Not at that age, she answered. Children have to be Manichaean dualists. It's the price we must all pay for learning the rudiments of being human. Seeing turds as gentians, or rather seeing both gentians and turds as gentians with a capital G, that's a postgraduate accomplishment. So what did you do about your parents? Just grin and bear the unbearable? Or did your father and mother happen to be bearable? Bearable separately, she answered especially my father. But quite unbearable together, unbearable because they couldn't bear one another. A bustling, cheerful, outgoing woman married to a man so fastidiously introverted that she got on his nerves all the time, even, I suspect, in bed. She never stopped communicating, and he never started. With the result that he thought she was shallow and insincere, she thought he was heartless contemptuous and without normal human feelings. I'd have expected that you people would know better than to walk into that kind of trap. We do know better, she assured him. Boys and girls are specifically taught what to expect of people whose temperament and physique are very different from their own. Unfortunately, it sometimes happens that the lessons don't seem to have much effect. Not to mention the fact that in some cases the psychological distance between the people involved is really too great to be bridged. Anyhow, the fact remains that my father and mother never managed to make a go of it. They'd fallen in love with one another, goodness knows why. But when they came to close quarters, she found herself being constantly hurt by his inaccessibility, while her uninhibited good fellowship made him fairly cringe with embarrassment and distaste. 
my sympathies were always with my father. Physically and temperamentally I'm very close to him, not in the least like my mother. I remember, even as a tiny child, how I used to shrink away from her exuberance. She was like a permanent invasion of one's privacy. She still is. Do you have to see a lot of her? Very little. She has her own job and her own friends. In our part of the world mother is strictly the name of a function. When the function has been duly fulfilled, the title lapses, the ex-child and the woman who used to be called mother establish a new kind of relationship. If they get on well together, they continue to see a lot of one another. If they don't, they drift apart. Nobody expects them to cling, and clinging isn't equated with loving, isn't regarded as anything particularly creditable. So all's well now. But what about then? What happened when you were a child, growing up between two people who couldn't bridge the gulf that separated them? I know what that means, the fairy story ending in reverse, and so they lived unhappily ever after. And I've no doubt, said Suzla, that if we hadn't been born in Pala, we would have lived unhappily ever after. As it was, we got on, all things considered, remarkably well. How did you manage to do that? We didn't, it was all managed for us. Have you read what the old Raja says about getting rid of the two-thirds of sorrow that's homed made and gratuitous? Will nodded. I was just reading it when you came in. Well, in the bad old days, she went on, Palinese families could be just as victimizing, tyrant producing and liar creating as yours can be today. In fact they were so awful that Dr. Andrew and the Raju of the reform decided that something had to be done about it. Buddhist ethics and primitive village communism were skillfully made to serve the purposes of reason, and in a single generation the whole family system was radically changed. She hesitated for a moment. Let me explain, she went on, in terms of my own particular case the case of an only child of two people who couldn't understand one another and were always at cross purposes or actually quarreling. In the old days, a little girl brought up in those surroundings would have emerged as either a wreck, a rebel, or a resigned hypocritical conformist. Under the new dispensation I didn't have to undergo unnecessary suffering, I wasn't wrecked or forced into rebellion or resignation. Why? Because from the moment I could toddle, I was free to escape. To escape? He repeated. To escape? It seemed too good to be true. Escape, she explained, is built into the new system. Whenever the parental home sweet home becomes too unbearable, the child is allowed, is actively encouraged, and the whole weight of public opinion is behind the encouragement, to migrate to one of its other homes. How many homes does a Palinese child have? About twenty on the average. Twenty? My God! We all belong, Suzla explained, to an Mac, a mutual adoption club. Every Mac consists of anything from fifteen to twenty-five assorted couples. Newly elected brides and bridegrooms, old-timers with growing children, grandparents and great-grandparents, everybody in the club adopts everyone else. Besides our own blood relations, we all have our quota of deputy mothers, deputy fathers, deputy aunts and uncles, deputy brothers and sisters, deputy babies and toddlers and teenagers. Will shook his head. Making twenty families grow where only one grew before. But what grew before was your kind of family. The twenty are all our kind. As though reading instructions from a cookery book, take one sexually inept wage slave, she went on one dissatisfied female, two or, if preferred, three small television addicts, marinate in a mixture of feudism and dilute Christianity, then bottle up tightly in a four-room flat and stew for fifteen years in their own juice. Our recipe is rather different, take twenty sexually satisfied couples and their offspring, add science, intuition and humor in equal quantities, steep in tantric buddhism and simmer indefinitely in an open pan in the open air over a brisk flame of affection. And what comes out of your open pan? He asked. An entirely different kind of family. Not exclusive, like your families, and not predestined, not compulsory. 
an inclusive, unpredestined and voluntary family. 20 pairs of fathers and mothers, 8 or 9 ex-fathers and ex-mothers, and 40 or 50 assorted children of all ages. Do people stay in the same adoption club all their lives? Of course not. Grown-up children don't adopt their own parents or their own brothers and sisters. They go out and adopt another set of elders, a different group of peers and juniors. And the members of the new club adopt them and, in due course, their children. Hybridization of microcultures, that's what our sociologists call the process. It's as beneficial, on its own level, as the hybridization of different strains of maize or chickens. Healthier relationships in more responsible groups, wider sympathies and deeper understandings. And the sympathies and understandings are for everyone in the Mac from babies to centenarians. Centenarians? What's your expectation of life? A year or two more than yours, she answered. Ten percent of us are over sixty-five. The old get pensions, if they can't earn. But obviously pensions aren't enough. They need something useful and challenging to do, they need people they can care for and be loved by in return. The Max fulfill those needs. It all sounds, said Will, suspiciously like the propaganda for one of the new Chinese communes. Nothing, she assured him, could be less like a commune than a Mac. A Mac isn't run by the government, it's run by its members. And we're not militaristic. We're not interested in turning out good party members, we're only interested in turning out good human beings. We don't inculcate dogmas. And finally we don't take the children away from their parents, on the contrary, we give the children additional parents and the parents additional children. That means that even in the nursery we enjoy a certain degree of freedom, and our freedom increases as we grow older and can deal with a wider range of experience and take on greater responsibilities. Whereas in China there's no freedom at all. The children are handed over to official baby tamas, whose business it is to turn them into obedient servants of the state. Things are a great deal better in your part of the world, better, but still quite bad enough. You escape the state appointed baby tamas, but your society condemns you to pass your childhood in an exclusive family, with only a single set of siblings and parents. They're foisted on you by hereditary predestination. You can't get rid of them, can't take a holiday from them, can't go to anyone else for a change of moral or psychological air. It's freedom, if you like, but freedom in a telephone booth. Locked in, Will elaborated, and I'm thinking now of myself, with a sneering bully, a Christian martyr, and a little girl who'd been frightened by the bully and blackmailed by the martyr's appeal to her better feelings into a state of quivering imbecility. That was the home from which, until I was fourteen and my Aunt Mary came to live next door, I never escaped. And your unfortunate parents never escaped from you. That's not quite true. My father used to escape into brandy and my mother into high Anglicanism. I had to serve out my sentence without the slightest mitigation. Fourteen years of family servitude. How I envy you. Free as a bird? Not so lyrical. Free, let's say, as a developing human being, free as a future woman, but no freer. Mutual adoption guarantees children against injustice and the worst consequences of parental ineptitude. It doesn't guarantee them against discipline or against having to accept responsibilities. On the contrary, it increases the number of their responsibilities, it exposes them to a wide variety of disciplines. In your predestined and exclusive families, children, as you say, serve a long prison term under a single set of parental jailers. These parental jailers may, of course, be good, wise and intelligent. In that case the little prisoners will emerge more or less unscathed. But in point of fact most of your parental jailers are not conspicuously good, wise or intelligent. They're apt to be well-meaning but stupid, or not well-meaning and frivolous, or else neurotic, or occasionally downright malevolent, or frankly insane. 
so God help the young convicts committed by law and custom and religion to their tender mercies. But now consider what happens in a large, inclusive, voluntary family. No telephone booths, no predestined jailers. Here the children grow up in a world that's a working model of society at large, a small scale but accurate version of the environment in which they're going to have to live when they're grown up. Holy, healthy, whole, they all come from the same root and carry different overtones of the same meaning. Etymologically, and in fact, our kind of family, the inclusive and voluntary kind, is the genuine holy family. Yours is the unholy family. Amen said Will, and thought again of his own childhood, thought too of poor little Murugan in the clutches of the Rani. What happens, he asked after a pause, when the children migrate to one of their other homes? How long do they stay there? It all depends. When my children get fed up with me, they seldom stay away for more than a day or two. That's because, fundamentally, they're very happy at home. I wasn't and so when I walked out, I'd sometimes stay away for a whole month. And did your deputy parents back you up against your real mother and father? It's not a question of doing anything against anybody. All that's being backed up is intelligence and good feeling, and all that's being opposed is unhappiness and its avoidable causes. If a child feels unhappy in his first home, we do our best for him in fifteen or twenty second homes. Meanwhile the father and mother get some tactful therapy from the other members of their mutual adoption club. In a few weeks the parents are fit to be with their children again, and the children are fit to be with their parents. But you mustn't think, she added, that it's only when they're in trouble that children resort to their deputy parents and grandparents. They do it all the time, whenever they feel the need for a change or some kind of new experience. And it isn't just a social whirl. Wherever they go, as deputy children, they have their responsibilities as well as their rights, brushing the dog, for example, cleaning out the bird cages, minding the baby while the mother's doing something else. Duties as well as privileges, but not in one of your airless little telephone booths. Duties and privileges in a big, open, unpredestined, inclusive family where all the seven ages of man and a dozen different skills and talents are represented, and in which children have experience of all the important and significant things that human beings do and suffer, working, playing, loving, getting old, being sick, dying. She was silent, thinking of Dugald and Dugald's mother, then, deliberately changing her tone, but what about you? She went on. I've been so busy talking about families that I haven't even asked you how you're feeling. You certainly look a lot better than when I saw you last. Thanks to Dr. McPhail. And also thanks to someone who, I suspect, was definitely practicing medicine without a license. What on earth did you do to me yesterday afternoon? Susla smiled. You did it to yourself, she assured him. I merely pressed the buttons. Which buttons? memory buttons, imagination buttons. And that was enough to put me into a hypnotic trance? If you like to call it that. What else can one call it? Why call it anything? Names are such question beggars. Why not be content with just knowing that it happened? But what did happen? Well, to begin with, we made some kind of contact, didn't we? We certainly did, he agreed and yet I don't believe I even so much as looked at you. He was looking at her now, though, looking and wondering, as he looked, who this strange little creature really was, what lay behind the smooth grave mask of the face, what the dark eyes were seeing as they returned his scrutiny, what she was thinking. How could you look at me? She said. You'd gone off on your vacation. Or was I pushed off? Pushed? No. She shook her head. Let's say seen off, helped off. There was a moment of silence. Did you ever, she resumed, try to do a job of work with a child hanging around? Will thought of the small neighbor who had offered to help him paint the dining room furniture, and laughed at the memory of his exasperation. Poor little darling. Susla went on. He means so well, he's so anxious to help. 
but the paints on the carpet, the fingerprints are all over the walls. So that in the end you have to get rid of him. Run along, little boy. Go and play in the garden. There was a silence. Well? He questioned at last. Don't you see? Will shook his head. What happens when you're ill, when you've been hurt? Who does the repairing? Who heals the wounds and throws off the infection? Do you? Who else? You? She insisted. You? The person that feels the pain and does the worrying and thinks about sin and money in the future. Is that you capable of doing what has to be done? Oh, I see what you're driving at. At last. She mocked. Send me to play in the garden so that the grown ups can do their work in peace. But who are the grown ups? Don't ask me, she answered. That's a question for a neurotheologian. Meaning what? He asked. Meaning precisely what it says. Somebody who thinks about people in terms, simultaneously, of the clear light of the void and the vegetative nervous system. The grown ups are a mixture of mind and physiology. And the children? The children are the little fellows who think they know better than the grown ups. And so must be told to run along and play. Exactly. Is your sort of treatment standard procedure in Pala? He asked. Standard procedure, she assured him. In your part of the world doctors get rid of the children by poisoning them with barbiturates. We do it by talking to them about cathedrals and jackdaws. Her voice had modulated into a chant. About white clouds floating in the sky, white swans floating on the dark, smooth, irresistible river of life. Now, now, he protested. None of that. A smile lit up the grave dark face, and she began to laugh. Will looked at her with astonishment. Here, suddenly, was a different person, another Susla McPhail, gay, mischievous, ironical. I know your tricks, he added, joining in the laughter. Tricks? Still laughing, she shook her head. I was just explaining how I did it. I know exactly how you did it. And I also know that it works. What's more, I give you leave to do it again, whenever it's necessary. If you like, she said more seriously, I'll show you how to press your own buttons. We teach it in all our elementary schools. The three R's plus rudimentary SD. What's that? Self-determination. Alias destiny control. Destiny control? He raised his eyebrows. No, no, she assured him, we're not quite such fools as you seem to think. We know perfectly well that only a part of our destiny is controllable. And you control it by pressing your own buttons? Pressing our own buttons and then visualizing what we'd like to happen. But does it happen? In many cases it does. Simple. There was a note of irony in his voice. Wonderfully simple, she agreed. And yet, so far as I know, we're the only people who systematically teach DC to their children. You just tell them what they're supposed to do and leave it at that. Behave well, you say. But how? You never tell them. All you do is give them pep talks and punishments. Pure idiocy. Pure unadulterated idiocy. He agreed, remembering Mr. Crab, his housemaster, on the subject of masturbation, remembering the canings and the weekly sermons and the commination service on Ash Wednesday. Cursed is he that lieth with his neighbor's wife. Amen. If your children take the idiocy seriously, they grow up to be miserable sinners. And if they don't take it seriously, they grow up to be miserable cynics. And if they react from miserable cynicism, they're apt to go papist or Marxist. No wonder you have to have all those thousands of jails and churches and communist cells. Whereas in Pala, I gather, you have very few. Susla shook her head. No Alcatrazes here, she said. No Billy Grahams or Mao Tungs or Madonnas of Fatima. No hells on earth and no Christian pie in the sky, no communist pie in the 22nd century. Just men and women and their children trying to make the best of the here and now, instead of living somewhere else, as you people mostly do, in some other time, some other homemade imaginary universe. And it really isn't your fault. 
you're almost compelled to live that way because the present is so frustrating. And it's frustrating because you've never been taught how to bridge the gap between theory and practice, between your New Year's resolutions and your actual behavior. For the good that I would, he quoted, I do not, and the evil that I would not, that I do. Who said that? The man who invented Christianity, St. Paul. You see, she said, the highest possible ideals, and no methods for realizing them except the supernatural method of having them realized by somebody else. Throwing back his head, Will Farnaby burst into song. There is a fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood are cleansed of all their stains. Susla had covered her ears. It's really obscene, she said. My housemaster's favorite hymn, Will explained. We used to sing it about once a week, all the time I was at school. Thank goodness, she said, there was never any blood in Buddhism. Gautama lived till 80 and died from being too courteous to refuse bad food. Violent death always seems to call for more violent death. If you won't believe that you're redeemed by my Redeemer's blood, I'll drown you in your own. Last year one took a course at Shivaparam in the history of Christianity. Susla shuddered at the memory. What a horror! And all because that poor ignorant man didn't know how to implement his good intentions. And most of us, said Will, are still in the same old boat. The evil that we would not, that we do. And how? Reacting unforgivably to the unforgivable, Will Farnaby laughed derisively. Laughed because he had seen the goodness of Molly and then, with open eyes, had chosen the pink alcove and, with it, Molly's unhappiness. Molly's death, his own gnawing sense of guilt, and then the pain, out of all proportion to its slow and essentially farcical cause, the agonizing pain that he had felt when Babs in due course did what any fool must have known she inevitably would do, turned him out of her infernal gin illumined paradise, and took another lover. What's the matter? Suslow asked. Nothing. Why do you ask? Because you're not very good at hiding your feelings. You were thinking of something that made you unhappy. You've got sharp eyes, he said, and looked away. There was a long silence. Should he tell her? Tell her about Babs, about poor Molly, about himself, tell her all the dismal and senseless things he had never, even when he was drunk, told even his oldest friends? Old friends knew too much about one, too much about the other parties involved too much about the grotesque and complicated game which, as an English gentleman who was also a bohemian, also a would-be poet, also, in mere despair, because he knew he could never be a good poet, a hard-boiled journalist, and the private agent, very well paid, of a rich man whom he despised. He was always so elaborately playing. No, old friends would never do. But from this dark little outsider, this stranger to whom he already owed so much and with whom, though he knew nothing about her, he was already so intimate, there would come no foregone conclusions, no ex-party judgments, would come perhaps, he found himself hoping, he who had trained himself never to hope, some unexpected enlightenment, some positive and practical help. And, God knew, he needed help, though God also knew only too well that he would never say so never sink so low as to ask for it, like a muezzin in his minaret, one of the talking birds began to shout from the tall palm beyond the mango trees, here and now, boys, here and now, boys, Will decided to take the plunge, but to take it indirectly, by talking first, not about his problems, but about hers, without looking at Susla, for that, he felt, would be indecent, he began to speak, Dr. MacPhail told me something about dot about what happened to your husband. The words turned a sword in her heart, but that was to be expected, that was right and inevitable. It'll be four months next Wednesday, she said. And then, meditatively, two people, she went on after a little silence, two separate individuals, but they add up to something like a new creation. And then suddenly half of this new creature is amputated but the other half doesn't die, can't die, 
mustn't die. Mustn't die? For so many reasons, the children, oneself, the whole nature of things. But needless to say, she added, with a little smile that only accentuated the sadness in her eyes, needless to say the reasons don't lessen the shock of the amputation or make the aftermath any more bearable. The only thing that helps is what we were talking about just now, destiny control. And even that. She shook her head. DC can give you a completely painless childbirth. But a completely painless bereavement, no. And of course that's as it should be. It wouldn't be right if you could take away all the pain of a bereavement, you'd be less than human. Less than human, he repeated. Less than human. Three short words, but how completely they summed him up. The really terrible thing, he said aloud, is when you know it's your fault that the other person died. Were you married? She asked. For twelve years. Until last spring. And now she's dead? She died in an accident. In an accident? Then how was it your fault? The accident happened because dot well, because the evil that I didn't want to do, I did. And that day it came to a head. The hurt of it confused and distracted her, and I let her drive away in the car, let her drive away into a head-on collision. Did you love her? He hesitated for a moment, then slowly shook his head. Was there somebody else, somebody you cared for more? Somebody I couldn't have cared for less. He made a grimace of sardonic self-mockery. And that was the evil you didn't want to do, but did? Did and went on doing until I'd killed the woman I ought to have loved, but didn't. Went on doing it even after I'd killed her, even though I hated myself for doing it, yes, and really hated the person who made me do it. Made you do it. I suppose, by having the right kind of body? Will nodded, and there was a silence. Do you know what it's like, he asked at length, to feel that nothing is quite real, including yourself? Susla nodded. It sometimes happens when one's just on the point of discovering that everything, including oneself, is much more real than one ever imagined. It's like shifting gears, you have to go into neutral before you change into high or low, said Will. In my case, the shift wasn't up, it was down. No, not even down, it was into reverse. The first time it happened I was waiting for a bus to take me home from Fleet Street. Thousands upon thousands of people, all on the move, and each of them unique, each of them the center of the universe. Then the sun came out from behind a cloud. Everything was extraordinarily bright and clear, and suddenly, with an almost audible click. They were all maggots. Maggots? You know, those little pale worms with black heads that one sees on rotten meat. Nothing had changed, of course, people's faces were the same, their clothes were the same. And yet they were all maggots. Not even real maggots, just the ghosts of maggots, just the illusion of maggots. And I was the illusion of a spectator of maggots. I lived in that maggot world for months. Lived in it, worked in it, went out to lunch and dinner in it, all without the least interest in what I was doing. Without the least enjoyment or relish, completely desireless and, as I discovered when I tried to make love to a young woman I'd had occasional fun with in the past, completely impotent. What did you expect? Precisely that. Then why on earth? Will gave her one of his flayed smiles and shrugged his shoulders. As a matter of scientific interest. I was an entomologist investigating the sex life of the phantom maggot. After which, I suppose, everything seemed even more unreal. Even more. He agreed, if that was possible. But what brought on the maggots in the first place? Well, to begin with, he answered, I was my parents' son by bully boozer out of Christian martyr. And on top of being my parents' son, he went on after a little pause, I was my Aunt Mary's nephew. What did your Aunt Mary have to do with it? She was the only person I ever loved, and when I was sixteen she got cancer. Off with the right breast, then, a year later, off with the left. And after that nine months of X-rays and radiation sickness. 
then it got into the liver, and that was the end. I was there from start to finish. For a boy in his teens it was a liberal education, but liberal. In what? Suslow asked. In pure and applied pointlessness. And a few weeks after the close of my private course in the subject came the grand opening of the public course. World War II. Followed by the non-stop refresher course of Cold War I. And all this time I'd been wanting to be a poet and finding out that I simply don't have what it takes. And then, after the war, I had to go into journalism to make money. What I wanted was to go hungry, if necessary, but try to write something decent, good prose at least, seeing that it couldn't be good poetry. But I'd reckoned without those darling parents of mine. By the time he died, in January of 46, my father had got rid of all the little money our family had inherited and by the time she was blessedly a widow, my mother was crippled with arthritis and had to be supported. So there I was in Fleet Street, supporting her with an ease and a success that were completely humiliating. Why humiliating? Wouldn't you be humiliated if you found yourself making money by turning out the cheapest, flashiest kind of literary forgery? I was a success because I was so irremediably second-rate. And the net result of it all was maggots? He nodded. Not even real maggots, phantom maggots. And here's where Molly came into the picture. I met her at a high-class maggot party in Bloomsbury. We were introduced, we made some politely inane conversation about non-objective painting. Not wanting to see any more maggots, I didn't look at her, but she must have been looking at me. Molly had very pale grey-blue eyes, he added parenthetically, eyes that saw everything, she was incredibly observant, but observed without malice or censoriousness, seeing the evil, if it was there, but never condemning it, just feeling enormously sorry for the person who was under compulsion to think those thoughts and do that odious kind of thing. Well, as I say, she must have been looking at me while we talked for suddenly she asked me why I was so sad. I'd had a couple of drinks and there was nothing impertinent or offensive about the way she asked the question, so I told her about the maggots. And you're one of them, I finished up, and for the first time I looked at her. A blue-eyed maggot with a face like one of the holy women in attendance at a Flemish crucifixion. Was she flattered? I think so. She'd stopped being a Catholic, but she still had a certain weakness for crucifixions and holy women. Anyhow, next morning she called me at breakfast time. Would I like to drive down into the country with her? It was Sunday and, by a miracle, fine. I accepted. We spent an hour in a hazel copse, picking primroses and looking at the little white windflowers. One doesn't pick the windflowers, he explained, because in an hour they're withered. I did a lot of looking in that hazel copse, looking at flowers with the naked eye and then looking into them through the magnifying glass that Molly had brought with her. I don't know why, but it was extraordinarily therapeutic, just looking into the hearts of primroses and anemones. For the rest of the day I saw no maggots. But Fleet Street was still there, waiting for me, and by lunchtime on Monday the whole place was crawling with them as thickly as ever. Millions of maggots. But now I knew what to do about them. That evening I went to Molly's studio. Was she a painter? Not a real painter, and she knew it. Knew it and didn't resent it, just made the best of having no talent. She didn't paint for art's sake, she painted because she liked looking at things, liked the process of trying meticulously to reproduce what she saw. That evening she gave me a canvas and a palette, and told me to do likewise. And did it work? It worked so well that when a couple of months later I cut open a rotten apple, the worm at its center wasn't a maggot, not subjectively, I mean. Objectively, yes, it was all that a maggot should be, and that's how I portrayed it. How we both portrayed it, for we always painted the same things at the same time. What about the other maggots, the phantom maggots outside the apple? Well, I still had relapses especially in Fleet Street and at cocktail parties, but the maggots were definitely fewer, definitely less haunting. And meanwhile something new was happening in the studio. I was falling in love, 
falling in love because love is catching and Molly was so obviously in love with me, why? God only knows. I can see several possible reasons why. She might have loved you because. Susla eyed him appraisingly and smiled. Well, because you're quite an attractive kind of queer fish. He laughed. Thank you for a handsome compliment. On the other hand, Susla went on, and this isn't quite so complimentary, she might have loved you because you made her feel so damned sorry for you. That's the truth, I'm afraid. Molly was a born sister of mercy. And a sister of mercy, unfortunately, isn't the same as a wife of love. Which I duly discovered, he said. After your marriage, I suppose. Will hesitated for a moment. Actually, he said, it was before. Not because, on her side, there had been any urgency of desire, but only because she was so eager to do anything to please me. Only because, on principle, she didn't believe in conventions and was all for freely loving, and more surprisingly, he remembered the outrageous things she would so casually and placidly give utterance to even in his mother's presence, all for freely talking about that freedom. You knew it beforehand, Susla summed up, and yet you still married her. Will nodded his head without speaking. Because you were a gentleman, I take it, and a gentleman keeps his word. Partly for that rather old-fashioned reason, but also because I was in love with her. Were you in love with her? Yes. No, I don't know. But at the time I did know. At least I thought I knew. I was really convinced that I was really in love with her. And I knew, I still know, why I was convinced. I was grateful to her for having exorcised those maggots. And besides the gratitude there was respect. There was admiration. She was so much better and honester than I was. But unfortunately, you're right, a sister of mercy isn't the same as a wife of love. But I was ready to take Molly on her own terms, not on mine. I was ready to believe that her terms were better than mine. How soon, Susla asked, after a long silence, did you start having affairs on the side? Will smiled his flayed smile. Three months to the day after our wedding. The first time was with one of the secretaries at the office. Goodness, what a bore. After that there was a young painter, a curly-headed little Jewish girl whom Molly had helped with money while she was studying at the Slade. I used to go to her studio twice a week, from five to seven. It was almost three years before Molly found out about it. And, I gather, she was upset. Much more than I'd ever thought she'd be. So what did you do about it? Will shook his head. This is where it begins to get complicated, he said. I had no intention of giving up my cocktail hours with Rachel, but I hated myself for making Molly so unhappy. At the same time I hated her for being unhappy. I resented her suffering and the love that had made her suffer, I felt that they were unfair a kind of blackmail to force me to give up my innocent fun with Rachel. By loving me so much and being so miserable about what I was doing, what she really forced me to do, she was putting pressure on me, she was trying to restrict my freedom. But meanwhile she was genuinely unhappy, and though I hated her for blackmailing me with her unhappiness, I was filled with pity for her. Pity, he repeated, not compassion. Compassion is suffering with, and what I wanted at all costs was to spare myself the pain her suffering caused me, and avoid the painful sacrifices by which I could put an end to her suffering. Pity was my answer, being sorry for her from the outside, if you see what I mean, sorry for her as a spectator, an aesthete, a connoisseur in excruciations. And this aesthetic pity of mine was so intense, every time her unhappiness came to a head, that I could almost mistake it for love. Almost, but never quite. For when I expressed my pity in physical tenderness, which I did because that was the only way of putting a temporary stop to her unhappiness and to the pain her unhappiness was inflicting on me, the tenderness was always frustrated before it could come to its natural consummation. Frustrated because, by temperament, she was only a sister of mercy, not a wife. And yet, on every level but the sensual, she loved me with a total commitment, 
a commitment that called for an answering commitment on my part. But I wouldn't commit myself, maybe I genuinely couldn't. So instead of being grateful for her self giving, I resented it. It made claims on me, claims that I refuse to acknowledge. So the we were, at the end of every crisis, back at the beginning of the old drama, the drama of a love incapable of sensuality self committed to a sensuality incapable of love and evoking strangely mixed responses of guilt and exasperation, of pity and resentment, sometimes of real hatred, but always with an undertone of remorse, the whole accompanied by, contrapuntal to, a succession of furtive evenings with my little curly headed painter. I hope at least they were enjoyable, said Susla. He shrugged his shoulders. Only moderately. Rachel could never forget that she was an intellectual. She had a way of asking what one thought of Piero di Cosimo at the most inopportune moments. The real enjoyment and of course the real agony, I never experienced them until Babs appeared on the scene. When was that? Just over a year ago. In Africa. Africa? I'd been sent there by Joe Alderhyde. That man who owns newspapers? And all the rest. He was married to Molly's Aunt Eileen. An exemplary family man, I may add. That's why he's so serenely convinced of his own righteousness, even when he's engaged in the most nefarious financial operations. And you're working for him? Will nodded. That was his wedding present to Molly, a job for me on the Alderhyde papers at almost twice the salary I'd been getting from my previous employers. Princely. But then he was very fond of Molly. How did he react to Babs? He never knew about her, never knew that there was any reason for Molly's accident. So he goes on employing you for your dead wife's sake? Will shrugged his shoulders. The excuse, he said, is that I have my mother to support. And of course you wouldn't enjoy being poor. I certainly wouldn't. There was a silence. Well, said Susla at last, let's get back to Africa. I'd been sent there to do a series on Negro nationalism. Not to mention a little private hanky panky in the business line for Uncle Joe. It was on the plane, flying home from Nairobi. I found myself sitting next to her. Next to the young woman you couldn't have liked less. Couldn't have liked less, he repeated, or disapproved of more. But if you're an addict you've got to have your dope, the dope that you know in advance is going to destroy you. It's a funny thing, she said reflectively, but in Pala we have hardly any addicts. Not even sex addicts? The sex addicts are also person addicts. In other words, they're lovers. But even lovers sometimes hate the people they love. Naturally. Because I always have the same name and the same nose and eyes, it doesn't follow that I'm always the same woman. Recognizing that fact and reacting to it sensibly, that's part of the art of loving. As succinctly as he could, Will told her the rest of the story. It was the same story, now that Babs had come on the scene, as it had been before, the same but much more so. Babs had been Rachel raised, so to speak, to a higher power, Rachel squared, Rachel to the nth. And the unhappiness that, because of Babs, he had inflicted upon Molly was proportionately greater than anything she had had to suffer on account of Rachel. Proportionately greater, too, had been his own exasperation, his own resentful sense of being blackmailed by her love and suffering, his own remorse and pity, his own determination, in spite of the remorse and the pity, to go on getting what he wanted, what he hated himself for wanting, what he resolutely refused to do without. And meanwhile Babs had become more demanding, was claiming ever more and more of his time, time not only in the strawberry pink alcove, but also outside, in restaurants, and nightclubs, at her horrible friends cocktail parties, on weekends in the country. Just you and me, darling, she would say, all alone together. All alone together in an isolation that gave him the opportunity to plumb the almost unfathomable depths of her mindlessness and vulgarity. But through all his boredom and distaste, all his moral and intellectual repugnance, the craving persisted. After one of those dreadful weekends, he was as helplessly a Babs addict as he had been before. 
and on her side, on her own sister of mercy level, Molly had remained, in spite of everything, no less hopelessly a Wilfarnaby addict. Helplessly so far as he was concerned, for his one wish was that she should love him less and allow him to go to hell in peace. But, so far as Molly herself was concerned, the addiction was always and irrepressibly hopeful. She never ceased to expect the transfiguring miracle that would change him into the kind, unselfish, loving will Farnaby whom, in the teeth of all the evidence, all the repeated disappointments, she stubbornly insisted on regarding as his true self. It was only in the course of that last fatal interview, only when, stifling his pity and giving free rein to his resentment of her blackmailing unhappiness, he had announced his intention of leaving her and going to live with Babs, it was only then that hope had finally given place to hopelessness. Do you mean it, Will? Do you really mean it? I really mean it. It was in hopelessness, in utter hopelessness, that she had walked out to the car, had driven away into the rain, into her death. At the funeral, when the coffin was lowered into the grave, he had promised himself that he would never see Babs again. Never, never, never again. That evening, while he was sitting at his desk trying to write an article on what's wrong with youth, trying not to remember the hospital, the open grave, and his own responsibility for everything that had happened, he was startled by the shrill buzzing of the doorbell. A belated message of condolence, no doubt dot he had opened, and there, instead of the telegram, was Babs, dramatically without makeup and all in black. My poor, poor Will. They had sat down on the sofa in the living room, and she had stroked his hair and both of them had cried. When pain and anguish wring the brow, a ministering angel thou. An hour later, needless to say, they were naked and in bed. After which he had moved, earth to earth, into the pink alcove. Within three months, as any fool could have foreseen, Babs had begun to tire of him, within four, an absolutely divine man from Kenya had turned up at a cocktail party. One thing had led to another and when, three days later, Babs came home, it was to prepare the alcove for a new tenant and give notice to the old. Do you really mean it, Babs? She really meant it. Dot. There was a rustling in the bushes outside the window and an instant later, startlingly loud and slightly out of time, here and now, boys, shouted a talking bird. Shut up! Will shouted back. Here and now, boys, the miner repeated. Here and now, boys. Here and, shut up. There was silence. I had to shut him up, Will explained, because of course he's absolutely right. Here, boys, now, boys. Then and there are absolutely irrelevant. Or aren't they? What about your husband's death, for example? Is that irrelevant? Susan looked at him for a moment in silence, then slowly nodded her head. In the context of what I have to do now, yes, completely irrelevant. That's something I had to learn. Does one learn how to forget? It isn't a matter of forgetting. What one has to learn is how to remember and yet be free of the past. How to be though with the dead and yet still be here, on the spot, with the living. She gave him a sad little smile and added, it isn't easy. It isn't easy, Will repeated. And suddenly all his defenses were down, all his pride had left him. Will you help me? He asked. It's a bargain, she said and held out her hand. A sound of footsteps made them turn their heads. Dr. MacPhail had entered the room. Eight. Good evening, my dear. Good evening, Mr. Farnaby. The tone was cheerful, not, Suzla was quick to notice, with any kind of synthetic cheerfulness, but naturally, genuinely. And yet, before coming here, he must have stopped at the hospital, must have seen Lakshmi as Susli herself had seen her only an hour or two since, more dreadfully emaciated than ever, more skull-like and discoloured. Half a long lifetime of love and loyalty and mutual forgiveness, and in another day or two it would be all over, he would be alone. But sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, sufficient unto the place and the person. One has no right, her father-in-law had said to her one day as they were leaving the hospital together, 
one has no right to inflict one's sadness on other people. And no right, of course, to pretend that one isn't sad. One just has to accept one's grief and one's absurd attempts to be a stoic. Accept, accept. His voice broke. Looking up at him, she saw that his face was wet with tears. Five minutes later they were sitting on a bench, at the edge of the lotus pool, in the shadow of the huge stone Buddha. With a little plop, sharp and yet liquidly voluptuous, an unseen frog dived from its round leafy platform into the water. Thrusting up from the mud, the thick green stems with their turgid buds broke through into the air, and here and there the blue or rosy symbols of enlightenment had opened their petals to the sun and the probing visitations of flies and tiny beetles and the wild bees from the jungle. Darting, pausing in mid-flight, darting again, a score of glittering blue and green dragonflies were hawking for midges. Taithata, Dr. Robert had whispered. Suchness. For a long time they sat there in silence. Then, suddenly, he had touched her shoulder. Look! She lifted her eyes to where he was pointing. Two small parrots had perched on the Buddha's right hand and were going through the ritual of courtship. Did you stop again at the lotus pool? Suzla asked aloud. Dr. Robert gave her a little smile and nodded his head. How was Shivaparam? Will inquired. Pleasant enough in itself, the doctor answered. Its only defect is that it's so close to the outside world. Up here one can simply ignore the organized insanities and get on with one's work. Down there, with all those antennae and listening posts and channels of communication that a government has to have, the outside world is perpetually breathing down one's neck. One hears it, feels it, smells it, yes, smells it. Has anything more than usually disastrous happened since I've been here? Nothing out of the ordinary at your end of the world. I wish I could say the same about our end. What's the trouble? The trouble is our next door neighbor, Colonel Deeper. To begin with, he's made another deal with the Czechs. More armaments? Sixty million dollars worth. It was on the radio this morning. But what on earth for? The usual reasons. Glory and power. The pleasures of vanity and the pleasures of bullying. Terrorism and military parades at home, conquests and dooms abroad. And that brings me to the second item of unpleasant news. Last night the Colonel delivered another of his celebrated Greater Rendang speeches. Greater Rendang? What's that? You may well ask, said Dr. Robert. Greater Rendang is the territory controlled by the sultans of Rendang Lobo between 1447 and 1483. It included Rendang, the Nicobar Islands, about 30% of Sumatra and the whole of Pala. Today, it's Colonel Deepa Ziridenta. Seriously? With a perfectly straight face. No, I'm wrong. With a purple, distorted face and at the top of a voice that he has trained, after long practice, to sound exactly like Hitler's. Greater Rendang or death. But the great powers would never allow it. Maybe they wouldn't like to see him in Sumatra. But Pala, that's another matter. He shook his head. Pala, unfortunately, is in nobody's good books. We don't want the communists, but neither do we want the capitalists. Least of all do we want the wholesale industrialization that both parties are so anxious to impose on us, for different reasons, of course. The West wants it because our labor costs are low and investors' dividends will be correspondingly high. And the East wants it because industrialization will create a proletariat, open fresh fields for communist agitation and may lead in the long run to the setting up of yet another people's democracy. We say no to both of you, so we're unpopular everywhere. Regardless of their ideologies, all the great powers may prefer a rendang controlled palo with oil fields to an independent palo without. If Deepu attacks us, they'll say it's most deplorable, but they won't lift a finger. And when he takes us over and calls the oil men in, they'll be delighted. What can you do about Colonel Deepa? Will asked. Except for passive resistance, nothing. We have no army and no powerful friends. The colonel has both. 
the most we can do, if he starts making trouble, is to appeal to the United Nations. Meanwhile we shall remonstrate with the Colonel about this latest greater Rendang effusion. Remonstrate through our minister in Rendang Lobo, and remonstrate with the great man in person when he pays his state visit to Pala ten days from now. A state visit? For the young Raja's coming of age celebrations. He was asked a long time ago, but he never let us know for certain whether he was coming or not. Today it was finally settled. We'll have a summit meeting as well as a birthday party. But let's talk about something more rewarding. How did you get on today, Mr. Farnaby? Not merely well, gloriously. I had the honor of a visit from your reigning monarch. Murugan? Why didn't you tell me he was your reigning monarch? Dr. Robert laughed. You might have asked for an interview. Well, I didn't. Nor from the Queen Mother. Did the Rani come too? At the command of her little voice. And, sure enough, the little voice sent her to the right address. My boss, Joe Alderhyde, is one of her dearest friends. Did she tell you that she's trying to bring your boss here, to exploit our oil? She did indeed. We turned down his latest offer less than a month ago. Did you know that? Will was relieved to be able to answer quite truthfully that he didn't. Neither Joe Alderhyde nor the Rani had told him of this most recent rebuff. My job, he went on, a little less truthfully, is in the wood pulp department, not in petroleum. There was a silence. What's my status here? He asked at last. Undesirable alien? Well, fortunately you're not an armament salesman. Nor a missionary, said Suzla. Nor an oil man, though on that count you might be guilty by association. Nor even, so far as we know, a uranium prospector. Those, Dr. Robert concluded, are the alpha plus undesirables. As a journalist you rank as a beta. Not the kind of person we should ever dream of inviting to Pala. But also not the kind who, having managed to get here, requires to be summarily deported. I'd like to stay here for as long as it's legally possible, said Will. May I ask why? Will hesitated. As Joe Alderhyde's secret agent and a reporter with a hopeless passion for literature, he had to stay long enough to negotiate with Boo and earn his year of freedom. But there were other, more avowable reasons. If you don't object to personal remarks, he said, I'll tell you. Fire away, said Dr. Robert. The fact is that, the more I see of you people the better I like you. I want to find out more about you. And in the process, he added, glancing at Suzla, I might find out some interesting things about myself. How long shall I be allowed to stay? Normally we'd turn you out as soon as you're fit to travel. But if you're seriously interested in Pala, above all if you're seriously interested in yourself, well, we might stretch a point. Or shouldn't we stretch that point? What do you say, Suzla? After all, he does work for Lord Alderhyde. Will was on the point of protesting again that his job was in the wood pulp department, but the words stuck in his throat and he said nothing. The seconds passed. Dr. Robert repeated his question. Yes, Suzla said at last, we'd be taking a certain risk. But personally, dot personally, I'd be ready to take it. Am I right? She turned to Will. Well, I think you can trust me. At least I hope you can. He laughed, trying to make a joke of it, but to his annoyance and embarrassment, he felt himself blushing. Blushing for what? He demanded resentfully of his conscience. If anybody was being double-crossed, it was standard of California. And once Deepa had moved in, what difference would it make who got the concession? Which would you rather be eaten by, a wolf or a tiger? So far as the lamb is concerned, it hardly seems to matter. Joe would be no worse than his competitors. All the same, he wished he hadn't been in such a hurry to send off that letter. And why, why couldn't that dreadful woman have left him in peace? Through the sheet he felt a hand on his undamaged knee. Dr. Robert was smiling down at him. You can have a month here, he said. I'll take full responsibility for you. And we'll do our best to show you everything. I'm very grateful to you. When in doubt, 
said Dr. Robert, always act on the assumption that people are more honorable than you have any solid reason for supposing they are. That was the advice the old Raja gave me when I was a young man. Turning to Suzla, let's see, he said, how old were you when the old Raja died? Just eight. So you remember him pretty well. Suzla laughed. Could anyone ever forget the way he used to talk about himself? Quote I, unquote, like sugar in my tea. What a darling man. And what a great one. Dr. McPhail got up and, crossing to the bookcase that stood between the door and the wardrobe, pulled out of its lowest shelf a thick red album, much the worse for tropical weather and fish insects. There's a picture of him somewhere, he said as he turned over the pages. Here we are. Will found himself looking at the faded snapshot of a little old Hindu in spectacles and a loincloth, engaged in emptying the contents of an extremely ornate silver sauce boat over a small squat pillar. What is he doing? He asked. Anointing a phallic symbol with melted butter, the doctor answered. It was a habit my poor father could never break him of. Did your father disapprove of fallacies? No, no, said Dr. McPhail. My father was all for them. It was the symbol that he disapproved of. Why the symbol? Because he thought that people ought to take their religion warmth from the cow, if you see what I mean. Not skimmed or pasteurized or homogenized. Above all not canned in any kind of theological or liturgical container. And the Raja had a weakness for containers? Not for containers in general. Just this one particular tin can. He'd always felt a special attachment to the family lingam. It was made of black basalt, and was at least 800 years old. I see, said Will Farnaby. Buttering the family lingam, it was an act of piety, it expressed a beautiful sentiment about a sublime idea. But even the sublimest of ideas is totally different from the cosmic mystery it's supposed to stand for. And the beautiful sentiments connected with the sublime idea, what do they have in common with the direct experience of the mystery? Nothing whatsoever. Needless to say, the old Raja knew all this perfectly well. Better than my father. He'd drunk the milk as it came from the cow. He'd actually been the milk. But the buttering of lingams was a devotional practice he just couldn't bear to give up. And, I don't have to tell you, he should never have been asked to give it up. But where symbols were concerned, my father was a Puritan. He demanded Goethe, Alsverg Englishist Nickdine Glicknes. His ideal was pure experimental science at one end of the spectrum and pure experimental mysticism at the other. Direct experience on every level and then clear, rational statements about those experiences. Lingams and crosses, butter and holy water, sutras, gospels, images chanting, he'd have liked to abolish them all. Where would the arts have come in? Will questioned. They wouldn't have come in at all, Dr. McPhail answered. And that was my father's blindest spot, poetry. He said he liked it, but in fact he didn't. Poetry for its own sake, poetry as an autonomous universe, out there, in the space between direct experience and the symbols of science, that was something he simply couldn't understand. Let's find his picture. Dr. McPhail turned back the pages of the album and pointed to a craggy profile with enormous eyebrows. What a Scotsman! Will commented. And yet his mother and his grandmother were Palinese. One doesn't see a trace of them. Whereas his grandfather, who hailed from birth, might almost have passed for a Rajput. Will peered into the ancient photograph of a young man with an oval face and black side whiskers leaning his elbow on a marble pedestal on which, bottom upwards, stood his inordinately tall top hat. Your great-grandfather? The first MacPhail of Pala. Dr. Andrew. Born 1822, in the Royal Burg, where his father, James MacPhail, owned a rope mill. Which was properly symbolical, for James was a devout Calvinist, and being convinced that he himself was one of the elect, derived a deep and glowing satisfaction from the thought of all those millions of his fellow men going through life with the noose of predestination about their necks, and old Nobu Daddy aloft counting the minutes to spring the trap. Will laughed. 
Yes, Dr. Robert agreed, it does seem pretty comic. But it didn't then. Then it was serious, much more serious than the H-bomb is today. It was known for certain that 99.9% .9 of the human race were condemned to everlasting brimstone. Why? Either because they'd never heard of Jesus, or, if they had, because they couldn't believe sufficiently strongly that Jesus had delivered them from the brimstone. And the proof that they didn't believe sufficiently strongly was the empirical, observable fact that their souls were not at peace. Perfect faith is defined as something that produces perfect peace of mind. But perfect peace of mind is something that practically nobody possesses. Therefore practically nobody possesses perfect faith. Therefore practically everybody is predestined to eternal punishment. Quadrat demonstrandum. One wonders, said Suzla, why they didn't all go mad. Fortunately most of them believed only with the tops of their heads. Up here. Dr. McPhail tapped his bald spot. With the tops of their heads they were convinced it was the truth with the largest possible T. But their glands and their guts knew better, knew that it was all sheer bosh. For most of them, truth was true only on Sundays, and then only in a strictly Pickwickian sense. James McPhail knew all this and was determined that his children should not be mere Sabbath day believers. They were to believe every word of the sacred nonsense even on Mondays, even on half holiday afternoons, and they were to believe with their whole being, not merely up there, in the attic. Perfect faith and the perfect peace that goes with it were to be forced into them. How? By giving them hell now and threatening them with hell hereafter. And if, in their devilish perversity, they refused to have perfect faith, and be at peace, give them more hell and threaten hotter fires. And meanwhile tell them that good works are as filthy rags in the sight of God, but punish them ferociously for every misdemeanor. Tell them that by nature they're totally depraved, then beat them for being what they inescapably are. Will Farnaby turned back to the album. Do you have a picture of this delightful ancestor of yours? We had an oil painting, said Dr. McPhail. But the dampness was too much for the canvas, and then the fish insects got into it. He was a splendid specimen. Like a high Renaissance picture of Jeremiah. You know, majestic, with an inspired eye and the kind of prophetic beard that covers such a multitude of physiognomic sins. The only relic of him that remains is a pencil drawing of his house. He turned back another page and there it was. Solid granite, he went on, with bars on all the windows. And, inside that cozy little family Bastille, what systematic inhumanity! Systematic inhumanity in the name, needless to say, of Christ and for righteousness' sake? Dr. Andrew left an unfinished autobiography, so we know all about it. Didn't the children get any help from their mother? Dr. McPhail shook his head. Janet McPhail was a Cameron and as good a Calvinist as James himself. Maybe an even better Calvinist than he was. Being a woman, she had further to go, she had more instinctive decencies to overcome. But she did overcome them, heroically. Far from restraining her husband, she urged him on, she backed him up. There were homilies before breakfast and at the midday dinner. There was the catechism on Sundays and learning the epistles by heart, and every evening, when the day's delinquencies had been added up and assessed, methodical whipping, with a whalebone riding switch on the bare buttocks, for all six children, girls as well as boys, in order of seniority. It always makes me feel slightly sick, said Suzla. Pure sadism. No, not pure, said Dr. McPhail. Applied sadism. Sadism with an ulterior motive, sadism in the service of an ideal, as the expression of a religious conviction. And that's a subject, he added, turning to Will, that somebody ought to make a historical study of, the relation between theology and corporal punishment in childhood. I have a theory that, wherever little boys and girls are systematically flagellated, the victims grow up to think of God as wholly other, isn't that the fashionable Argo in your part of the world? Wherever, on the contrary, 
children are brought up without being subjected to physical violence, God is imminent. A people's theology reflects the state of its children's bottoms. Look at the Hebrews, enthusiastic child beaters. And so were all good Christians in the ages of faith. Hence Jehovah, hence original sin and the infinitely offended father of Roman and Protestant orthodoxy. Whereas among Buddhists and Hindus education has always been non-violent. No laceration of little buttocks, therefore tatvamas thou art that, mind from mind is not divided. And look at the Quakers. They were heretical enough to believe in the inner light, and what happened? They gave up beating their children and were the first Christian denomination to protest against the institution of slavery. But child beating, well objected, has quite gone out of fashion nowadays. And yet it's precisely at this moment that it has become modish to hold forth about the holy other. Dr. McPhail waved the objection away. It's just a case of reaction following action. By the second half of the 19th century free-thinking humanitarianism had become so strong that even good Christians were influenced by it and stopped beating their children. There were no wheels on the younger generation's posterior, consequently, it ceased to think of God as the holy other and proceeded to invent new thought, unity, Christian science, all the semi-oriental heresies in which God is the wholly identical. The movement was well underway in William James's day, and it's been gathering momentum ever since. But thesis always invites antithesis and in due course the heresies begat neo-orthodoxy. Down with the wholly identical and back to the wholly other. Back to Augustine, back to Martin Luther, back, in a word, to the two most relentlessly flagellated bottoms in the whole history of Christian thought. Read the Confessions, read the Table Talk. Augustine was beaten by his schoolmaster and laughed at by his parents when he complained. Luther was systematically flogged not only by his teachers and his father, but even by his loving mother. The world has been paying for the scars on his buttocks ever since. Prussianism and the Third Reich, without Luther and his flagellation theology these monstrosities could never have come into existence. Or take the flagellation theology of Augustine as carried to its logical conclusions by Calvin and swallowed whole by pious folk like James McPhail and Janet Cameron. Major premise, God is wholly other. Minor premise, men is totally depraved. Conclusion, do to your children's bottoms what was done to yours, what your heavenly father has been doing to the collective bottom of humanity ever since the fall. Whip, whip, whip. There was a silence. Will Farnaby looked again at the drawing of the granite person in the rope walk, and thought of all the grotesque and ugly fantasies promoted to the rank of supernatural facts, all the obscene cruelties inspired by those fantasies, all the pain inflicted and the miseries endured because of them? And when it wasn't Augustine with his benignant asperity, it was Robespierre, it was Stalin, when it wasn't Luther exhorting the princes to kill the peasants? It was a genial Mao reducing them to slavery. Don't you sometimes despair? He asked. Dr. MacPhail shook his head. We don't despair, he said, because we know that things don't necessarily have to be as bad as in fact they've always been. We know that they can be a great deal better, Suzla added. Know it because they already are a great deal better, here and now, on this absurd little island. But whether we shall be able to persuade you people to follow our example, or whether we shall even be able to preserve our tiny oasis of humanity in the midst of your worldwide wilderness of monkeys, that, alas, said Dr. McPhail, is another question. One's justified in feeling extremely pessimistic about the current situation. But despair, radical despair, no, I can't see any justification for that. Not even when you read history? not even when I read history. I envy you. How do you manage to do it? By remembering what history is, the record of what human beings have been impelled to do by their ignorance and the enormous bumptiousness that makes them canonize their ignorance as a political or religious dogma. He turned again to the album. Let's get back to the house in the Royal Burg, back to James and Janet, and the six children whom Calvin's God, in his inscrutable malevolence, 
had condemned to their tender mercies. The rod and reproof bring wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Indoctrination reinforced by psychological stress and physical torture, the perfect Pavlovian setup. But, unfortunately for organized religion and political dictatorship, human beings are much less reliable as laboratory animals than dogs. On Tom, Mary and Jean the conditioning worked as it was meant to work. Tom became a minister, and Mary married a minister and duly died in childbirth. Jean stayed at home, nursed her mother through a long grim cancer and for the next twenty years was slowly sacrificed to the aging and finally senile and driveling patriarch. So far, so good. But with Annie, the fourth child, the pattern changed. Annie was pretty. At eighteen she was proposed to by a captain of dragoons. But the captain was an Anglican and his views on total depravity and God's good pleasure were criminally incorrect. The marriage was forbidden. It looked as though Annie were predestined to share the fate of Jean. She stuck it out for ten years, then, at twenty-eight, she got herself seduced by the second mate of an East Indiaman. There were seven weeks of almost frantic happiness, the first she had ever known. Her face was transfigured by a kind of supernatural beauty, her body glowed with life. Then the Indiaman sailed for a two-year voyage for Madras and Macau. Four months later, pregnant, friendless and despairing, Annie threw herself into the day. Meanwhile Alexander, the next in line, had run away from school and joined a company of actors. In the house by the rope walk nobody, thenceforward, was ever allowed to refer to his existence. And finally there was Andrew, the youngest, the Benjamin. What a model child! He was obedient, he loved his lessons, he learned the epistles by heart faster and more accurately than any of the other children had done. Then, just in time to restore her faith in human wickedness, his mother caught him one evening playing with his genitals. He was whipped till the blood came, was caught again a few weeks later and again whipped, sentenced to solitary confinement on bread and water told that he had almost certainly committed the sin against the Holy Ghost and that it was undoubtedly on account of that sin that his mother had been afflicted with cancer. For the rest of his childhood Andrew was haunted by recurrent nightmares of hell. Haunted, too, by recurrent temptations and, when he succumbed to them, which of course he did, but always in the privacy of the latrine at the bottom of the garden, by yet more terrifying visions of the punishments in store for him. And to think, will Farnaby commented, to think that people complain about modern life having no meaning. Look at what life was like when it did have a meaning. A tale told by an idiot or a tale told by a Calvinist? Give me the idiot every time. Agreed, said Dr. McPhail. But mightn't there be a third possibility? Mightn't there be a tale told by somebody who is neither an imbecile nor a paranoic? Somebody, for a change? Completely sane, said Suzla. Yes, for a change, Dr. McPhail repeated. For a blessed change. And luckily, even under the old dispensation, there were always plenty of people whom even the most diabolic upbringing couldn't ruin. By all the rules of the Freudian and Pavlovian games, my great grandfather ought to have grown up to be a mental cripple. In fact, he grew up to be a mental athlete. Which only shows, Dr. Robert added parenthetically, how hopelessly inadequate your two highly touted systems of psychology really are. Feudism and behaviorism, poles apart but in complete agreement when it comes to the facts of the built-in, congenital differences between individuals. How do your pet psychologists deal with these facts? Very simply. They ignore them. They blandly pretend that the facts aren't there. Hence their complete inability to cope with the human situation as it really exists, or even to explain it theoretically. Look at what happened, for example, in this particular case. Andrew's brothers and sisters were either tamed by their conditioning or destroyed? Andrew was neither destroyed nor tamed. Why? Because the roulette wheel of heredity had stopped turning at a lucky number? He had a more resilient constitution than the others a different anatomy, different biochemistry and different temperament. 
his parents did their worst, as they had done with all the rest of their unfortunate brood. Andrew came through with flying colors, almost without a scar. In spite of the sin against the Holy Ghost, that, happily, was something he got rid of during his first year of medical studies at Edinburgh. He was only a boy, just over seventeen. They started young in those days, in the dissecting room the boy found himself listening to the extravagant obscenities and blasphemies with which his fellow students kept up their spirits among the slowly rotting cadavers. Listening at first with horror, with a sickening fear that God would surely take vengeance. But nothing happened. The blasphemers flourished. The loud-mouthed fornicators escaped with nothing worse than a dose, every now and then, of the clap. Fear gave place in Andrew's mind to a wonderful sense of relief and deliverance. Greatly daring, he began to risk a few ribald jokes of his own. His first utterance of a four-letter word, what a liberation, what a genuinely religious experience. And meanwhile, in his spare time, he read Tom Jones, he read Hume's essay on miracles, he read the infidel Gibbon. Putting the French he had learned at school to good account, he read La Metri, he read Dr. Cabanis. Man is a machine, the brain secretes thought as the liver secretes bile. How simple it all was, how luminously obvious. With all the fervor of a convert at a revival meeting, he decided for atheism. In the circumstances it was only to be expected. You can't stomach St. Augustine any more, you can't go on repeating the Athanasian rigmarole. So you pull the plug and send them down the drain. What bliss! But not for very long. Something, you discover, is missing. The experimental baby was flushed out with the theological dirt and soap suds. But nature abhors a vacuum. Bliss gives place to a chronic discomfort, and now you're afflicted, generation after generation, by a succession of Wesleys, Pisces, Moody St. Billies, Sunday and Graham, all working like beavers to pump the theology back out of the cesspool. They hope, of course, to recover the baby. But they never succeed. All that a revivalist can do is to siphon up a little of the dirty water. Which, in due course, has to be thrown out again. And so on, indefinitely. It's really too boring and, as Dr. Andrew came at last to realize, wholly unnecessary. Meanwhile here he was, in the first flush of his newfound freedom. Excited, exultant, but quietly excited, exultant behind that appearance of grave and courteous detachment which he habitually presented to the world. What about his father? Will asked. Did they have a battle? No battle. Andrew didn't like battles. He was the sort of man who always goes his own way, but doesn't advertise the fact, doesn't argue with people who prefer another road. The old man was never given the opportunity of putting on his Jeremiah act. Andrew kept his mouth shut about human laometry and went through the traditional motions. But when his training was finished, he just didn't come home. Instead, he went to London and signed up, as surgeon and naturalist, on HMS Melampus, bound for the South Seas with orders to chart, survey, collect specimens and protect Protestant missionaries and British interests. The cruise of the Melampus lasted for a full three years. They called at Tahiti, they spent two months on Samoa and a month in the Marquesas group. After birth, the islands seemed like Eden but an Eden innocent unfortunately not only of Calvinism and capitalism and industrial slums, but also of Shakespeare and Mozart, also of scientific knowledge and logical thinking. It was paradise, but it wouldn't do, it wouldn't do. They sailed on. They visited Fiji and the Carolines and the Solomons. They charted the northern coast of New Guinea and, in Borneo, a party went ashore trapped a pregnant orangutan and climbed to the top of Mount Kinabalu. Then followed a week at Pan A, a fortnight in the Megi Archipelago, after which they headed west to the Andamans and from the Andamans to the mainland of India. While ashore, my great-grandfather was thrown from his horse and broke his right leg. The captain of the Melampus found another surgeon and sailed for home. Two months later, as good as new, 
Andrew was practicing medicine at Madras. Doctors were scarce in those days and sickness fearfully common. The young man began to prosper. But life among the merchants and officials of the presidency was oppressively boring. It was an exile, but an exile without any of the compensations of exile, an exile without adventure or strangeness, a banishment merely to the provinces, to the tropical equivalent of Swansea or Huddersfield. But still he resisted the temptation to book a passage on the next homebound ship. If he stuck it out for five years, he would have enough money to buy a good practice in Edinburgh, no, in London, in the West End. The future beckoned, rosy and golden. There would be a wife, preferably with auburn hair and a modest competence. There would be four or five children, happy, unwhipped and atheistic. And his practice would grow, his patients would be drawn from circles ever more exalted. Wealth, reputation, dignity, even a knighthood. Sir Andrew MacPhail stepping out of his brougham in Belgrave Square. The great Sir Andrew, physician to the Queen, summoned to St. Petersburg to operate on the Grand Duke, to the Tuileries, to the Vatican, to the sublime Porti. Delightful fantasies. But the facts, as it turned out, were to be far more interesting. One fine morning a brown-skinned stranger called at the surgery. In halting English he gave an account of himself. He was from Pala and had been commanded by His Highness, the Raja, to seek out and bring back with him a skillful surgeon from the West. The rewards would be princely. Princely, he insisted. There and then Dr. Andrew accepted the invitation. Partly, of course, for the money, but mostly because he was bored, because he needed a change, needed a taste of adventure. A trip to the Forbidden Island, the Leo was irresistible. And remember, Suzlo interjected, in those days Pala was much more forbidden than it is now. So you can imagine how eagerly young Dr. Andrew jumped at the opportunity now offered by the Raja's ambassador. Ten days later his ship dropped anchor off the north coast of the Forbidden Island. With his medicine chest, his bag of instruments, and a small tin trunk containing his clothes and a few indispensable books, he was rowed in an outrigger canoe through the pounding surf, carried in a palanquin through the streets of Shivapuram and set down in the inner courtyard of the royal palace. His royal patient was eagerly awaiting him. Without being given time to shave or change his clothes, Dr. Andrew was ushered into the presence, the pitiable presence of a small brown man in his early forties, terribly emaciated under his rich brocades, his face so swollen and distorted as to be barely human, his voice reduced to a hoarse whisper. Dr. Andrew examined him. From the maxillary antrum, where it had its roots, a tumor had spread in all directions. It had filled the nose, it had pushed up into the socket of the right eye, it had half blocked the throat. Breathing had become difficult, swallowing acutely painful and sleep an impossibility, for whenever he dropped off, the patient would choke and wake up frantically struggling for air. Without radical surgery, it was obvious, the Raja would be dead within a couple of months. With radical surgery, much sooner. Those were the good old days, remember, the good old days of septic operations without benefit of chloroform. Even in the most favorable circumstances surgery was fatal to one patient out of four. Where conditions were less propitious, the odds declined, 50-50, 30 to 70, 0 to 100. In the present case the prognosis could hardly have been worse. The patient was already weak and the operation would be long, difficult and excruciatingly painful. There was a good chance that he would die on the operating table and a virtual certainty that, if he survived, it would only be to die a few days later of blood poisoning. But if he should die, Dr. Andrew now reflected, what would be the fate of the alien surgeon who had killed a king? And, during the operation, who would hold the royal patient down while he writhed under the knife? Which of his servants or courtiers would have the strength of mind to disobey, when the master screamed in agony or positively commanded them to let him go? Perhaps the wisest thing would be to say, here and now, that the case was hopeless that he could do nothing, and ask to be sent back to Madras forthwith. 
Then he looked again at the sick man. Through the grotesque mask of his poor deformed face the Raja was looking at him intently, looking with the eyes of a condemned criminal begging the judge for mercy. Touched by the appeal, Dr. Andrew gave him a smile of encouragement and all at once, as he patted the thin hand, he had an idea. It was absurd, crack-brained, thoroughly discreditable, but all the same, all the same. Five years before, he suddenly remembered, while he was still at Edinburgh, there had been an article in the Lancet, an article denouncing the notorious Professor Eliotson for his advocacy of animal magnetism. Eliotson had had the effrontery to talk of painless operations performed on patients in the mesmeric trance. The man was either a gullible fool or an unscrupulous knave. The so-called evidence for such nonsense was manifestly worthless. It was all sheer humbug, quackery, downright fraud, and so on for six columns of righteous indignation. At the time, for he was still full of laometry and human companies. Dr. Andrew had read the article with a glow of orthodox approval. After which he had forgotten about the very existence of animal magnetism. Now, at the Raja's bedside, it all came back to him, the mad professor, the magnetic passes, the amputations without pain, the low death rate and the rapid recoveries. Perhaps, after all, there might be something in it. He was deep in these thoughts when, breaking a long silence, the sick man spoke to him. From a young sailor who had deserted his ship at Rendang Lobo and somehow made his way across the strait, the Raja had learned to speak English with remarkable fluency, but also, in faithful imitation of his teacher, with a strong Cockney accent. That Cockney accent, Dr. MacPhail repeated with a little laugh. It turns up again and again in my great-grandfather's memoirs. There was something to him, inexpressibly improper about a king who spoke like Sam Weller. And in this case the impropriety was more than merely social. Besides being a king, the Raja was a man of intellect and the most exquisite refinement, a man, not only of deep religious convictions, any crude oaf can have deep religious convictions, but also of deep religious experience and spiritual insight. That such a man should express himself in Cockney was something that an early Victorian Scotsman who had read the Pickwick papers could never get over. Nor, in spite of all my great-grandfather's tactful coaching, could the Raju ever get over his impure diphthongs and dropped H's. But all that was in the future. At their first tragic meeting, that shocking, lower-class accent seemed strangely touching. Laying the palms of his hands together in a gesture of supplication, the sick man whispered, Help me, Dr. McPhile, help me. The appeal was decisive. Without any further hesitation, Dr. Andrew took the Raja's thin hands between his own and began to speak in the most confident tone about a wonderful new treatment recently discovered in Europe and employed as yet by only a handful of the most eminent physicians. Then, Turning to the attendants who had been hovering all this time in the background, he ordered them out of the room. They did not understand the words, but his tone and accompanying gestures were unmistakably clear. They bowed and withdrew. Dr. Andrew took off his coat, rolled up his shirt sleeves and started to make those famous magnetic passes, about which he had read with so much skeptical amusement in the Lancet. From the crown of the head, over the face and down the trunk to the epigastrium, again and again until the patient falls into a trance, or until, he remembered the derisive comments of the anonymous writer of the article, until the presiding charlatan shall choose to say that his dupe is now under the magnetic influence. Quackery, humbug and fraud. But all the same, all the same dot he worked away in silence. Twenty passes, fifty passes. The sick man sighed and closed his eyes. Sixty, eighty, a hundred, a hundred and twenty. The heat was stifling, Dr. Andrew's shirt was drenched with sweat, and his arms ached. Grimly he repeated the same absurd gesture. A hundred and fifty, a hundred and seventy-five, two hundred. It was all fraud and humbug, but all the same he was determined to make this poor devil go to sleep even if it took him the whole day to do it. You are going to sleep, he said aloud as he made the 211th pass. 
you are going to sleep. The sick man seemed to sink more deeply into his pillows, and suddenly Dr. Andrew caught the sound of a rattling wheeze. This time, he added quickly, you are not going to choke. There's plenty of room for the air to pass, and you're not going to choke. The Raja's breathing grew quiet. Dr. Andrew made a few more passes, then decided that it would be safe to take a rest. He mopped his face, then rose, stretched his arms and took a couple of turns up and down the room. Sitting down again by the bed, he took one of the Raja's stick-like wrists and felt for the pulse. An hour before it had been running at almost a hundred, now the rate had fallen to seventy. He raised the arm, the hand hung limp like a dead man's. He let go, and the arm dropped by its own weight and lay, inert and unmoving, where it had fallen. Your Highness, he said, and again, more loudly, Your Highness. There was no answer. It was all quackery, humbug and fraud, but all the same it worked, it obviously worked. A large, brightly colored mantis fluttered down onto the rail at the foot of the bed, folded its pink and white wings, raised its small flat head, and stretched out its incredibly muscular front legs in the attitude of prayer. Dr. McPhail pulled out a magnifying glass and bent forward to examine it. Gongless gongloyites, he pronounced. It dresses itself up to look like a flower. When unwary flies and moths come sailing in to sip the nectar, it sips them. And if it's a female, she eats her lovers. He put the glass away and leaned back in his chair. What one likes most about the universe, he said to Wolf Arnaby, is its wild improbability. Gongless gongloyites, homo sapiens, my great grandfather's introduction to pallor and hypnosis. What could be more unlikely? Nothing, said Will. Except perhaps my introduction to pallor and hypnosis, pallor via a shipwreck and a precipice, hypnosis by way of a soliloquy about an English cathedral. Susla laughed. Fortunately I didn't have to make all those passes over you. In this climate, I really admire Dr. Andrew. It sometimes takes three hours to anesthetize a person with the passes. But in the end he succeeded. Triumphantly. And did he actually perform the operation? Yes, he actually performed the operation, said Dr. McPhail. But not immediately. There had to be a long preparation. Dr. Andrew began by telling his patient that henceforward he would be able to swallow without pain. Then, for the next three weeks, he fed him up and between meals he put him into trance and kept him asleep until it was time for another feeding. It's wonderful what your body will do for you if you only give it a chance. The Raja gained twelve pounds and felt like a new man. A new man full of new hope and confidence. He knew he was going to come through his ordeal. And so, incidentally, did Dr. Andrew. In the process of fortifying the Raja's faith he had fortified his own. It was not a blind faith. The operation, he felt quite certain, was going to be successful. But this unshakable confidence did not prevent him from doing everything that might contribute to its success. Very early in the proceedings he started to work on the trance. The trance, he kept telling his patient, was becoming deeper every day, and on the day of the operation it would be much deeper than it had ever been before. It would also last longer. You'll sleep, he assured the Raja, for four full hours after the operation's over, and when you awake, you won't feel the slightest pain. Dr. Andrew made these affirmations with a mixture of total skepticism and complete confidence. Reason and past experience assured him that all this was impossible. But in the present context past experience had proved to be irrelevant. The impossible had already happened, several times. There was no reason why it shouldn't happen again. The important thing was to say that it would happen, so he said it, again and again. All this was good, but better still was Dr. Andrew's invention of the rehearsal. Rehearsal of what? Of the surgery. They ran through the procedure half a dozen times. The last rehearsal was on the morning of the operation. At six, Dr. Andrew came to the Raja's room and, after a little cheerful talk, 
began to make the passes. In a few minutes the patient was in deep trance. Stage by stage, Dr. Andrew described what he was going to do. Touching the cheekbone near the Raja's right eye, he said, I begin by stretching the skin. And now with this scalpel, and he drew the tip of a pencil across the cheek, I make an incision. You feel no pain, of course, not even the slightest discomfort. And now the underlying tissues are being cut and you still feel nothing at all. You just lie there, comfortably asleep, while I dissect the cheek back to the nose. Every now and then I stop to tie a blood vessel, then I go on again. And when that part of the work is done, I'm ready to start on the tumor. It has its roots there in the antrum and it has grown upwards, under the cheekbone, into the eye socket, and downwards into the gullet. And as I cut it loose, you lie there as before, feeling nothing, perfectly comfortable, completely relaxed. And now am I lift your head. Suiting his action to the words, he lifted the Raja's head and bent it forward on the limp neck. I lift it and bend it so that you can get rid of the blood that's run down into your mouth and throat. Some of the blood has got into your windpipe, and you cough a little to get rid of it, but it doesn't wake you. The Raja coughed once or twice, then, when Dr. Andrew released his hold, dropped back onto the pillows, still fast asleep. And you don't choke even when I work on the lower end of the tumor in your gullet. Dr. Andrew opened the Raja's mouth and thrust two fingers down his throat. It's just a question of pulling it loose, that's all. Nothing in that to make you choke. And if you have to cough up the blood, you can do it in your sleep. Yes, in your sleep, in this deep, deep sleep. That was the end of the rehearsal. Ten minutes later, after making some more passes and telling his patient to sleep still more deeply, Dr. Andrew began the operation. He stretched the skin, he made the incision, he dissected the cheek, he cut the tumor away from its roots in the antrum. The Raja lay there perfectly relaxed. His pulse firm and steady at 75, feeling no more pain than he had felt during the make-believe of the rehearsal. Dr. Andrew worked on the throat, there was no choking. The blood flowed into the windpipe, the Raja coughed but did not awake. Four hours after the operation was over, he was still sleeping, then, punctual to the minute, he opened his eyes, smiled at Dr. Andrew between his bandages and asked, in his sing-song cockney, when the operation was to start. After a feeding and a sponging, he was given some more passes and told to sleep for four more hours and to get well quickly. Dr. Andrew kept it up for a full week. Sixteen hours of trance each day. 8 of waking. The Raja suffered almost no pain and, in spite of the thoroughly septic conditions under which the operation had been performed and the dressings renewed, the wounds healed without suppuration. Remembering the horrors he had witnessed in the Edinburgh infirmary, the yet more frightful horrors of the surgical wards at Madras, Dr. Andrew could hardly believe his eyes. And now he was given another opportunity to prove to himself what animal magnetism could do. The Raja's eldest daughter was in the ninth month of her first pregnancy. Impressed by what he had done for her husband, the Rani sent for Dr. Andrew. He found her sitting with a frail frightened girl of sixteen, who knew just enough broken cockney to be able to tell him she was going to die, she and her baby too. Three blackbirds had confirmed it by flying on three successive days across her path. Dr. Andrew did not try to argue with her. Instead, he asked her to lie down, then started to make the passes. Twenty minutes later the girl was in a deep trance. In his country, Dr. Andrew now assured her, black birds were lucky, a presage of birth and joy. She would bear her child easily and without pain. Yes, with no more pain than her father had felt during his operation. No pain at all, he promised, no pain whatsoever. Three days later, and after three or four more hours of intensive suggestion, it all came true. When the Raja woke up for his evening meal, he found his wife sitting by his bed. We have a grander son, she said, and our daughter is well. Dr. Andrew has said that tomorrow you may be carried to her room, to give them both your blessing. 
At the end of a month the Raja dissolved the Council of Regency and resumed his royal powers. Resumed them, in gratitude to the man who had saved his life and, the Rani was convinced of it, his daughter's life as well, with Dr. Andrew as his chief advisor. So he didn't go back to Madras? Not to Madras. Not even to London. He stayed here in Pala. Trying to change the Raja's accent. And trying, rather more successfully, to change the Raja's kingdom. Into what? That was a question he couldn't have answered. In those early days he had no plan, only a set of likes and dislikes. There were things about Pala that he liked, and plenty of others that he didn't like at all. Things about Europe that he detested, and things he passionately approved of. Things he had seen on his travels that seemed to make good sense, and things that filled him with disgust. People, he was beginning to understand, are at once the beneficiaries and the victims of their culture. It brings them to flower, but it also nips them in the bud or plants a canker at the heart of the blossom. Might it not be possible, on this forbidden island, to avoid the cankers? minimize the nippings, and make the individual blooms more beautiful? That was the question to which, implicitly at first, then with a growing awareness of what they were really up to, Dr. Andrew and the Raja were trying to find an answer. And did they find an answer? Looking back, said Dr. McPhail, one's amazed by what those two men accomplished. The Scottish doctor and the Palinese king, the Galvinist turned atheist and the pious Mahayana Buddhist, what a strangely assorted pair. But a pair, very soon, of firm friends, a pair, moreover, of complementary temperaments and talents, with complementary philosophies and complementary stocks of knowledge, each man supplying the other's deficiencies, each stimulating and fortifying the other's native capacities. The Rajas was an acute and subtle mind but he knew nothing of the world beyond the confines of his island, nothing of physical science, nothing of European technology, European art, European ways of thinking. No less intelligent, Dr. Andrew knew nothing, of course, about Indian painting and poetry and philosophy. He also knew nothing, as he gradually discovered, about the science of the human mind and the art of living. In the months that followed the operation each became the other's pupil and the other's teacher. And of course that was only a beginning. They were not merely private citizens concerned with their private improvement. The Raja had a million subjects and Dr. Andrew was virtually his prime minister. Private improvement was to be the preliminary to public improvement. If the king and the doctor were now teaching one another to make the best of both worlds, the Oriental and the European, the ancient and the modern, it was in order to help the whole nation to do the same. To make the best of both worlds, what am I saying? To make the best of all the worlds, the worlds already realized within the various cultures and, beyond them, the worlds of still unrealized potentialities. It was an enormous ambition, an ambition totally impossible of fulfillment, but at least it had the merit of spurring them on of making them rush in where angels feared to tread, with results that sometimes proved, to everybody's astonishment, that they had not been quite such fools as they looked. They never succeeded, of course, in making the best of all the worlds, but by dint of boldly trying they made the best of many more worlds than any merely prudent or sensible person would have dreamed of being able to reconcile and combine. If the fool would persist in his folly, will quote it from the proverbs of hell, he would become wise. Precisely, Dr. Robert agreed. And the most extravagant folly of all is the folly described by Blake, the folly that the Raja and Dr. Andrew were now contemplating. The enormous folly of trying to make a marriage between hell and heaven. But if you persist in that enormous folly, what an enormous reward. Provided, of course, that you persist intelligently. Stupid fools get nowhere, it's only the knowledgeable and clever ones whose folly can make them wise or produce good results. Fortunately these two fools were clever. Clever enough, for example, to embark on their folly in a modest and appealing way. They began with pain relievers. The Palanis were Buddhists. They knew how misery is related to mind. You cling, you crave, you assert yourself, 
and you live in a homemade hell. You become detached, and you live in peace. I show you sorrow, the Buddha had said, and I show you the ending of sorrow. Well, here was Dr. Andrew with a special kind of mental detachment which would put an end at least to one kind of sorrow, namely, physical pain. With the Raja himself or, for the women, the Rani and her daughter acting as interpreters, Dr. Andrew gave lessons in his newfound art to groups of midwives and physicians, of teachers, mothers, invalids, painless childbirth, and forthwith all the women of Pala were enthusiastically on the side of the innovators. Painless operations for stone and cataract and hemorrhoids, and they had won the approval of all the old and the ailing. At one stroke more than half the adult population became their allies, prejudiced in their favor, friendly in advance, or at least open-minded, toward the next reform. Where did they go from pain? Will asked. To agriculture and language. To bread and communication. They got a man out from England to establish Rothamsted in the tropics, and they set to work to give the Palanese a second language. Pala was to remain a forbidden island, for Dr. Andrew wholeheartedly agreed with the Raja that missionaries, planters and traders were far too dangerous to be tolerated. But, while the foreign subversives must not be allowed to come in, the natives must somehow be helped to get out, if not physically, at least with their minds. But their language and their archaic version of the Brahmi alphabet were a prison without windows. There could be no escape for them no glimpse of the outside world until they had learned English and could read the Latin script. Among the courtiers, the Raja's linguistic accomplishments had already set a fashion. Ladies and gentlemen larded their conversation with scraps of Cockney, and some of them had even sent to Salon for English-speaking tutors. What had been a mode was now transformed into a policy. English schools were set up and a staff of Bengali printers, with their presses and their fonts of Castellon and Bodney, were imported from Calcutta. The first English book to be published at Shivapuram was a selection from the Arabian Nights, the second, a translation of the Diamond Sutra, hitherto available only in Sanskrit and in manuscript. For those who wished to read about Sindbad and Murph, and for those who were interested in the wisdom of the other shore, there were now two cogent reasons for learning English. That was the beginning of the long educational process that turned us at last into a bilingual people. We speak Palanese when we're cooking, when we're telling funny stories, when we're talking about love or making it. Incidentally, we have the richest erotic and sentimental vocabulary in Southeast Asia, but when it comes to business, or science, or speculative philosophy, we generally speak English and most of us prefer to write in English. Every writer needs a literature as his frame of reference, a set of models to conform to or depart from. Pala had good painting and sculpture, splendid architecture, wonderful dancing, subtle and expressive music, but no real literature, no national poets or dramatists or storytellers. Just bards reciting Buddhist and Hindu myths just a lot of monks preaching sermons and splitting metaphysical hairs. Adopting English as our stepmother tongue, we gave ourselves a literature with one of the longest pasts and certainly the widest of presents. We gave ourselves a background, a spiritual yardstick, a repertory of styles and techniques, an inexhaustible source of inspiration. In a word, we gave ourselves the possibility of being creative in a field where we had never been creative before. Thanks to the Raja and my great-grandfather, there's an Anglo-Palanese literature, of which, I may add, Susla here is a contemporary light. On the dim side, she protested. Dr. MacPhail shut his eyes, and, smiling to himself, began to recite, Thus gone to thus gone, I with a Buddha's hand offer the unplucked flower, the frog's soliloquy among the lotus leaves the milk-smeared mouth at my full breast and love and, like the cloudless sky that makes possible mountains and setting moon, this emptiness that is the womb of love this poetry of silence. He opened his eyes again. And not only this poetry of silence, he said. This science, this philosophy, this theology of silence. And now it's high time you went to sleep.
he rose and moved towards the door. I'll go and get you a glass of fruit juice. Nine patriotism is not enough. But neither is anything else. Science is not enough, religion is not enough, art is not enough, politics and economics are not enough, nor is love, nor is duty, nor is action however disinterested, nor, however sublime, is contemplation. Nothing short of everything will really do. Attention! shouted a far away bird. Dot will looked at his watch. 5 to 12. He closed his notes on what's what and picking up the bamboo alpenstock which had once belonged to Dugald MacPhail, he set out to keep his appointment with Vigil and Dr. Robert. By the shortcut the main building of the experimental station was less than a quarter of a mile from Dr. Robert's bungalow. But the day was oppressively hot, and there were two flights of steps to be negotiated. For a convalescent with his right leg in a splint, it was a considerable journey. Slowly, painfully, Will made his way along the winding path and up the steps. At the top of the second flight, he halted to take breath and mop his forehead, then, keeping close to the wall, where there was still a narrow strip of shade, he moved on towards a signboard marked Laboratory. The door beneath the board was ajar, he pushed it open and found himself on the threshold of a long, high ceilinged room. There were the usual sinks and work tables, the usual glass fronted cabinets full of bottles and equipment, the usual smells of chemicals and caged mice. For the first moment Will was under the impression that the room was untenanted, but no, almost hidden from view by a bookcase that projected at right angles from the wall, young Murugan was seated at a table, intently reading. As quietly as he could, for it was always amusing to take people by surprise, Will advanced into the room. The whirring of an electric fan covered the sound of his approach, and it was not until he was within a few feet of the bookcase that Murugan became aware of his presence. The boy started guiltily, shoved his book with panic haste into a leather briefcase and, reaching for another, smaller volume that lay open on the table beside the briefcase, drew it within reading range. Only then did he turn to face the intruder. Will gave him a reassuring smile. It's only me. The look of angry defiance gave place, on the boy's face, to one of relief. I thought it was. He broke off, leaving the sentence unfinished. You thought it was someone who would bawl you out for not doing what you're supposed to do, is that it? Merugan grinned and nodded his curly head. Where's everyone else? Will asked. They're out in the fields, pruning or pollinating or something. His tone was contemptuous. And so, the cats being away. The mouse duly played. What were you studying so passionately? With innocent disingenuousness, Murugan held up the book he was now pretending to read. It's called Elementary Ecology, he said. So I see, said Will. But what I asked you was what were you reading? Oh, that. Murugan shrugged his shoulders. You wouldn't be interested. I'm interested in everything that anyone tries to hide, Will assured him. Was it pornography? Murugan dropped his play acting and looked genuinely offended. Who do you take me for? Will was on the point of saying that he took him for an average boy, but checked himself. To Colonel Deeper's pretty young friend, average boy might sound like an insult or an innuendo. Instead he bowed with mock politeness. I beg your majesty's pardon, he said. But I'm still curious, he added in another tone. May I? He laid a hand on the bulging briefcase. Murugan hesitated for a moment, then forced to laugh. Go ahead. What a tome. Will pulled the ponderous volume out of the bag and laid it on the table. Sears, Roebuck and Go, he read aloud, Spring and Summer Catalogue. It's last years, said Murugan apologetically. But I don't suppose there's been much change since then. There, Will assured him, you're mistaken. If the styles weren't completely changed every year, there'd be no reason for buying new things before the old ones are worn out. You don't understand the first principles of modern consumerism. He opened at random. Soft platform wedges in wide widths. 
opened at another place and found the description and image of a whisper pink bra in Dacron and Pima cotton. Turn the page and here, memento mori, was what the bra bio would be wearing twenty years later, a strap controlled front, cupped to support Benjulus abdomen. It doesn't get really interesting, said Murugan, until near the end of the book. It has 1358 pages, he added parenthetically. Imagine. 1358. We'll skip the next 750 pages. Ah, this is more like it, he said. Our famous point two two revolvers and automatics. And here, a little further on, were the fiberglass boats, here were the high thrust inboard engines, here was a 12 horsepower outboard for only $234.95 and the fuel tank was included. That's extraordinarily generous. But Murugan, it was evident, was no sailor. Taking the book, he leafed impatiently through a score of additional pages. Look at this Italian-style motor scooter. And while we looked, Murugan read aloud. This sleek speedster gives up to 110 miles per gallon of fuel. Just imagine. His normally sulky face was glowing with enthusiasm and you can get up to 60 miles per gallon even on this 14.5 horsepower motorcycle. And it's guaranteed to do 75 miles an hour, guaranteed. Remarkable. Said Will. Then, curiously, did somebody in America send you this glorious book? He asked. Murug and shook his head. Colonel Deeper gave it to me. Colonel Deeper. What an odd kind of present from Hadrian to Antinous. He looked again at the picture of the motorbike, then back at Murugan's glowing face. Light dawned, the colonel's purpose revealed itself. The serpent tempted me, and I did eat. The tree in the midst of the garden was called the tree of consumer goods, and to the inhabitants of every underdeveloped Eden the tiniest taste of its fruit, and even the sight of its 1358 leaves, had power to bring the shameful knowledge that, industrially speaking, they were stark naked. The future Raja of Pala was being made to realize that he was no more than the untrousered ruler of a tribe of savages. You ought, Will said aloud, to import a million of these catalogues and distribute them, gratis, of course, like contraceptives, to all your subjects. What for? To whet their appetite for possessions. Then they'll start clamoring for progress, oil wells, armaments. Joe Aldehyde, Soviet technicians. Merugan frowned and shook his head. It wouldn't work. You mean, they wouldn't be tempted? Not even by sleek speedsters and whisper pink bras. But that's incredible. It may be incredible, said Merugan bitterly, but it's a fact. They're just not interested. Not even the young ones? I'd say especially the young ones. Will Farnaby pricked up his ears? This lack of interest was profoundly interesting. Can you guess why? He asked. I don't guess, the boy answered. I know. And as though he had suddenly decided to stage a parody of his mother, he began to speak in a tone of righteous indignation that was absurdly out of keeping with his age and appearance. To begin with, they're much too busy with. He hesitated, then the abhorred word was hissed out with a disgustful emphasis with sex. But everybody's busy with sex. Which doesn't keep them from whoring after sleek speedsters. Sex is different here, Murugan insisted. Because of the yoga of love? Will asked, remembering the little nurse's rapturous face. The boy nodded. They've got something that makes them think they're perfectly happy, and they don't want anything else. What a blessed state. There's nothing blessed about it, Murugan snapped. It's just stupid and disgusting. No progress, only sex, sex, sex. And of course that beastly dope they're all given. Dope? Will repeated in some astonishment. Dope in a place where Suzla had said there were no addicts. What kind of dope? It's made out of toadstools. Toadstools? He spoke in a comical caricature of the Rani's vibrant tone of outraged spirituality. Those lovely red toadstools that gnomes used to sit on? No, these are yellow. 
people used to go out and collect them in the mountains. Nowadays the things are grown in special fungus beds at the high altitude experimental station. Scientifically cultivated dope. Pretty, isn't it? A door slammed and there was a sound of voices, of footsteps approaching along a corridor. Abruptly, the indignant spirit of the Rani took flight, and Murugan was once again the conscience-stricken schoolboy furtively trying to cover up his delinquencies. In a trice elementary ecology had taken the place of Sears, Roebuck, and the suspiciously bulging briefcase was under the table. A moment later, stripped to the waist and shining like oiled bronze with the sweat of labor in the noonday sun, Vijaya came striding into the room. Behind him came Dr. Robert, with the air of a model student, interrupted in the midst of his reading by trespassers from the frivolous outside world, Murugan looked up from his book. Amused, Will threw himself at once wholeheartedly into the part that had been assigned to him. It was I who got here too early, he said in response to Vijaya's apologies for their being so late. With the result that our young friend here hasn't been able to get on with his lessons. We've been talking our heads off. What about? Dr. Robert asked. Everything. Cabbages, kings, motor scooters, pendulous abdomens. And when you came in, we just embarked on toad's tools. Merugan was telling me about the fungi that are used here as a source of dope. What's in a name? said Dr. Robert, with a laugh. Answer, practically everything. Having had the misfortune to be brought up in Europe, Merugan calls it dope and feels about it all the disapproval that, by conditioned reflex, the dirty word evokes. We, on the contrary, give the stuff good names, the mockshaw medicine, the reality revealer, the truth and beauty pill. And we know, by direct experience, that the good names are deserved. Whereas our young friend here has no first hand knowledge of the stuff and can't be persuaded even to give it a try. For him, it's dope and dope is something that, by definition, no decent person ever indulges in. What does His Highness say to that? Will asked Dot Merug and shook his head. All it gives you is a lot of illusions, he muttered. Why should I go out of my way to be made a fool of? Why indeed? said Vijaya with good humored irony. Seeing that, in your normal condition, you alone of the human race are never made a fool of and never have illusions about anything. I never said that, Merugan protested. All I mean is that I don't want any of your false say, Maddy. How do you know it's false? Dr. Robert inquired. Because the real thing only comes to people after years and years of meditation and tapas and dot well, you know, not going with women. Murugan, Vijaya explained to Will, is one of the Puritans. He's outraged by the fact that, with 400 milligrams of mockshaw medicine in their blood streams, even beginners, yes, and even boys and girls who make love together, can catch a glimpse of the world as it looks to someone who has been liberated from his bondage to the ego. But it isn't real, Murugan insisted. Not real. Dr. Robert repeated. You might as well say that the experience of feeling well isn't real. You're begging the question, Will objected. An experience can be real in relation to something going on inside your skull but completely irrelevant to anything outside. Of course, Dr. Robert agreed. Do you know what goes on inside your skull, when you've taken a dose of the mushroom? We know a little. And we're trying all the time to find out more, Vijaya added. For example, said Dr. Robert, we've found that the people whose egg doesn't show any alpha wave activity when they're relaxed aren't likely to respond significantly to the mockshaw medicine. That means that, for about 15% of the population, we have to find other approaches to liberation. Another thing we're just beginning to understand, said Vijaya, is the neurological correlate of these experiences. What's happening in the brain when you're having a vision? And what's happening when you pass from a pre-mystical to a genuinely mystical state of mind? Do you know? Will asked. No is a big word. Let's say we're in a position to make some plausible guesses. 
angels and new Jerusalems and Madonnas and future Buddhas. They're all related to some kind of unusual stimulation of the brain areas of primary projection, the visual cortex, for example. Just how the moksha medicine produces those unusual stimuli we haven't yet found out. The important fact is that, somehow or other, it does produce them. And somehow or other, it also does something unusual to the silent areas of the brain, the areas not specifically concerned with perceiving, or moving or feeling. And how do the silent areas respond? Will inquired. Let's start with what they don't respond with. They don't respond with visions or auditions, they don't respond with telepathy or clairvoyance or any other kind of parapsychological performance. None of that amusing pre-mystical stuff. Their response is the full-blown mystical experience. You know, one in all and all in one. The basic experience with its corollaries boundless compassion, fathomless mystery and meaning. Not to mention joy, said Dr. Robert, inexpressible joy. And the whole caboodle is inside your skull, said Will. Strictly private. No reference to any external fact except a toadstool. Not real, Murugan chimed in. That's exactly what I was trying to say. You're assuming, said Dr. Robert that the brain produces consciousness. I'm assuming that it transmits consciousness. And my explanation is no more far-fetched than yours. How on earth can a set of events belonging to one order be experienced as a set of events belonging to an entirely different and incommensurable order? Nobody has the faintest idea. All one can do is to accept the facts and concoct hypotheses. And one hypothesis is just about as good philosophically speaking, as another. You say that the moksha medicine does something to the silent areas of the brain which causes them to produce a set of subjective events to which people have given the name mystical experience. I say that the moksha medicine does something to the silent areas of the brain which opens some kind of neurological sluice and so allows a larger volume of mind with a large M to flow into your mind with a small M. You can't demonstrate the truth of your hypothesis, and I can't demonstrate the truth of mine. And even if you could prove that I'm wrong, would it make any practical difference? I'd have thought it would make all the difference, said Will. Do you like music? Dr. Robert asked. More than most things. And what, may I ask, does Mozart's G minor quintet refer to? Does it refer to Allah? Or Tau? or the second person of the trinity? Or the Atman Brahman? Will laughed. Let's hope not. But that doesn't make the experience of the G minor quintet any less rewarding. Well, it's the same with the kind of experience that you get with the moksha medicine, or through prayer and fasting and spiritual exercises. Even if it doesn't refer to anything outside itself, it's still the most important thing that ever happened to you. Like music, only incomparably more so. And if you give the experience a chance, if you're prepared to go along with it, the results are incomparably more therapeutic and transforming. So maybe the whole thing does happen inside one's skull. Maybe it is private and there's no unit of knowledge of anything but one's own physiology. Who cares? The fact remains that the experience can open one's eyes and make one blessed and transform one's whole life. There was a long silence. Let me tell you something, he resumed, turning to Murugan. Something I hadn't intended to talk about to anybody. But now I feel that perhaps I have a duty, a duty to the throne, a duty to Pala and all its people, an obligation to tell you about this very private experience. Perhaps the telling may help you to be a little more understanding about your country and its ways. He was silent for a moment, then in a quietly matter-of-fact tone, I suppose you know about my wife, he went on. His face still averted, Murugan nodded. I was sorry, he mumbled, to hear she was so ill. It's a matter of a few days now, said Dr. Robert. Four or five at the most. But she's still perfectly lucid perfectly conscious of what's happening to her. Yesterday she asked me if we could take the Moksha medicine together. We'd taken it together, he added parenthetically, 
once or twice each year for the last 37 years, ever since we decided to get married. And now once more, for the last time, the last, last time. There was a risk involved, because of the damage to the liver. But we decided it was a risk worth taking. And as it turned out, we were right. The Mokshaw medicine, the dope, as you prefer to call it, hardly upset her at all. All that happened to her was the mental transformation. He was silent, and Will suddenly became aware of the squeak and scrabble of caged rats and, through the open window, the babel of tropical life and the call of a distant minor bird. Here and now, boys. Here and now. You're like that minor, said Dr. Robert at last. Trained to repeat words you don't understand or know the reason for, it isn't real. It isn't real. But if you'd experienced what Lakshmi and I went through yesterday you'd know better. You'd know it was much more real than what you call reality. More real than what you're thinking and feeling at this moment. More real than the world before your eyes. But not real is what you've been taught to say. Not real, not real. Dr. Robert laid a hand affectionately on the boy's shoulder. You've been told that we're just a set of self-indulgent dope takers, wallowing in illusions and false say madis. Listen, Merugan, forget all the bad language that's been pumped into you. Forget it at least to the point of making a single experiment. Take 400 milligrams of Mokshaw medicine and find out for yourself what it does, what it can tell you about your own nature about this strange world you've got to live in, learn in, suffer in, and finally die in. Yes, even you will have to die one day, maybe fifty years from now, maybe tomorrow. Who knows? But it's going to happen, and one's a fool if one doesn't prepare for it. He turned to Will. Would you like to come along while we take our shower and get into some clothes? Without waiting for an answer. He walked out through the door that led into that central corridor of the long building. Will picked up his bamboo staff and, accompanied by Vajaya, followed him out of the room. Do you suppose that made any impression on Murugan? He asked Vijaya when the door had closed behind them. Vijaya shrugged his shoulders. I doubt it. What with his mother, said Will, and his passion for internal combustion engines, He's probably impervious to anything you people can say. You should have heard him on the subject of motor scooters. We have heard him, said Dr. Robert, who had halted in front of a blue door and was waiting for them to come up with him. Frequently. When he comes of age, scooters are going to become a major political issue. Vijaya laughed. To scoot or not to scoot, that is the question. And it isn't only in Pala that it's the question. Dr. Robert added. It's the question that every underdeveloped country has to answer one way or the other. And the answer, said Will, is always the same. Wherever I've been, and I've been almost everywhere, they've opted wholeheartedly for scooting. All of them. Without exception, Vijayal agreed. Scooting for scooting's sake, and to hell with all considerations of fulfillment, self knowledge, liberation not to mention common or garden health or happiness. Whereas we, said Dr. Robert, have always chosen to adapt our economy and technology to human beings, not our human beings to somebody else's economy and technology. We import what we can't make, but we make and import only what we can afford. And what we can afford is limited not merely by our supply of pounds and marks and dollars, but also primarily, primarily, he insisted by our wish to be happy, our ambition to become fully human. Scooters, we've decided after carefully looking into the matter, are among the things, the very numerous things, we simply can't afford. Which is something poor little Murugan will have to learn the hard way, seeing that he hasn't learned, and doesn't want to learn, the easy way. Which is the easy way? Will asked. Education and reality revealers. Murugan has had neither. Or rather he's had the opposite of both. He's had miseducation in Europe, Swiss governesses, English tutors, American movies, everybody's advertisements, and he's had reality eclipsed for him by his mother's brand of spirituality. 
So it's no wonder he pines for scooters. But his subjects, I gather, do not. Why should they? They've been taught from infancy to be fully aware of the world, and to enjoy their awareness. And, on top of that, they have been shown the world and themselves and other people as these are illumined and transfigured by reality revealers. Which helps them, of course, to have an intenser awareness and a more understanding enjoyment, so that the most ordinary things, the most trivial events, are seen as jewels and miracles. Jewels and miracles, he repeated emphatically. So why should we resort to scooters or whiskey or television or Billy Graham or any other of your distractions and compensations? Nothing short of everything we'll really do, will quote it. I see now what the old Raja was talking about. You can't be a good economist unless you're also a good psychologist. Or a good engineer without being the right kind of metaphysician. And don't forget all the other sciences, said Dr. Robert. Pharmacology, sociology, physiology, not to mention pure and applied autology, neurotheology, metachemistry, mycomysticism, and the ultimate science, he added, looking away so as to be more alone with his thoughts of Lakshmi in the hospital, the science that sooner or later we shall all have to be examined in, thanatology. He was silent for a moment. Then, in another tone, well, let's go and get washed up, he said and, opening the blue door, led the way into a long changing room with a row of showers and wash basins at one end and on the opposite wall, tiers of lockers and a large hanging cupboard. Dot Will took a seat and while his companions lathered themselves at the basins, went on with their conversations. Would it be permissible, he asked, for a miseducated alien to try a truth and beauty pill? The answer was another question. Is your liver in good order? Dr. Robert inquired. Excellent. And you don't seem to be more than mildly schizophrenic. So I can't see any counterindication. Then I can make the experiment? Whenever you like. He stepped into the nearest shower stall and turned on the water. Vijaya followed suit. Aren't you supposed to be intellectuals? Will asked when the two men had emerged again and were drying themselves. We do intellectual work, Vijaya answered. Then why all this horrible honest toil? For a very simple reason, this morning I had some spare time. So did I, said Dr. Robert. So you went out into the fields and did a Tolstoy act? Vijaya laughed. You seem to imagine we do it for ethical reasons. Don't you? Certainly not. I do muscular work, because I have muscles, and if I don't use my muscles I shall become a bad-tempered sitting addict. With nothing between the cortex and the buttocks, said Dr. Robert. Or rather with everything, but in a condition of complete unconsciousness and toxic stagnation. Western intellectuals are all sitting addicts. That's why most of you are so repulsively unwholesome. In the past even a duke had to do a lot of walking, even a money lender, even a metaphysician. And when they weren't using their legs, they were jogging about on horses. Whereas now, from the tycoon to his typist, from the logical positivist to the positive thinker, you spend nine-tenths of your time on foam rubber. Spongy seats for spongy bottoms, at home, in the office, in cars and bars, in planes and trains and buses. No moving of legs, no struggles with distance and gravity, just lifts and planes and cars, just foam rubber and an eternity of sitting. The life force that used to find an outlet through striped muscle gets turned back on the viscera and the nervous system, and slowly destroys them. So you take to digging and delving as a form of therapy? As prevention, to make therapy unnecessary. In Pala even a professor, even a government official, generally puts in two hours of digging and delving each day. As part of his duties. And as part of his pleasure. Will made a grimace. It wouldn't be part of my pleasure. That's because you weren't taught to use your mind body in the right way, Vijaya explained. If you'd been shown how to do things with the minimum of strain and the maximum of awareness, you'd enjoy even honest toil. I take it that your children all get this kind of training. From the first moment they start doing for themselves. 
for example, what's the proper way of handling yourself while you're buttoning your clothes? And suiting action to words, Vijaya started to button the shirt he had just slipped into. We answer the question by actually putting their heads and bodies into the physiologically best position. And we encourage them at the same time to notice how it feels to be in the physiologically best position, to be aware of what the process of doing up buttons consists of in terms of touches and pressures and muscular sensations. By the time they're 14 they've learned how to get the most and the best, objectively and subjectively, out of any activity they may undertake. And that's when we start them working. 90 minutes a day at some kind of manual job. Back to good old child labor. Or rather, said Dr. Robert, forward from bad new child idleness. You don't allow your teenagers to work, so they have to blow off steam in delinquency or else throttle down steam till they're ready to become domesticated sitting addicts. And now, he added, it's time to be going. I'll lead the way. In the laboratory, when they entered, Murugan was in the act of locking his briefcase against all prying eyes. I'm ready, he said and, tucking the 1358 pages of the newest testament under his arm, he followed them out into the sunshine. A few minutes later, crammed into an ancient jeep, the four of them were rolling along the road that led, past the paddock of the white bull, past the lotus pool and the huge stone Buddha out through the gate of the station compound to the highway. I'm sorry we can't provide more comfortable transportation, said Vijaya as they bumped and rattled along. Will patted Murug and knee. This is the man you should be apologizing to, he said. The one whose soul yearns for jaguars and thunderbirds. It's a yearning, I'm afraid, said Dr. Robert from the back seat, that will have to remain unsatisfied. Merugan made no comment, but smiled the secret contemptuous smile of one who knows better. We can't import toys, Dr. Robert went on. Only essentials. Such as. You'll see in a moment. They rounded a curve, and there beneath them were the thatched roofs and tree-shaded gardens of a considerable village. Vijaya pulled up at the side of the road and turned off the motor. You're looking at New Rothamstead, he said. Alias Madalia. Rice, vegetables, poultry, fruit. Not to mention two potteries and a furniture factory. Hence those wires. He waved his hand in the direction of the long row of pylons that climbed up the terraced slope behind the village, dipped out of sight over the ridge, and reappeared, far away, marching up from the floor of the next valley towards the green belt of mountain jungle and the cloudy peaks beyond and above. That's one of the indispensable imports, electrical equipment. And when the waterfalls have been harnessed and you've strung up the transmission lines, here's something else with a high priority. He directed a pointing finger at a windowless block of cement that rose incongruously from among the wooden houses near the upper entrance to the village. What is it? Will asked. Some kind of electric oven? No, the kilns are over on the other side of the village. This is the communal freezer. In the old days, Dr. Robert explained, we used to lose about half of all the perishables we produced. Now we lose practically nothing. Whatever we grow is for us, not for the circumambient bacteria. So now you have enough to eat. More than enough. We eat better than any other country in Asia, and there's a surplus for export. Lenin used to say that electricity plus socialism equals communism. Our equations are rather different. Electricity minus heavy industry plus birth control equals democracy and plenty. Electricity plus heavy industry minus birth control equals misery, totalitarianism and war. Incidentally, Will asked, who owns all this? Are you capitalists or state socialists? Neither. Most of the time we're cooperators. Palinese agriculture has always been an affair of terracing and irrigation. But terracing and irrigation call for pooled efforts and friendly agreements. Cutthroat competition isn't compatible with rice growing in a mountainous country. Our people found it quite easy to pass from mutual aid in a village community to streamline cooperative techniques for buying and selling and profit sharing and financing. 
Even cooperative financing? Dr. Robert nodded. None of those blood-sucking usuries that you find all over the Indian countryside. And no commercial banks in your western style. Our borrowing and lending system was modeled on those credit unions that Wilhelm Raiffeisen set up more than a century ago in Germany. Dr. Andrew persuaded the Raja to invite one of Raiffeisen's young men to come here and organize a cooperative banking system. It's still going strong. And what do you use for money? Will asked. Dr. Robert dipped into his trouser pocket and pulled out a handful of silver, gold and copper. In a modest way, he explained, Palo's a gold producing country. We mine enough to give our paper a solid metallic backing and the gold supplements are exports. We can pay spot cash for expensive equipment like those transmission lines and the generators at the other end. You seem to have solved your economic problems pretty successfully. Solving them wasn't difficult. To begin with, we never allowed ourselves to produce more children than we could feed, clothe, house, and educate into something like full humanity. Not being overpopulated, we have plenty. But, although we have plenty, we've managed to resist the temptation that the West has now succumbed to, the temptation to overconsume. We don't give ourselves coronaries by guzzling six times as much saturated fat as we need. We don't hypnotize ourselves into believing that two television sets will make us twice as happy as one television set. And finally we don't spend a quarter of the gross national product preparing for World War 3 or even World War's baby brother, Local War 3333. Armaments, universal debt, and planned obsolescence, those are the three pillars of Western prosperity. If war, waste, and money lenders were abolished, you'd collapse. And while you people are over consuming the rest of the world sinks more and more deeply into chronic disaster. Ignorance, militarism and breeding, these three, and the greatest of these is breeding. No hope, not the slightest possibility, of solving the economic problem until that's under control. As population rushes up, prosperity goes down. He traced the descending curve with an outstretched finger. And as prosperity goes down, discontent and rebellion. The forefinger moved up again, political ruthlessness and one-party rule, nationalism and bellicosity begin to rise. Another 10 or 15 years of uninhibited breeding, and the whole world, from China to Peru via Africa and the Middle East, will be fairly crawling with great leaders, all dedicated to the suppression of freedom, all armed to the teeth by Russia or America or, better still, by both at once all waving flags, all screaming for Lebensraum. What about Pala? Will asked. Will you be blessed with a great leader ten years from now? Not if we can help it, Dr. Robert answered. We've always done everything possible to make it very difficult for a great leader to arise. Out of the corner of his eye Will saw that Murugan was making a face of indignant and contemptuous disgust. In his fancy Antinous evidently saw himself as a Carlaline hero. Will turned back to Dr. Robert. Tell me how you do it, he said. Well, to begin with we don't fight wars or prepare for them. Consequently, we have no need for conscription, or military hierarchies, or a unified command. Then there's our economic system, it doesn't permit anybody to become more than four or five times as rich as the average. That means that we don't have any captains of industry or omnipotent financiers. Better still, we have no omnipotent politicians or bureaucrats. Palos a federation of self-governing units, geographical units, professional units, economic units, so there's plenty of scope for small-scale initiative and democratic leaders, but no place for any kind of dictator at the head of a centralized government. Another point. We have no established church, and our religion stresses immediate experience and deplores belief in unverifiable dogmas and the emotions which that belief inspires. So we're preserved from the plagues of popery, on the one hand, and fundamentalist revivalism, on the other. And along with transcendental experience we systematically cultivate skepticism. Discouraging children from taking words too seriously, 
teaching them to analyze whatever they hear or read, this is an integral part of the school curriculum. Result, the eloquent rabble rouser, like Hitler or our neighbor across the strait, Colonel Deeper, just doesn't have a chance here in Pala. This was too much for Murugan. Unable to contain himself, but look at the energy Colonel Deeper generates in his people, he burst out. Look at all the devotion and self-sacrifice. We don't have anything like that here. Thank God, said Dr. Robert devoutly. Thank God, Vijayu echoed. But these things are good, the boy protested. I admire them. I admire them too, said Dr. Robert. Admire them in the same way as I admire a typhoon. Unfortunately that kind of energy and devotion and self-sacrifice happens to be incompatible with liberty, not to mention reason and human decency. But decency, reason and liberty are what Pala has been working for, ever since the time of your namesake, Murugan the reformer. From under his seat Vijaya pulled out a tin box and, lifting the lid, distributed a first round of cheese and avocado sandwiches. We'll have to eat as we go. He started the motor and with one hand, the other being busy with his sandwich, swung the little car onto the road. Tomorrow, he said to Will, I'll show you the sights of the village, and the still more remarkable sight of my family eating their lunch. Today we have an appointment in the mountains. Near the entrance to the village he turned the jeep into a side road that went winding steeply up between terraced fields of rice and vegetables, interspersed with orchards and, here and there, plantations of young trees destined, Dr. Robert explained, to supply the pulp mills of Shivaparam with their raw material. How many papers does Pala support? Will inquired and was surprised to learn that there was only one. Who enjoys the monopoly? The government? The party in power? The local Joe Alderhyde? Nobody enjoys a monopoly, Dr. Robert assured him. There's a panel of editors representing half a dozen different parties and interests. Each of them gets his allotted space for comment and criticism. The reader's in a position to compare their arguments and make up his own mind. I remember how shocked I was the first time I read one of your big circulation newspapers. The bias of the headlines, the systematic one-sidedness of the reporting and the commentaries, the catchwords and slogans instead of argument. No serious appeal to reason. Instead, a systematic effort to install conditioned reflexes in the minds of the voters, and, for the rest, crime, divorce, anecdotes, waddle, anything to keep them distracted, anything to prevent them from thinking. The car climbed on and now they were on a ridge between two headlong descents, with a tree-fringed lake down at the bottom of a gorge to their left and to the right a broader valley where, between two tree-shaded villages, like an incongruous piece of pure geometry, sprawled a huge factory. Cement? Will questioned. Dot Dr. Robert nodded. One of the indispensable industries. We produce all we need and a surplus for export. And those villagers supply the manpower. In the intervals of agriculture and work in the forest and the sawmills. Does that kind of part time system work well? It depends what you mean by well. It doesn't result in maximum efficiency. But then in Pala, maximum efficiency isn't the categorical imperative that it is with you. You think first of getting the biggest possible output in the shortest possible time. We think first of human beings and their satisfactions. Changing jobs doesn't make for the biggest output in the fewest days. But most people like it better than doing one kind of job all their lives. If it's a choice between mechanical efficiency and human satisfaction, we choose satisfaction. When I was 20, Vijaya now volunteered, I put in four months at that cement plant, and after that ten weeks making superphosphates and then six months in the jungle, as a lumberjack. All this ghastly honest toil. Twenty years earlier, said Dr. Robert, I did a stint at the copper smelters. After which I had a taste of the sea on a fishing boat. Sampling all kinds of work, it's part of everybody's education. One learns an enormous amount that way, about things and skills and organizations, about all kinds of people and their ways of thinking. 
Will shook his head. I'd still rather get it out of a book. But what you can get out of a book is never it. At bottom, Dr. Robert added, all of you are still Platonists. You worship the word and abhor matter. Tell that to the clergyman, said Will. They're always reproaching us with being crass materialists. Crass, Dr. Robert agreed, but crass precisely because you're such inadequate materialists. Abstract materialism, that's what you profess. Whereas we make a point of being materialists concretely, materialistic on the wordless levels of seeing and touching and smelling, of tensed muscles and dirty hands. Abstract materialism is as bad as abstract idealism, it makes immediate spiritual experience almost impossible. Sampling different kinds of work in concrete materialism is the first, indispensable step in our education for concrete spirituality. But even the most concrete materialism, Vijaya qualified, won't get you very far unless you're fully conscious of what you're doing and experiencing. You've got to be completely aware of the bits of matter you're handling, the skills you're practicing, the people you work with. Quite right, said Dr. Robert. I ought to have made it clear that concrete materialism is only the raw stuff of a fully human life. It's through awareness, complete and constant awareness, that we transform it into concrete spirituality. Be fully aware of what you're doing, and work becomes the yoga of work, play becomes the yoga of play, everyday living becomes the yoga of everyday living. Will thought of Ranga and the little nurse. And what about love? Dr. Robert nodded. That too. Awareness transfigures it, turns lovemaking into the yoga of lovemaking. Marugan gave an imitation of his mother looking shocked. Psychophysical means to a transcendental end, said Vijaya, raising his voice against the grinding screech of the low gear into which he had just shifted, that, primarily, is what all these yogas are. But they're also something else. They're also devices for dealing with the problems of power. He shifted back to a quieter gear and lowered his voice to its normal tone. The problems of power, he repeated. And they confront you on every level of organization, every level, from national governments down to nurseries and honeymooning couples. For it isn't merely a question of making things hard for the great leaders. There are all the millions of small scale tyrants and persecutors, all the mute inglorious Hitlers, the village Napoleons, the Calvins and Torquemadas of the family. Not to mention all the brigands and bullies stupid enough to get themselves labeled as criminals. How does one harness the enormous power these people generate and set it to work in some useful way, or at least prevent it from doing harm? That's what I want you to tell me, said Will. Where do you start? We start everywhere at once, Vijaya answered. But since one can't say more than one thing at a time, Let's begin by talking about the anatomy and physiology of power. Tell him about your biochemical approach to the subject, Dr. Robert. It started, said Dr. Robert, nearly 40 years ago, while I was studying in London. Started with prison visiting on weekends and reading history whenever I had a free evening. History and prisons, he repeated. I discovered that they were closely related. The record of the crimes follies and misfortunes of mankind, that's Gibbon, isn't it? And the place where unsuccessful crimes and follies are visited with a special kind of misfortune. Reading my books and talking to my jailbirds, I found myself asking questions. What kind of people became dangerous delinquents, the grand delinquents of the history books, the little ones of Pentonville and Wormwood scrubs? What kinds of people are moved by the lust for power? the passion to bully and domineer. And the ruthless ones, the men and women who know what they want and have no qualms about hurting and killing in order to get it, the monsters who hurt and kill, not for profit, but gratuitously, because hurting and killing are such fun, who are they? I used to discuss these questions with the experts, doctors, psychologists, social scientists, teachers. Mantegazza and Galton had gone out of fashion, and most of my experts assured me that the only valid answers to these questions were answers in terms of culture, economics, and the family. 
it was all a matter of mothers and toilet training, of early conditioning and traumatic environments. I was only half convinced. Mothers and toilet training and the circumambient nonsense, these were obviously important. But were they all important? In the course of my prison visiting I'd begun to see evidence of some kind of a built-in pattern, or rather of two kinds of built-in patterns, for dangerous delinquents and power-loving troublemakers don't belong to a single species. Most of them, as I was beginning to realize even then, belong to one or other of two distinct and dissimilar species, the muscle people and the Peter Pans. I've specialized in the treatment of Peter Pans. The boys who never grow up? Will queried. Never is the wrong word. In real life Peter Pan always ends by growing up. He merely grows up too late, grows up physiologically more slowly than he grows up in terms of birthdays. What about girl Peter Pans? They're very rare. But the boys are as common as blackberries. You can expect one Peter Pan among every five or six male children. And among problem children, among the boys who can't read, won't learn, don't get on with anyone, and finally turn to the more violent forms of delinquency, 7 out of 10 turn out, if you take an x-ray of the bones of the wrist, to be Peter Pans. The rest are mostly muscle people of one sort or another. I'm trying to think, said Will, of a good historical example of a delinquent Peter Pan. You don't have to go far afield. The most recent, as well as the best and biggest, was Adolf Hitler. Hitler? Merugan's tone was one of shocked astonishment. Hitler was evidently one of his heroes. Read the Führer's biography, said Dr. Robert. A Peter Pan if ever there was one. Hopeless at school. Incapable either of competing or cooperating. Envying all the normally successful boys, and, because he envied, hating them and, to make himself feel better, despising them as inferior beings. Then came the time for puberty. But Adolf was sexually backward. Other boys made advances to girls, and the girls responded. Adolf was too shy, too uncertain of his manhood. And all the time incapable of steady work, at home only in the compensatory other world of his fancy. There, at the very least, he was Michelangelo. Here, Unfortunately, he couldn't draw. His only gifts were hatred, low cunning, a set of indefatigable vocal cords and a talent for non-stop talking at the top of his voice from the depths of his Peter Panic paranoia. Thirty or forty million deaths and heaven knows how many billions of dollars, that was the price the world had to pay for little Adolf's retarded maturation. Fortunately most of the boys who grow up too slowly never get a chance of being more than minor delinquents. But even minor delinquents, if there are enough of them, can exact a pretty stiff price. That's why we try to nip them in the bud, or rather, since we're dealing with Peter Pans, that's why we try to make their nipped buds open out and grow. And do you succeed? Dr. Robert nodded. It isn't hard particularly if you start early enough. Between four and a half and five all our children get a thorough examination. Blood tests, psychological tests, some are to typing, then we x-ray their wrists and give them an egg. All the cute little Peter Pans are spotted without fail, and appropriate treatment is started immediately. Within a year practically all of them are perfectly normal. A crop of potential failures and criminals, potential tyrants and sadists, potential misanthropes and revolutionaries for revolution's sake, has been transformed into a crop of useful citizens who can be governed ad andana as sathana, without punishment and without a sword. In your part of the world delinquency is still left to clergymen, social workers and the police. Non-stop sermons and supportive therapy, prison sentences galore. With what results? The delinquency rate goes steadily up and up. No wonder. Words about sibling rivalry and hell and the personality of Jesus are no substitutes for biochemistry. A year in jail won't cure a Peter Pan of his endocrine disbalance or help the ex Peter Pan to get rid of his psychological consequences. For Peter Panic delinquency, 
what you need is early diagnosis and three pink capsules a day before meals. Given a tolerable environment, the result will be sweet reasonableness and a modicum of the cardinal virtues within 18 months. Not to mention a fair chance, where before there hadn't been the faintest possibility, of eventual Prajnaparamatu and Karana, eventual wisdom and compassion. And now get Vijaya to tell you about the muscle people. As you may perhaps have observed, he's one of them. Leaning forward, Dr. Robert thumped the giant's broad back. Solid beef. And he added, how lucky for us poor shrimps that the animal isn't savage. Vijaya took one hand off the wheel, beat his chest and uttered a loud ferocious roar. Don't tease the gorilla, he said, and laughed good humoredly. Then, think of the other great dictator, he said to Will, think of Joseph Vissarionovich Stalin. Hitler's the supreme example of the delinquent Peter Pan. Stalin's the supreme example of the delinquent muscle man. Predestined, by his shape, to be an extrovert. Not one of your soft, round, spill the beans extroverts who pine for indiscriminate togetherness. No, the trampling, driving extrovert, the one who always feels impelled to do something and is never inhibited by doubts or qualms, by sympathy or sensibility. In his will, Lenin advised his successors to get rid of Stalin, the man was too fond of power and too apt to abuse it. But the advice came too late. Stalin was already so firmly entrenched that he couldn't be ousted. Ten years later his power was absolute. Trotsky had been scotched, all his old friends had been bumped off. Now, like God among the choy iring angels, he was alone in a cozy little heaven peopled only by flatterers and yes-men. And all the time he was ruthlessly busy, liquidating kuliks, organizing collectives, building an armament industry, shifting reluctant millions from farm to factory. Working with a tenacity, a loose and efficiency of which the German Peter Pan, with his apocalyptic fantasies and his fluctuating moods, was utterly incapable. And in the last phase of the war, Compare Stalin's strategy with Hitler's. Cool calculation pitted against compensatory daydreams, clear eyed realism against the rhetorical nonsense that Hitler had finally talked himself into believing. Two monsters, equal in delinquency, but profoundly dissimilar in temperament, in unconscious motivation, and finally in efficiency. Peter Pans are wonderfully good at starting wars and revolutions but it takes muscle men to carry them through to a successful conclusion. Here's the jungle, Vijaya added in another tone, waving a hand in the direction of a great cliff of trees that seemed to block their further ascent. A moment later they had left the glare of the open hillside and had plunged into a narrow tunnel of green twilight that zigzagged up between walls of tropical foliage. Creepers dangled from the overarching branches and between the trunks of huge trees grew ferns and dark-leaved rhododendrons with a dense profusion of shrubs and bushes that for Will, as he looked about him, were namelessly unfamiliar. The air was stiflingly damp and there was a hot, acrid smell of luxuriant green growth and of that other kind of life which is decay. Muffled by the thick foliage, Will heard the ringing of distant taxis, the rhythmic screech of a saw. The road turned yet once more and suddenly the green darkness of the tunnel gave place to sunshine. They had entered a clearing in the forest. Tall and broad-shouldered, half a dozen almost naked woodcutters were engaged in lopping the branches from a newly felled tree. In the sunshine hundreds of blue and amethyst butterflies chased one another, fluttering and soaring in an endless random dance. Over a fire at the further side of the clearing an old man was slowly stirring the contents of an iron cauldron. Nearby a small tame deer, fine-limbed and elegantly dappled, was quietly grazing. Old friends, said Vijaya, and shouted something in Palinese. The woodcutters shouted back and waved their hands. Then the road swung sharply to the left and they were climbing again up the green tunnel between the trees. Talk of muscle men said Will as they left the clearing. Those were really splendid specimens. That kind of physique, said Vijaya, is a standing temptation. And yet among all these men, and I've worked with scores of them, I've never met a single bully, 
a single potentially dangerous power lover. Which is just another way, Murugan broke in contemptuously, of saying that nobody here has any ambition. What's the explanation? Will asked. Very simple, so far as the Peter Pans are concerned. They're never given a chance to work up an appetite for power. We cure them of their delinquency before it's had time to develop. But the muscle men are different. They're just as muscular here, just as tramplingly extroverted, as they are with you. So why don't they turn into Stalins or Deepers, or at the least into domestic tyrants? First of all, our social arrangements offer them very few opportunities for bullying their families, and our political arrangements make it practically impossible for them to domineer on any larger scale. Second, we train the muscle men to be aware and sensitive, we teach them to enjoy the commonplaces of everyday existence. This means that they always have an alternative, innumerable alternatives, to the pleasure of being the boss. And finally we work directly on the love of power and domination that goes with this kind of physique in almost all its variations. We canalize this love of power and we deflect it, turn it away from people and onto things. We give them all kinds of difficult tasks to perform, strenuous and violent tasks that exercise their muscles and satisfy their craving for domination, but satisfy it at nobody's expense and in ways that are either harmless or positively useful. So these splendid creatures fell trees instead of felling people, is that it? Precisely. And when they've had enough of the woods, they can go to sea, or try their hands at mining, or take it easy relatively speaking, on the rice paddies. Will Farnaby suddenly laughed. What's the joke? I was thinking of my father. A little wood chopping might have been the making of him, not to mention the salvation of his wretched family. Unfortunately he was an English gentleman. Wood chopping was out of the question. Didn't he have any physical outlet for his energies? Will shook his head. Besides being a gentleman, he explained, my father thought he was an intellectual. But an intellectual doesn't hunt or shoot or play golf, he just thinks and drinks. Apart from brandy, my father's only amusements were bullying, auction bridge, and the theory of politics. He fancied himself as a 20th century version of Lord Acton, the last, lonely philosopher of liberalism. You should have heard him on the iniquities of the modern omnipotent state. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Absolutely. After which he'd down another brandy and go back with renewed gusto to his favorite pastime, trampling on his wife and children. And if Acton himself didn't behave in that way, said Dr. Robert, it was merely because he happened to be virtuous and intelligent. There was nothing in his theories to restrain a delinquent muscle man or an untreated Peter Pan from trampling on anyone he could get his feet on. That was Acton's fatal weakness. As a political theorist he was altogether admirable. As a practical psychologist he was almost non-existent. He seems to have thought that the power problem could be solved by good social arrangements, supplemented, of course, by sound morality and a spot of revealed religion. But the power problem has its roots in anatomy and biochemistry and temperament. Power has to be curbed on the legal and political levels, that's obvious. But it's also obvious that there must be prevention on the individual level. On the level of instinct and emotion, on the level of the glands and the viscera, the muscles and the blood. If I can ever find the time, I'd like to write a little book on human physiology in relation to ethics, religion, politics and law. Law, Will echoed. I was just going to ask you about law. Are you absolutely swordless and punishmentless? Or do you still need judges and policemen? We still need them, said Dr. Robert. But we don't need nearly so many of them as you do. In the first place, thanks to preventive medicine and preventive education, we don't commit many crimes. And in the second place, most of the few crimes that are committed are dealt with by the criminal's Mac. Group therapy within a community that has assumed group responsibility for the delinquent. And in difficult cases the group therapy is supplemented by medical treatment and a course of mock sure medicine experiences, directed by somebody with an exceptional degree of insight. 
So where do the judges come in? The judge listens to the evidence, decides whether the accused person is innocent or guilty, and if he's guilty, remands him to his Mac and, where it seems advisable, to the local panel of medical and mycomystical experts. At stated intervals the experts and the Mac report back to the judge. When the reports are satisfactory, the case is closed. And if they're never satisfactory? In the long run, said Dr. Robert, they always are. There was a silence. Did you ever do any rock climbing? Vijaya suddenly asked. Dot Will laughed. How do you think I came by my game leg? That was forced climbing. Did you ever climb for fun? Enough, said Will, to convince me that I wasn't much good at it. Vijaya glanced at Murugan. What about you, while you were in Switzerland? The boy blushed deeply and shook his head. You can't do any of those things, he muttered, if you have a tendency to TB. What a pity! said Vijaya. It would have been so good for you. Will asked. Do people do a lot of climbing in these mountains? Climbing's an integral part of the school curriculum. For everybody? A little for everybody. With more advanced rock work for the full-blown muscle people, that's about 1 in 12 of the boys and 1 in 27 of the girls. We shall soon be seeing some youngsters tackling their first post-elementary climb. The green tunnel widened, brightened, and suddenly they were out of the dripping forest on a wide shelf of almost level ground, walled in on three sides by red rocks that towered up 2,000 feet and more into a succession of jagged crests and isolated pinnacles. There was a freshness in the air and, as they passed from sunshine into the shadow of a floating island of cumulus, it was almost cool. Dr. Robert leaned forward and pointed, through the windshield, at a group of white buildings on a little knoll near the center of the plateau. That's the high altitude station, he said. 7,000 feet up, with more than 5,000 acres of good flat land, where we can grow practically anything that grows in southern Europe. Wheat and barley, green peas and cabbages, lettuce and tomatoes, the fruit won't set where night temperatures are over 68, gooseberries, strawberries, walnuts, green gauges, peaches, apricots. Plus all the valuable plants that are native to high mountains at this latitude, including the mushrooms that our young friend here so violently disapproves of. Is this the place we're bound for? Will asked. No. We're going higher. Dr. Robert pointed to the last outpost of the range, a ridge of dark red rock from which the land sloped down on one side to the jungle and on the other mounted precipitously towards an unseen summit lost in the clouds. Up to the old Shiva temple where the pilgrims used to come every spring and autumn equinox. It's one of my favorite places in the whole island. When the children were small, we used to go up there for picnics. Lakshmi and I, almost every week. How many years ago? A note of sadness had come into his voice. He sighed and, leaning back in his seat, closed his eyes. They turned off the road that led to the high altitude station and began to climb again. Entering the last, worst lap, said Vijaya. Seven hairpin turns and half a mile of unventilated tunnel. He shifted into first gear and conversation became impossible. Ten minutes later they had arrived. Ten cautiously maneuvering his immobilized leg, Will climbed out of the car and looked about him. Between the red soaring crags to the south and the headlong descents in every other direction the crest of the ridge had been leveled, and at the midpoint of this long narrow terrace stood the temple, a great red tower of the same substance as the mountains, massive, four-sided, vertically ribbed. A thing of symmetry in contrast with the rocks, but regular not as Euclidean abstractions are regular, regular with the pragmatic geometry of a living thing. Yes, of a living thing, for all the temple's richly textured surfaces, all its bounding contours against the sky curved organically inwards, narrowing as they mounted towards a ring of marble, above which the red stone swelled out again, like the seed capsule of a flowering plant into a flattened, many-ribbed dome that crowned the whole. Built about fifty years before the Norman conquest, said Dr. Robert. And looks, Will commented, 
as though it hadn't been built by anybody, as though it had grown out of the rock. Grown like the bud of an agave, on the point of rocketing up into a twelve-foot stalk and an explosion of flowers. Vijaya touched his arm. Look, he said. A party of elementaries coming down. Will turned towards the mountain and saw a young man in nailed boots and climbing clothes working his way down a chimney in the face of the precipice. At a place where the chimney offered a convenient resting place he halted and, throwing back his head, gave utterance to a loud alpine yodel. Fifty feet above him a boy came out from behind a buttress of rock, lowered himself from the ledge on which he was standing and started down the chimney. Does it tempt you? Vijayu asked, turning to Murugan. Heavily overacting the part of the bored, sophisticated adult who has something better to do than watch the children at play, Murugan shrugged his shoulders. Not in the slightest. He moved away and, sitting down on the weather worn carving of a lion, pulled a gaudily bound American magazine out of his pocket and started to read. What's the literature? Vijayu asked. Science fiction. There was a ring of defiance in Merugan's voice. Dr. Robert laughed. Anything to escape from fact. Pretending not to have heard him, Merugan turned a page and went on reading. He's pretty good, said Vijaya, who had been watching the young climbers progress. They have an experienced man at each end of the rope, he added. You can't see the number one man. He's behind that buttress in a parallel chimney thirty or forty feet higher up. There's a permanent iron spike up there, where you can belay the rope. The whole party could fall, and they'd be perfectly safe. Spread eagled between footholds in either wall of the narrow chimney, the leader kept shouting up instructions and encouragement. Then, as the boy approached, he yielded his place, climbed down another twenty feet and, 